recess and the chair is authorized to declare a recess. testimony of Michael Cohen, former attorney to President Donald Trump. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. You'll state your point of order. Uh, rule F, uh, real, rule 9F of the committee rules say that any testimony from your witness needs to be here 24 hours in advance. The committee, the chairman knows well that at 10.08, we received the written testimony, and then we received evidence this morning at 7.54. Now, if this was just an oversight, Mr. Chairman, I could, I could look beyond it. But it was an intentional effort by this witness and his advisors to once again show his disdain for this body. And with that, I move that we postpone this hearing. I want to thank the gentleman. Let me say this, that we uh, got the re uh, testimony late last night. <clears throat> we did. And we got it to you all uh, pretty much the same time that, that we got it. Uh, I want to move forward with this hearing. Mr. Chairman, uh, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, this is a violation of the rule, and, and if it was not intentional, I would, I would not have a problem. I'm not saying it was intentional on your part. I'm saying it's intentional on his part because Mr. Dean, last night on a cable news net network, actually made it all very evident. John Dean, and I'll quote Mr. Chairman, he said, as a former committee counsel in the House Judiciary Committee and then a long-term witness, sitting alone at the table is important. Quote, holding your statement as long as you can so the other side can't chew it up is, is important as well. Close quote. And so, so it was advice that our witness got for this particular body. And Mr. Chairman, when you were in the minority, you wouldn't have stood for it. And I can tell you that we should not stand for it as a body. Let me say this. Chairman? Let, let me say Chairman? this. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Katie Hill? I move to table. Mr. Chairman? Is there a second? Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I was asked to be recognized before the motion. The vote is so in tabling the motion. You know who had this material before all excuse the members me, of the committee? Excuse me. CNN had it before Sir. we did. CNN had the exhibits Sir. before we did. Yeah, well, the vote is on tabling the motion to postpone. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. And I appeal the ruling of the chair. Yes, I, I, I can assure you it's in the rules. I appeal the ruling of the chair. Do the rules matter, Mr. Chairman? Move I recognize the, table. the gentlelady. Move to waive the rules. There's a motion to Move table. Move to table. The, the vote is the vote. The well, vote she made table. two motions. What's the motion? The, the vote is on tabling. I move to table the appeal to the ruling of the chair. The vote is, is on that. All in favor say aye. All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. I ask for I ask for a recorded vote, Mr. Chairman. Very well. The, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Mr. Cummings votes yes. Ms. Maloney. Yes. Ms. Maloney votes yes. Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton votes yes. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes yes. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes yes. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper votes yes. Mr. Connolly. Aye. Mr. Connolly votes yes. Mr. Krishnamurthy. Aye. Mr. Krishnamurthy votes yes. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes yes. Mr. Ruda. Mr. Ruda votes yes. Ms. Hill. Ms. Hill votes yes. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes yes. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes yes. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes yes. Ms. Spear. Ms. Spear votes yes. Ms. Kelly. Ms. Kelly votes yes. Mr. Desaunier. Mr. Desaunier votes yes. Ms. Lawrence. 
Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Lawrence votes yes. Ms. Plaskett. Ms. Plaskett votes yes. Mr. Kana. Ms. Mr. Kana votes yes. Mr. Gomez. Mr. Gomez votes yes. Ms. Acacia Cortez. Mr. Ms. Acacia Cortez votes yes. Ms. Presley. Ms. Presley votes yes. Ms. Talib. Ms. Talib votes yes. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Amash. Mr. Amash votes no. Mr. Gosar. Mr. Gosar votes no. Ms. Fox. Ms. Fox votes no. Ms. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Meadows. No. Mr. Meadows votes no. Mr. Heiss. No. Mr. Heiss votes no. Mr. Grothman. No. Mr. Grothman votes no. Mr. Comer. No. Mr. Comer votes no. Mr. Cloud. Mr. Cloud votes no. Mr. Gibbs. Mr. Gibbs votes no. Mr. Higgins. Mr. Norman. Mr. Norman votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy votes no. Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Stubbe. Mr. Stubbe votes no. On this vote, we have 24 yeses, 17 noes. A motion to the table is agreed to. Let me, let me say this. Um, you've made it clear that you do not want the American people to hear what Mr. Cohen has to say. But the American people have a right to hear him. So we're going to proceed. The American people can judge his credibility for themselves. Now, Mr. Chairman? Yes. We did not say that. We just said we wanted to follow the rules. We had, he didn't say stop the hearing. He just said postpone it so we could get his testimony and the exhibits when we were supposed to get them according to the rules of this committee. That's all we said. We didn't say we didn't want to hear from the guy. We Reclaiming just said we wanted to follow the rules. Reclaiming my time. I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. Today, the committee will hear the testimony of Michael Cohen, President Donald Trump's longtime personal attorney and one of his closest and most trusted advisors over the last decade. On August 21st, Mr. Cohen appeared in federal court and admitted to arranging secret payoffs of hundreds of thousands of dollars on the eve of the election to silence women alleging affairs with Donald Trump. Mr. Cohen admitted to violating campaign finance laws and other laws. He admitted to committing these felonies, quote, in coordination with and at the direction of, unquote, President Trump. And he admitted, he admitted to lying about his actions to protect the president. Some will certainly ask if Mr. Cohen was lying then, why should we believe him now? This is a legitimate question. As a trial lawyer for many years, I face this situation over and over again, and I ask the same question. Here is how I view our role. Every one of us in this room has a duty to serve as an independent check on the executive branch. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in search of the truth. The president has made many statements of his own and now the American people have a right to hear the other side. They can watch Mr. Cohen's testimony and make their own judgment. We received a copy of Mr. Cohen's written statement late last night. It includes not only personal eyewitness accounts of meetings with Donald Trump as president inside the Oval Office, but it also includes documents and other corroborating evidence for some of Mr. Cohen's statements. For example, 
Mr. Cohen has provided a copy of a check sent while President Trump was in office with Donald Trump's signature on it to reimburse Mr. Cohen for the hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. This, is new, this new evidence raises a, a, a host of troubling legal and ethical concerns about the president's actions in the White House and before. Would you all close that door, please? Thank you. This check is dated August 1st, 2017. Six months later, in April of 2018, the president denied anything about it. In April of 2018, President Trump was flying on Air, Air Force One when a reporter asked him the question, did you know about a $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels? The answer was, quote, no. A month after that, the president admitted to making payments to Mr. Cohen, but claimed they were part of a, quote, a monthly retainer, unquote, for legal services. This claim fell apart in August when federal prosecutors concluded, and I quote, in truth and in fact, there was no such retainer agreement, end of quote. Today, we, we will also hear Mr. Cohen's account of a meeting in 2016 in Donald Trump's office during which Roger Stone said over a speakerphone that he had just spoken with Julian Assange, who said there would be a, quote, massive dump of emails that would damage Hillary Clinton's campaign, end of quote. According to Cohen, Mr. Trump replied, quote, wouldn't that be great? end of quote. The testimony that Michael Cohen will provide today, ladies and gentlemen, is deeply disturbing, disturbing, and it should be troubling to all Americans. We, we will all have to make our own evaluation of the evidence and Mr. Cohen's credibility. As he admits, he has repeatedly lied in the past. I agree with Ranking Member Jordan that this is an important factor we need to weigh, but we must weigh it and we must hear from him. But where I disagree fundamentally with the Ranking Member involves his efforts to prevent the American people from hearing from Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen's testimony raises grave questions about the legality of Donald Trump's, President Donald Trump's conduct and the truthfulness of statements while he was president. We need to assess and investigate this new evidence as we uphold our constitutional, constitutional our oversight responsibilities. And we will continue after today to gather more documents and testimony in our search for the truth. I had made it abundantly clear to Mr. Cohen that if he comes here today and he does not tell him the truth, tell us the truth, I will be the first one to refer that un those untruthful statements to DOJ. So when people say he, he doesn't have anything to lose, he does have a lot to lose if he lies. And the American people, by the way, voted for accountability in November. And they have a right to hear Mr. Cohen in public so they can make their own judgments. Mr. Cohen's testimony is the beginning of the process, not the end. Ladies and gentlemen, the days of this committee protecting the president at all costs are over. They're over. Before I close, I want to comment about the scope of today's hearing. At the request of the House Intelligence 
committee, and my very good friend, Adam Schiff, Congressman Adam Schiff, the chairman, I intended over the objections of the ranking member of our committee to limit the scope of today's hearing to avoid questions about Russia. However, Mr. Cohen's written testimony, in his such written testimony, he's made statements relating to Russia. And these are topics that we understand do not raise concern from the Department of Justice. So in fairness to the ranking member and all committee members, we will not restrict questions relating to the witness's testimony or related questions he is willing to answer. Finally, I remind members that we will need to remain mindful of those areas where there are ongoing uh, Department of Justice investigations. Those scoping limitations have not changed. Finally, and to Mr. Cohen, Martin Luther King, Mr. Cohen said, some words that I leave with you today before you testify. He said, faith is taking the first step, even when you can't see the whole staircase. There comes a time when silence becomes betrayal. Our lives begin to end. Today we become silent about things that truly matter. In the end, he says, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And with that, I yield to the distinguished gentleman, the ranking member of our committee, uh, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Chairman, point of parliamentary inquiry. Yes. To the, to the point Mr. that- Mr. Jordan is recognized. Mr. Jordan is recognized for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, here we go. Here we go. Your first big hearing, your first announced witness, Michael Cohen. I want everyone in this room to think about this. The first announced witness for the 116th Congress is a guy who is going to prison in two months for lying to Congress. Mr. Chairman, your chairmanship will always be identified with this hearing. And we all need to understand what this is. This is the Michael Cohen hearing presented by Lanny Davis. That's right, Lanny Davis choreographed the whole darn thing. The Clinton's best friend, loyalist, operative, Lanny Davis put this all together. You know how we know? He told our staff. He told the committee staff. He said the hearing was his idea. He selected this committee. He had to talk Michael Cohen into coming. And most importantly, he had to persuade the chairman to actually have it. He told us it took two months to get that job done. But here we are. He talked him into it. This might be the first time someone co convicted of lying to Congress has appeared again so quickly in front of Congress. Certainly it's the first time a convicted perjurer has been brought back to be a star witness in a hearing. And there's a reason this is the first, because no other committee would do it. Think about this, with Mr. Cohen here, this committee, we got lots of lawyers on this committee, this committee is actually a, encouraging a witness to violate attorney-client privilege. Mr. Chairman, when we legitimize dishonesty, we delegitimize this institution. We're supposed to pursue the truth, but you have stacked the deck against the truth. We're only allowed to ask certain questions, even with that amendment you just told us about, well, Russia is now on the table. You initially told us we can't ask questions about the special counsel, can't ask questions about the Southern District of New York, can't ask questions about Russia. Nope. Nope. Only subjects we can talk about are ones you think are going to be harmful to the President of the United States. And the answers to those questions are going to come from a guy who can't be trusted. Here's what the U.S. Attorney said about Mr. Cohen. While Mr. Cohen enjoyed a privileged life, his desire for ever greater wealth and influence precipitated an extensive course of criminal conduct. Mr. Cohen committed four four distinct federal crimes over a period of several years. He was motivated to do so by personal greed and repeatedly, repeatedly used his power and influence for deceptive ends, but the Democrats don't care. They don't care. They just want to use you, Mr. Cohen. You're their patsy today. They got to find somebody, somewhere, to say something 
so they can try to remove the president from office. Because Tom Steyer told them to. Tom Steyer, last week, organized a town hall. Guess where? Chairman Nadler's district in Manhattan. Two nights ago, Tom Steyer organized a town hall. Guess where? Chairman Cummings' district in Baltimore. The best they can find, the best they can find to start this process, Michael Cohen. Fraudster, a cheat, convicted felon, and in two months, a federal inmate. Well, actually, they didn't find him. Lanny Davis found him. I'll say one thing about the Democrats. They stick to the playbook. Remember, remember how all this started. The Clinton campaign hired Perkins Coie Law Firm, who hired Glenn Simpson, who hired a foreigner, Christopher Steele, who put together the fake dossier that the FBI used to go get a warrant to spy on the Trump campaign. But when that whole scheme failed, and the American people said, we're going to make Donald Trump president, they said, we got to do something else. So now, Clinton loyalist, Clinton operative, Lanny Davis, has persuaded the chairman of the Oversight Committee to give a convicted felon a forum to tell stories and lie about the President of the United States so they can all start their impeachment process. Mr. Chairman, we are better than this. We are better than this. I yield back. Actually, Mr. I wanted to note. Mr. Chairman, actually, I, uh, I, I have a motion. Back. I have a motion. I have, a motion under, you, I have a motion you, under Rule 2K6 of Rule 11. You yielded back, sir. You yielded back. Mr. Chairman, you took seven minutes. I took four. Well, Mr. Gentleman, the gentleman yielded back. That's how you're going to operate? First, you don't follow the rules, and now you're going to say, you, so you don't get, you, you get to, point of order. You, you get to, you, 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 you get to order. deviate from the rules. Regular order. I just have a simple motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's a regular order to, know, to have the testimony 24 me. hours in advance. Excuse me. I wanted to know that, that under Rule 11, Clause 4, all media and photographers must be officially credentialed to record these proceedings and take photographs. I also wanted to briefly address the spectators in the hearing room today. We welcome you and we respect your right to be here. We also ask, in turn, for your respect as we proceed with the business of the committee today. It is the intention of the committee to proceed without any disruptions. Any disruptions of this committee will result in the United States Capitol Police restoring order and that protesters will be removed. And we are grateful for your presence here today and your cooperation. Now I want to welcome Mr. Cohen and thank him for participating in today's hearing. Mr. Cohen, Cohen if you would please rise, and I will begin to swear you in. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative, and thank you, and you may be seated. The microphones are sensitive, so please speak directly into them. Without objection, your written statement will be made a part of the record. And with that, Mr. Cohen, you are now recognized to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Is your mic on? Yes. Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today. I have asked this committee to ensure that my family be protected from presidential threats and that the committee be sensitive to the questions pertaining to ongoing investigations. I thank you for your help and for your understanding. I am here under oath to correct the record, to answer the committee's questions truthfully, and to offer the American people what I know about President Trump. I recognize that some of you may doubt and attack me on my credibility. It is for this reason that I have incorporated into this opening statement documents that are irrefutable and demonstrate 
that the information you will hear is accurate and truthful. Never in a million years did I imagine when I accepted a job in 2007 to work for Donald Trump that he would one day run for the presidency to launch a campaign on a platform of hate and intolerance and actively win. I regret the day I said yes to Mr. Trump. I regret all the help and support I gave him along the way. I am ashamed of my own failings and publicly accepted responsibility for them by pleading guilty in the Southern District of New York. I am ashamed of my weakness and my misplaced loyalty of the things I did for Mr. Trump in an effort to protect and promote him. I am ashamed that I chose to take part in concealing Mr. Trump's illicit acts rather than listening to my own conscience. I am ashamed because I know what Mr. Trump is. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. He was a presidential candidate who knew that Roger Stone was talking with Julian Assange about a WikiLeaks drop on Democratic National Committee emails. And I will explain each in a few moments. I am providing the committee today with several documents, and these include a copy of a check Mr. Trump wrote from his personal bank account after he became president to reimburse me for the hush money payments I made to cover up his affair with an adult film star and to prevent damage to his campaign. Copies of financial statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013 that he gave to such institutions such as Deutsche Bank. A copy of an article with Mr. Trump's handwriting on it that reported on the auction of a portrait of himself that he arranged for the bidder ahead of time and then reimbursed the bidder from the account of his nonprofit charitable foundation with the picture now hanging in one of his country clubs. And copies of letters I wrote at Mr. Trump's direction that threatened his high school, colleges, and the college board not to release his grades or SAT scores. I hope my appearance here today, my guilty plea, and my work with law enforcement agencies are steps along a path of redemption that will restore faith in me and help this country understand our president better. And before going further, I want to apologize to each member to use Congress as a whole. The last time I appeared before Congress, I came to protect Mr. Trump. Today, I am here to tell the truth about Mr. Trump. I lied to Congress when Mr. Trump stopped negotiating the Moscow Tower project in Russia. I stated that we stopped negotiating in January of 2016. That was false. Our negotiations continued for months later during the campaign. Mr. Trump did not directly tell me to lie to Congress. That's not how he operates. In conversations we had during the campaign, at the same time I was actively negotiating in Russia for him, he would look me in the eye and tell me there's no Russian business and then go on to lie to the American people by saying the same thing. In his way, he was telling me to lie. There were at least a half a dozen times between the Iowa caucus in January of 2016 and the end of June when he would ask me, how's it going in Russia, referring to the Moscow Tower project. You need to know that Mr. Trump's personal lawyers reviewed and edited my statement to Congress about the timing of the Moscow Tower negotiations before I gave it. So to be clear, Mr. Trump knew of and directed the Trump-Moscow negotiations 
throughout the campaign and lied about it. He lied about it because he never expected to win. He also lied about it because he stood to make hundreds of millions of dollars on the Moscow real estate project. And so I lied about it too. Because Mr. Trump had made clear to me, through his personal statements to me, that we both knew to be false, and through his lies to the country, that he wanted me to lie. And he made it clear to me because his personal attorneys reviewed my statement before I gave it to Congress. Over the past two years, I have been smeared as a rat by the President of the United States. The truth is much different. And let me take a brief moment to introduce myself. My name is Michael Dean Cohen. And I am a blessed husband of 24 years and a father to an incredible daughter and son. When I married my wife, I promised her that I would love her, I would cherish her, and I would protect her. As my father said countless times throughout my childhood, you, my wife, and you, my children, are the air that I breathe. So to my Laura, and to my Sammy, and to my Jake, there's nothing I wouldn't do to protect you. I have always tried to live a life of loyalty, friendship, generosity, and compassion. It's qualities my parents ingrained in my siblings in me since childhood. My father survived the Holocaust, thanks to the compassion and selfless acts of others. He was helped by many who put themselves in harm's way to do what they knew was right. And that is why my first instinct has always been to help those in need. And mom and dad, I am sorry I let you down. As the many people that know me best would say, I am the person that they call at 3 a.m. if they needed help. And I proudly remember being the emergency contact for many of my children's friends when they were growing up because their parents knew that I would drop everything and care for them as if they were my own. Yet last fall, I pled guilty in federal court to felonies for the benefit of, at the direction of, and in coordination with individual number one. And for the record, individual number one is President Donald J. Trump. It is painful to admit that I was motivated by ambition at times. It is even more painful to admit that many times I ignored my conscience and acted loyal to a man when I should not have. Sitting here today, it seems unbelievable that I was so mesmerized by Donald Trump that I was willing to do things for him that I knew were absolutely wrong. For that reason, I have come here to apologize to my family, to my government, and to the American people. Accordingly, let me now tell you about Mr. Trump. I got to know him very well, working very closely with him for more than 10 years as his executive vice president and special counsel, and then as personal attorney when he became president. When I first met Mr. Trump, he was a successful entrepreneur, a real estate giant, and an icon. Being around Mr. Trump was intoxicating when you were in his presence. You felt like you were involved in something greater than yourself, that you were somehow changing the world. I wound up touting the Trump narrative for over a decade. That was my job. Always stay on message. Always defend. It monopolized my life. At first, I worked mostly on real estate developments and other business transactions. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Trump brought me into his personal life and private dealings. Over time, I saw his true character revealed. Mr. Trump is an enigma. He is complicated, 
as am I. He is both good and bad, as do we all. But the bad far outweighs the good. And since taking office, he has become the worst version of himself. He is capable of behaving kindly, but he is not kind. He is capable of committing acts of generosity, but he is not generous. He is capable of being loyal, but he is fundamentally disloyal. Donald Trump is a man who ran for office to make his brand great, not to make our country great. He had no desire or intention to lead this nation, only to market himself and to build his wealth and power. Mr. Trump would often say, this campaign was going to be the greatest infomercial in political history. He never expected to win the primary. He never expected to win the general election. The campaign, for him, was always a marketing opportunity. I knew early on in my work for Mr. Trump that he would direct me to lie to further his business interests. And I am ashamed to say that when it was for a real estate mogul in the private sector, I considered it trivial. As the president, I consider it significant and dangerous. But in the mix, lying for Mr. Trump was normalized and no one around him questioned it. In fairness, no one around him today questions it either. A lot of people have asked me about whether Mr. Trump knew about the release of the hacked documents, Democratic National Committee email, ahead of time. And the answer is yes. As I earlier stated, Mr. Trump knew from Roger Stone in advance about the WikiLeaks drop of emails. In July of 2016, days before the Democratic Convention, I was in Mr. Trump's office when his secretary announced that Roger Stone was on the phone. Mr. Trump put Mr. Stone on the speakerphone. Mr. Stone told Mr. Trump that he had just gotten off the phone with Julian Assange and that Mr. Assange told Mr. Stone that within a couple of days, there would be a massive dump of emails that would damage Hillary Clinton's campaign. Mr. Trump responded by stating to the effect, wouldn't that be great? Mr. Trump is a racist. The country has seen Mr. Trump court white supremacists and bigots. You have heard him call poorer countries shitholes. His private, in private, he is even worse. He once asked me if I could name a country run by a black person that wasn't a shithole. This was when Barack Obama was president of the United States. And while we were once driving through a struggling neighborhood in Chicago, he commented that only black people could live that way. And he told me that black people would never vote for him because they were too stupid. And yet, I continued to work for him. Mr. Trump is a cheat. As previously stated, I am giving to the committee today three years of Mr. Trump's personal financial statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013, which he gave to Deutsche Bank to inquire about a loan to buy the Buffalo Bills and to Forbes. These are exhibits 1A, 1B, and 1C to my testimony. It was my experience that Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes, such as trying to be listed amongst the wealthiest people in Forbes and deflated his assets to reduce his real estate taxes. I'm sharing with you two newspaper articles side by side that are examples of Mr. Trump inflating and deflating his assets, as I said, to suit his financial interests. These are exhibit two to my testimony. As I noted, I'm giving the committee today an article he wrote on and sent to me that reported on an auction of a portrait of Mr. Trump. This is exhibit 3A to my testimony. 
Mr. Trump directed me to find a straw bidder to purchase a portrait of him that was being auctioned off at an Art Hamptons event. The objective was to ensure that this portrait, which was going to be auctioned last, would go for the highest price of any portrait that afternoon. The portrait was purchased by the fake bidder for $60,000. Mr. Trump directed the Trump Foundation, which is supposed to be a charitable organization, to repay the fake bidder, despite keeping the art for himself. And please see Exhibit 3B to my testimony. And it should come as no surprise that one of my more common responsibilities was that Mr. Trump directed me to call business owners, many of whom are small businesses that were owed money for their services, and told them that no payment or a reduced payment would be coming. When I asked Mr. Trump, or when I told Mr. Trump of my success, he actually reveled in it. And yet, I continued to work for him. Mr. Trump is a con man. He asked me to pay off an adult film star with whom he had an affair and to lie about it to his wife, which I did. And lying to the first lady is one of my biggest regrets because she is a kind, good person, and I respect her greatly, and she did not deserve that. And I'm giving the committee today a copy of the $130,000 wire transfer from me to Ms. Clifford's attorney during the closing days of the presidential campaign that was demanded by Ms. Clifford to maintain her silence about her affair with Mr. Trump. And this is exhibit four to my testimony. Mr. Trump directed me to use my own personal funds from a home equity line of credit to avoid any money being traced back to him that could negatively impact his campaign. And I did that too, without bothering to consider whether that was improper, much less whether it was the right thing to do or how would it impact me, my family, or the public. And I am going to jail in part because of my decision to help Mr. Trump hide that payment from the American people before they voted a few days later. As Exhibit 5A to my testimony shows, I am providing a copy of a $35,000 check that President Trump personally signed from his personal bank account on August 1st of 2017, when he was President of the United States, pursuant to the cover-up which was the basis of my guilty plea to reimburse me, the word used by Mr. Trump's TV lawyer for the illegal hush money I paid on his behalf. This $35,000 check was one of 11 check installments that was paid throughout the year while he was president. Other checks to reimburse me for the hush money payments were signed by Donald Trump Jr. and Alan Weisselberg. And see for exa that for example, 5B. The President of the United States thus wrote a personal check for the payment of hush money as part of a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws. And you can find the details of that scheme directed by Mr. Trump in the pleadings in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. So picture this scene. In February of 2017, one month into his presidency, I'm visiting President Trump in the Oval Office for the first time, and it's truly awe-inspiring. He's showing me all around and pointing to different paintings, and he says to me something to the effect of, don't worry, Michael, your January and February reimbursement checks are coming. They were FedExed from New York, and it takes a while for that to get through the White House system. As he promised, I received the first check for the reimbursement of $70,000 not long thereafter. 
when I say con man, I'm talking about a man who declares himself brilliant, but directed me to threaten his high school, his colleges, and the college board to never release his grades or SAT scores. As I mentioned, I'm giving the committee today copies of a letter I sent at Mr. Trump's direction threatening these schools with civil and criminal actions if Mr. Trump's grades or SAT scores were ever disclosed without his permission. And these are under Exhibit C, uh, 6. The irony wasn't lost on me at the time that Mr. Trump, in 2011, had strongly criticized President Obama for not releasing his grades. As you can see in Exhibit 7, Mr. Trump declared, let him show his records after calling President Obama a terrible student. The sad fact is that I never heard Mr. Trump say anything in private that led me to believe he loved our nation or wanted to make it better. In fact, he did the opposite. When telling me in 2008 or 2009 that he was cutting employees' salaries in half, including mine. He showed me what he claimed was a $10 million IRS tax refund. And he said that he could not believe how stupid the government was for giving someone like him that much money back. During the campaign, Mr. Trump said that he did not consider Vietnam veteran and prisoner of war, Senator John McCain, to be a hero because he likes people who weren't captured. At the same time, Mr. Trump tasked me to handle the negative press surrounding his medical deferment from the Vietnam draft. Mr. Trump claimed it was because of a bone spur, but when I asked for medical records, he gave me none and said that there was no surgery. He told me not to answer the specific questions by reporters, but rather offer simply the fact that he received a medical deferment. He finished the conversation with the following comment, you think I'm stupid? I'm not going to Vietnam. And I find it ironic, Mr. President, that you are in Vietnam right now. And yet, I continue to work for him. Questions have been raised about whether I know of direct evidence that Mr. Trump or his campaign colluded with Russia. I do not. And I want to be clear, but I have my suspicions. Sometime in the summer of 2017, I read all over the media that there had been a meeting in Trump Tower in June of 2016 involving Don Jr. and others from the campaign with Russians including a representative of the Russian government, and an email setting up the meeting with the subject line, dirt on Hillary Clinton. And something clicked in my mind. I remember being in a room with Mr. Trump, probably in early June of 2016, when something peculiar happened. Don Trump Jr. came into the room and walked behind his father's desk, which in and of itself was unusual. People didn't just walk behind Mr. Trump's desk to talk to him. And I recall Don Jr. Leave, leaning over to his father and speaking in a low voice, which I could clearly hear, and saying, the meeting is all set. And I remember Mr. Trump saying, okay, good, let me know. What struck me as I looked back and thought about the exchange between Don Jr. and his father was first, that Mr. Trump had frequently told me and others that his son Don Jr. had the worst judgment of anyone in the world. And also that Don Jr. would never set up any meeting of significance alone, and certainly not without checking with his father. I also knew that nothing went on in Trump world, especially the campaign without Mr. Trump's knowledge and approval. So I concluded that Don Jr. was referring to that June 2016 Trump Tower meeting about dirt on Hillary with the Russian representatives 
when he walked behind his dad's desk that day, and that Mr. Trump knew that was the meeting Don Jr. was talking about when he said, that's good, let me know. Over the past year or so, I have done some real soul searching, and I see now that my ambition and the intoxication of Trump power had much to do with the bad decisions in part that I made. And to you, Chairman Cummings and Ranking Member Jordan, and the other members of this committee, and the members of the House and Senate, I am sorry for my lies and for lying to Congress. And to our nation, I am sorry for actively working to hide from you the truth about Mr. Trump when you needed it most. For those who question my motives for being here today, I understand. I have lied, but I am not a liar. And I have done bad things, but I am not a bad man. I have fixed things, but I am no longer your fixer, Mr. Trump. And I'm going to prison and have shattered the safety and security that I tried so hard to provide for my family. My testimony certainly does not diminish the pain that I have caused my family and my friends. Nothing can do that. And I have never asked for, nor would I accept, a pardon from President Trump. And by coming today, I have caused my family to be the target of personal, scurrilous attacks by the President and his lawyer, trying to intimidate me from appearing before this panel. Mr. Trump called me a rat for choosing to tell the truth, much like a mobster would do when one of his men decides to cooperate with the government. And as Exhibit 8 shows, I have provided the committee with copies of tweets that Mr. Trump posted, attacking me and my family. And only someone burying his head in the sand would not recognize them for what they are. It's encouragement to someone to do harm to me and my family. And I never imagined that he would engage in vicious, false attacks on my family and unleash his TV lawyer to do the same. And I hope this committee and all members of Congress on both sides of the aisle make it clear that as a nation, we should not tolerate attempts to intimidate witnesses before Congress and attacks on family are out of bounds and not acceptable. And I wish to especially thank Speaker Pelosi for her statements, and it's Exhibit 9, to protect this institution and me and the Chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Adam Schiff, and you, Chairman Cummings, for likewise defending the institution and my family against the attacks by Mr. Trump, and also the many Republicans who have admonished the President as well. I am not a perfect man. I have done things I am not proud of, and I will live with the consequences of my actions for the rest of my life. But today, I get to decide the example that I set for my children and how I attempt to change how history will remember me. I may not be able to change the past, but I can do right by the American people here today. And I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Cohen. I now recognize myself. Uh, Mr. Cohen, before I start, I want to make sure you really understand something. You have admitted lying to Congress, to this very body, and now you're going to prison for it. Do you, Mr. Cohen, recognize the gravity of your offenses? You are a lawyer, right? As of yesterday, I am no longer a lawyer. I have lost my law license amongst other things. But you understand the gravity of this moment? I most certainly do, Mr. Chairman. I want you to really hear this, Mr. Cohen. We will not tolerate lying to this Congress by anybody. We're in search of the truth. 
Do you understand that? I do. Now, the President has also made numerous statements that turned out to be inaccurate. For example, he said he knew nothing about the hush money payments to Ms. Clifford. And his 2017 financial disclosure form said he never owed money to reimburse you for those payments. Yet, in your testimony, Mr. Cohen, you said that you met with the President in the Oval Office in February of 2017 and discussed his plans to reimburse you for money you paid. You say he told you, and I quote, don't worry, Michael, your January and February reimbursement checks are coming. Is that accurate? And was that in the Oval Office? The statement is accurate, but the discussions regarding the reimbursement occurred long before he became president. Would you explain that? Back in 2017, when uh, actually I apologize, in 2016, prior to the election, I was contacted by Keith Davidson, who is the attorney, or was the attorney for Ms. Clifford, for Stormy Daniels. And after several rounds of conversations with him about purchasing her life rights for $130,000, what I did each and every time is go straight into Mr. Trump's office and discuss the issue with him. When it was ultimately determined, and this was days before the election, that Mr. Trump was going to pay the $130,000. In the office with me was Alan Weisselberg, the chief financial officer of the Trump Organization. He acknowledged to Alan that he was going to pay the $130,000 and that Alan and I should go back to his office and figure out how to do it. So, yes, sir, I stand by the statement that I gave, but there was a history to it. In your testimony, uh, you, have, you said you bought some, some checks, is that right? You said you bought some checks. Yes, sir. Let me ask you about one of these. Um, this uh, from the Trump Trust that holds the uh, president businesses. Can you tell me who signed uh, this check? I believe that the top signature is Donald Trump Jr. And the bottom signature, I believe, is Alan Weisselberg's. And can you tell me the date of that check? March 17th of 2017. Now, wait, wait a minute. Hold up. The date on the check is after President Trump held his big press conference claiming that he gave up control of his businesses. How could the president have arranged for you to get this check if he was supposedly playing no role in his business? Because the payments were designed to be paid over the course of 12 months, and it was declared to be a retainer for services um, that would be provided for the year of 2017. Was there a retainer agreement? There is no retainer agreement. Would Don Jr. or Mr. Weisselberg have more information about that? Mr. Weisselberg, for sure, about the entire discussions and negotiations prior to the election, and Don Jr. would have cursory information. Now, here's another one. This, this one appears to be signed by Donald Trump himself. Is that his signature? That is Donald Trump's signature. So let me make sure I understand. Donald Trump wrote you a check out of his personal account while he was serving as President of the United States of America to reimburse you for hush money payments to Ms. Clifford. Is that what you are telling the American people today? Yes, Mr. Chairman. One final question. The President claimed he knew nothing about these payments. His ethics filing said he owed nothing 
to you. Based on your conversations with him, is there any doubt in your mind that President Trump knew exactly what he was paying for? There is no doubt in my mind, and I truly believe there is no doubt in the mind of the people of the United States of America. And these new documents appear to corroborate what you just told us. With that, I'll yield to the gentleman from gentleman. Right. I will make sure that you and I meet one day while we're in the courthouse, and I will take you for every penny you still don't have, and I will come after your daily beast and everybody else that you possibly know. So I'm warning you, tread very effing lightly, because what I'm going to do to you is going to be effing disgusting. You understand me. Mr. Cohen, who said that? I did. And did you say that, Mr. Cohen, uh, in your testimony on page two, you said you did things for Mr. Trump in an effort to protect him. Was that statement that I just read that you admitted to saying, did you do that to protect Donald Trump? I did it to protect Mr. Trump, Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka Trump, and Eric Trump. And in your sentencing statement back in December in front of the judge, you said this, Mr. Cohen, my weakness can be characterized as a blind loyalty to Donald Trump, a blind loyalty that led me to choose a path of darkness. Is that accurate, Mr. Cohen? I wrote that. You wrote that and said that in front of the judge. Is that right? That's correct. Let me read a few other things here, and let me ask you, why you did some of these things. When you filed a false tax return in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016, was all that out of blind loyalty to the president? No, it was not. When you failed to report four million in income to the Internal Revenue Service, did you do that to protect Donald Trump? No, I did not. And when you failed to pay 1.4 million in taxes, I got constituents who don't make that in a lifetime. When you fail to pay $1.4 in taxes to the U.S. Treasury, was that out of some blind loyalty to the President of the United States? It was not, but the number was 1.38 and change, and I have paid that money back to the IRS I at this the, time. I think the American people will appreciate that 1.38. And I would also just like to say it was over a course of five years approximately 260,000 a year. Yeah, and that's what I said, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2000, that's five years. Yes. Got it. When you made false statements to financial institutions concerning a home equity line of credit, taxi medallions, and your Park Avenue apartment in 2013, 2014, and 2015, and you pled guilty to making those false statements to those banks, was that all done to protect the president? No, it was not. How about this one? When you created the fake Twitter account, Women for Cohen, and paid a firm to post tweets like this one, in a world of lies, deception, and fraud, we appreciate this honest guy, at Michael Cohen, hashtag TGIF, hashtag handsome, hashtag sexy. Was that done to protect the president? Yeah, Mr. Jordan, I didn't actually set that up. It was done by a young lady that worked for Red Finch, and during the course of the campaign, which you would know gets somewhat crazy and wild, we were having fun. That's what it was, sir. We were having fun. Was it done to protect the president? That was not done to protect the president. Was it a fake Twitter account? That was, no, that was a real Twitter account. It exists. You pay a firm to create this Twitter I didn't pay the firm to do calling. that. It was done by a young lady that works for the firm. And again, sir, we were having fun during a stressful time. The point is, Mr. Cohen, did you lie to protect the president or did you lie to help yourself? I'm not sure how that helped me, sir. I'm not sure how it did either. Right. And the I would like to I also note that more than half the people and, and on that site point. are men. Here's the point. <laughs> the chairman just gave you a 30-minute opening statement, and you have a history of lying over and over and over again. And frankly, don't take my word for it. Take what the court said. Take what the Southern District of New York said. Cohen did crimes that were marked by a pattern of deception and that permeated his professional life. These crimes were distinct in their harms but bear a common set of circumstances. They each involved deception and were each, each motivated by personal greed and ambition. A pattern of deception 
for personal greed and ambition, and you just got 30 minutes of an opening statement where you trashed the President of the United States of America. Mr. Cohen, how long did, how long did you work for Donald Trump? Approximately a decade. Ten years? That's correct. And you said all these bad things about the President there in that last 30 minutes, and yet you worked for him for 10 years? All those bad things, I mean, if it's that bad, I can see you working for him for 10 days, maybe 10 weeks, maybe even 10 months. But you worked for him for 10 years. Mr. Cohen, how, how, long, did you, uh, how long did you work in the White House? I never worked in the White House. And that's the point, isn't it, Mr. Cohen? No, sir. Yes, it is. No, it's not, sir. You wanted to work in the White House. No, you sir. You didn't get brought to the dance. Sir. And now? I was extremely proud to be personal attorney to the President of the United States of America. I did not want to go to the White House. I was offered jobs. I can tell you a story of Mr. Trump reaming out Reince Priebus because I had not taken a job where Mr. Trump wanted me to, which is working with Don McGahn at the White House General Counsel's Mr. Cohen, office. you work for the sir, President. Sir, one, one second. All right. What I said at the time, and I brought a lawyer in who produced a memo as to why I should not go in because there would be no attorney-client privilege. And in order to handle Mr. some Cohen? of the matters that I talked about in my opening, that it would be best suited for me not to go in and that every president had a personal Cohen, here's attorney. What I see. Here's what I see. I see a guy who worked for 10 years and is here trashing the guy he worked for for 10 years, didn't get a job in the White House, and now, and now you're, you're behaving just like everyone else who's got fired or didn't get the job they wanted, like Andy McCabe, like James Comey, same kind of selfish motivation after you don't get the thing you want. That's what I see here today, and I think that's what the American people Mr. See. Jordan, all I wanted was what I got to be personal attorney to the president, to enjoy the senior You're year of my form, son in high school and waiting for my daughter who's graduating from college to come back to New York. I got exactly what I want. Gentlemen, stop. Exactly what you want? What you I want wanted, prison that's right. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I received time exactly time. what I wanted. Gentlemen, time has expired. Mr. Washington Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, thank you for being here today. As you likely know, I served as the chair of the Democratic National Committee at the time of the Russian hacks and when Russia weaponized the messages that it had stolen. But I want to be clear. My questions are not about the harm done to any individual by WikiLeaks and the Russians. It's about the possible and likely harm to the United States of America and our democracy. I have a series of questions that I hope will connect more of these dots. Mr. Cohen, is it your testimony that Mr. Trump had advanced knowledge of the Russia WikiLeaks release of the DNC's emails? It's, um, it's a, I, can't, I cannot answer that in a yes or no. He had advanced notice that there was going to be a dump of emails, but at no time did I hear the specificity of what those emails were going to be. But you do testify today that he had advanced knowledge of their, of their imminent release. That, that is what I had stated that, in my testimony. And that he cheered that outcome? Yes, ma'am. Did Mr. Trump likely share this information with his daughter Ivanka, son Don Jr., or Jared Kushner? I'm not aware of that. Was Ivanka, Jared, or Don Jr. still involved in the, in the Russian tower deal at that time? The company was involved in the deal, which meant that the family was involved in the deal. If Mr. Trump and his daughter Ivanka and son Donald, Donald Jr. are involved in the, rump, in, the, in the Russian Trump Tower deal, is it possible the whole family is confi conflicted or compromised with a foreign adversary in the months before the election? Yes. Based on your experience with the President and knowledge of his relationship with Mr. Stone, do you have reason to believe that the President explicitly or implicitly authorized Mr. Stone to make contact with WikiLeaks and to indicate the campaign's interest in the strategic release of these illegally hacked materials? I'm not aware of that. Was Mr. Stone a free agent reporting back to the President what he had done? Or was he an agent of the campaign acting on behalf of the President and with his apparent authority? No, he was a free agent. A free agent that was reporting back to the President what he had done. Correct. He frequently reached out to Mr. Trump, and Mr. Trump was 
very happy to take his calls. It was free service. Hmm. Roger Stone says he never spoke with Mr. Trump about WikiLeaks. How can we corrob corroborate what you are saying? I don't know, but I suspect that the special counsel's office and other um, government agencies have the information that you're seeking. Moving on to a little later in 2016, a major WikiLeaks dump happens hours after the Access Hollywood tape is released. Do you believe or are you aware of Mr. Trump coordinating or signaling for this email dump? I am unaware of that. I actually was not even in the country at the time of the Billy Bush um, tape. I was in London visiting my daughter. Knowing how Mr. Trump operates with his winning at all costs mentality, do you believe that he would cooperate or collude with a foreign power to win the presidency? Is he capable of that? It calls on so much speculation, ma'am. It would be unfair for me to. I understand, give an but you have a that. tremendous amount of experience. Given Mr. What Trump you today. is all about winning, and, and he your, will do what is necessary within which opinion, to win. And in your opinion and experience, would he have the potential to cooperate or collude with a foreign power to win the presidency at all costs? Yes. Based on what you know, would Mr. Trump, or did he, lie about colluding and coordinating with the Russians at any point during the campaign? So as I stated in my testimony, I wouldn't use the word colluding. Um, was there something odd about the back and forth praise with President Putin? Yes, but I'm not really sure that I can answer that question um, in terms of collusion. I was not part of the campaign. Um, I don't know the other conversations that Mr. Trump had with other individuals. There's just so many dots that all seem to lead to the same direction. And finally, before my time expires, Mr. Cohen, the campaign and the entire Trump organization appeared to be filthy with Russian contact. There are Russian business contacts. There are campaign Russia, Russian contacts. There are lies about all of those contacts. And then we have Roger Stone informing the president just before the Democratic National Convention, that, these, that WikiLeaks was going to drop documents in the public arena that we knew at that point were hacked and stolen by Russia from the Democratic National Committee. The gentle lady's time has expired. You may answer her inquiry. My, my question is, Quickly. given all those connections, is it likely that Donald Trump was fully aware and had every intent of working with Russia to help make sure that he could win the presidency at all costs. Okay. So let, let me say that this is a matter that's currently being handled by the House Select and the Senate Select Intelligence Committees, and so I would rather not answer that sp specific question other than just to tell you that Mr. <coughs> Trump's desire to win would f have him work with anyone. And one other thing that I had said uh, in my statement is that when it came to the Trump Tower Moscow um, project, it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and we never expected to win the election. So this was just business as usual. Right. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. This is great of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Jordan. The chairman and this committee have promised members of the American people a fair and open process. Yet the Democrats have vastly limited the scope of this hearing. They've issued a gag order to try to tell members of this committee what we can and cannot talk about. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle claim that they want the truth, that they want transparency and fair oversight. Yet the Democrats, witness to testify before Congress today, is none other than a scorned man who's going to prison for lying to Congress. Let that sink in. He's going to prison for lying to Congress, and he's the star witness to Congress. If you read the sentencing report on Mr. Cohen, words like deceptive and greedy are scattered throughout that report. It paints a picture of a narcissist, a bully, who cannot tell the truth, whether it's about the president or 
about his own personal life. But today, he's the majority party's star witness. If the Democrats were after the truth, they'd have an honest person here testifying. And if they were really after the truth, they'd not restrict the questioning to just a few topics. But let's, let's take a look at those restricted topics. Mr. Chairman, the first topic in your limited scope that I can ask Mr. Cohen is about the president's debts. But Mr. Chairman, didn't Mr. Cohen plead guilty to lying to banks about his personal finances? So we're asking a guy going to jail for lying about his debts to comment about the president's debts. He's the expert. Mr. Chairman, your next couple of topics say that I can ask Mr. Cohen about the president's compliance with financial disclosures and campaign finance laws, but didn't Mr. Cohen on two occasions break campaign finance law with his own donations? So again, the majority party star witness on the president's compliance is a guy who broke compliance laws himself. Mr. Chairman, you graciously allow us to ask questions of Mr. Cohen on the president's dealings with the IRS and tax law. Your star witness here broke the law with regards to the IRS at least five times. He pled guilty on cheating on his taxes, lying to the IRS. He's the best witness you got. Next up, with the permission of the chairman, I get to ask Mr. Cohen about his perspective on the president's business dealings. Let me get this straight. The, the witness lied to multiple financial institutions to get loans to pay off other loans just to keep himself afloat, and he's going to be the expert on business practices. Obviously, Mr. Chairman, the witness may produce documents that he suggests incriminates the president, yet he lies to banks. All of those lies were done on fraudulent documents, documents that he forged. Nothing he says or produces has any credibility. Apparently, he even lied about delivering his own child, which his wife had to correct the record of. Ladies and gentlemen, how on earth is this witness credible? With all the lies and deception, the self-serving fraud, it begs the question, what is the majority party doing here? No one can see this guy as credible. He will say whatever he wants to accomplish his own personal goals. He's a fake witness, and his presence here is a travesty. I hope the American people see through this. I know the people back in Tennessee will. And with that statement, sir, I have a few questions of the witness. With your loss of your law license, I think you mentioned in your opening statement that you had been disbarred. What is your source of income in the future? I don't expect I'm going to have a source of income when I'm in federal penitentiary. What, uh, is there a book deal coming or anything like that? I have no book deal right now in the process. I have been contacted by many including for television, the movie. If you want to tell me who you would like to play you, I'm more than happy to write the name <laughs> down. I'm sure but there's I will a also like to man. turn around and just to correct your statement on me. No Well, let me ask one other question, though. I, I only have a limited amount of no time. No individual. One quick, one quick question. Who paid your expenses to be here today? Who's paid my expenses? To be here today. I paid my expenses. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the remaining of my time to uh, the, the ranking member. Mr. Cohen, how many times did you talk to the special counsel's office? Seven. How, uh, did they talk to you at all in preparation for today's hearing between the seven times you talked to them prior to your sentencing? Uh, have you had any conversations with the special counsel's office between sentencing and today? I'm sorry, sir. I don't understand your question. You talked to him seven times. That's in the sentencing uh, uh, memorandums that were in front of the court back in December. What I'm asking is have, how many times have you talked to the special counsel's office since then uh, up to today's appearance here in Congress. The gentleman's time has expired. You may answer the question now. That one question. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Mr. Maloney. That wasn't, well, I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Cohen, in, in your, your 10 years of uh, working for Donald Trump, did he control everything that went on in the Trump organization? And did you have to get his permission in advance and report back after every meeting of any importance? Yes. My there, was, there was nothing that happened at the Trump Organization 
from whether it was a response as the Daily Beast story that you referred to, ranking member, that did not go through Mr. Trump with his approval and sign off, as in the case of the payments. How many, how many times did the President, Michael, uh, ask you or direct you to try to reach settlements with women in 2015 and 2016? Yeah, I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I'd have to go back and try to recollect. It's certainly the two that we know about. And uh, why, why do you think the president did not provide the accurate information in his 2017 uh, financial disclosure form? What was he uh, trying to hide? He corrected other forms, but he didn't correct this one. The payments on the reimbursement of the funds that I extended on his behalf. Uh, can you elaborate more? Well, going back into the story, as I stated, when we, Alan Weisselberg and I left the office and we went to his office in order to make the determination on how the money was going to be wired to the IOLA, the interest on a lawyer's account uh, for Keith Davidson in California, I had asked Alan to use his money. Didn't want to use mine, and he said he couldn't, and we then decided um, how else we can do it. And he asked me whether or not I know anybody who wants to have a party at one of his clubs that could pay me instead, or somebody who may have wanted to become a member of one of the golf clubs. And I also don't have anybody that was interested in that. And it got to the point where it was down to the wire. It was either we, somebody wire the funds and purchase the life rights to the story, from Miss Clifford, or it was going to end up being sold to television, and that would have embarrassed the president, and it would have interfered with the election. But the president has never amended his 2017 form uh, to this day, and while you're facing the consequences of going to jail, he is not. Well, I believe that they amended a financial disclosure form, and there's a footnote somewhere buried um, I don't recall specifically what it says, but there is a footnote buried somewhere. Can you describe, Michael, to the American people, catch and kill? So catch and kill is a method that exists when you're working with a news outlet. In this specific case, it was a AMI, National Enquirer, David Pecker, Dylan Howard, and others, where they would contact me or Mr. Trump or someone, and state that there's a story that's percolating out there that you may be interested in. And then what you do is you contact that individual and you purchase the rights to that story from them. And, and you practice this for the president? I was involved in several of these um, catch and kill episodes, but these catch and kill scenarios existed between David Pecker and Mr. Trump long before I started working for him in 2007. Michael, can you suggest who else this committee should talk to for additional information on this or anything else? Yes, I believe David Pecker, Dylan Howard, um, Barry Levine of AMI as well, um, Alan Weisselberg, Alan Garten of the Trump Organization as well. Well, thank you very much for your testimony, and Mr. Chairman, this is a story of redemption. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Comer. Mr. Cohen, in your testimony, you stated that you began work for the Trump Organization as a lawyer dealing with real estate transactions. Is that, that correct? That's correct. Uh, prior to coming to Congress, I served as a director of two different banks, so I've seen hundreds of loan applications, and to uh, try to determine your credibility here today, I just wanted to ask you a couple of real estate transaction questions just to see how, in fact, you, you operate. According to the Southern District of New York prosecutors, you lied to banks to secure loans by falsely stating the amount of debt you were carrying. Mr. Cohen, my question to you, was it Donald Trump's fault that you knowingly committed a crime of deception to defraud a bank? No, it's not. Was that fraudulent loan you obtained for the Trump Organization or for you personally? 
it would be for me, though I'm not familiar with which loan that you're referring to. Mr. I would, Cohen, like, to, I would the, like to say one thing, Mr. sir. Cohen, sorry, I would like you, just to respond. When, the loan we're that you about, guilty. when we're talking about the home equity line of credit, which is what I believe you're referring to. We're also um, referring, I'm no, going to ask a question no pertaining to your summer home yes, that you purchased. I too. never purchased a summer home. No individual or no bank in the 22 years that I've had loans have ever lost a dollar with me. I owe no money to any bank. Well, the banks usually find out if someone's trying to deceive them. In 22 did your, years, did your I have no money loyalty? that's ever been owed Mr. Cohen, to any individual Mr. Mr. or any bank. Mr. Cohen, did your so-called blind loyalty to the president cause you to defraud the bank for your own personal gain? Sir, I take exception to that because there has never been a fraud on a, a – I never defrauded any bank. Well, let's dig a little deeper on that, on the bank fraud. According to the Southern District of New York, you failed to disclose more than $20 million in liabilities, as well as tens of thousands of dollars of monthly expenses. That's according to the Southern District of New York. Now, Mr. Cohen, you being a lawyer, surely you knew you were breaking the law. No, no why would you have done that? Sir, I'm not a CPA, and um, I pled guilty. I'm going to prison as a because result of it. Because you're a con? Uh, no, sir. Because I pled guilty and I am going to be doing the time, I have caused tremendous, tremendous pain to my family, and I take well, let's, no let's go happiness back to the, one in the last statements. question about the bank. When the bank found out about the liabilities that you failed to disclose, you lied again to the bank, this is according to the Southern District of New York, and said it had been expunged when in fact you just shifted the debt to another bank. So apparently, According to the information that, that we received, your intent to defraud the bank was for the de desire to purchase the summer home for $8.5 million? No, sir. That's that would have been off of an equity line, considering I had less than a 50% loan to value on the assets, and it was a pre-existing line of credit that existed years before the date that you're referring to, where... This is all surrounding New York City taxi medallions. But you understand that when you fail to disclose liabilities, especially $20 million in liabilities, that is, in fact, fraud. Except even with the $20 million in liability. How much was it? The medallions were at that time worth over $45 million. Mr. Mr. Cohen, you called Donald Trump a cheat in your opening testimony. What would you call yourself? A fool. You calling, okay, well, no comment on that. I, I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, we said we were in search of the truth. I, I don't believe that Michael Cohen is capable of telling the truth. And I would hope that as this committee moves forward, that when we have the opportunity to subpoena witnesses, we subpoena witnesses that are not uh, recently disbarred, are not convicted felon, and witnesses that haven't committed bank fraud and tax fraud. That is how we're going to determine the truth. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time to the ranking member. They, I think, gentlemen, for you. I would just make one point. We just had a, a, a five-minute debate where Mr. Cohen disputes what the Southern District of New York found, what the judge found, that he was actually guilty of committing bank fraud. If, if this statement back here doesn't say it all. Cohen's consciousness of wrongdoing is fleeting. His remorse is minimal. His instinct is to blame others is to blame others is strong. There's only thing one wrong with that statement. His remorse is non-existent. He just debated a member of Congress saying, "I really didn't do anything wrong with the false bank things that that I'm guilty of and going to prison for." Mr. Jordan, that that's not that's not what I said, and you know that that's, that's not exactly what I said. What well, I said, I, you I pled you guilty, know. and I take responsibility for my actions. Shame on you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Mr. That's Chair not what I said. Mr. Shame on Mr. You. Mr. Chairman. That's not what I said. What I said is I took responsibility and I take responsibility. What I was doing is explaining to the gentleman that his facts are inaccurate. I still I take responsibility for my mistakes. All right. I am remorseful and I am going to prison. I will be away from my wife and family for years.
So before you turn around we and you cast that. more dispersion, understand please understand, understand, there are people watching you today that know me a whole lot, that I made mistakes, I own them, and I didn't fight with the Southern District of New York. I didn't put the system through an entire scenario. But what I did do is I pled guilty, all right, and I am going to be, again, going to prison. Mr. Norton. Mr. Cohn, uh, at the center of uh, the reasons you're going to prison uh, is conviction for campaign finance uh, violations. And they center around uh, some salacious re revelations. The Washington Post uh, reported uh, or aired uh, a Access Hollywood video. <clears throat> it, it set a record for the number of people who watched crash the newspaper's server. Uh, but this happened in early October on the cusp of the election. Uh, what was Mr. Trump's reaction to the video becoming public at that time, and was he concerned about the impact of that video on the election? The answer is yes. As I stated before, I was in London at the time visiting my daughter who was studying there for Washington semester abroad. And I received a phone call during the dinner from Hope Hicks stating that she had just spoken to Mr. Trump and we need you to start making phone calls to the various different news outlets that you have relationships with. And we need to spin this. And what we want to do is just to claim that this was men locker room talk. What's the concern about the election in particular? The answer is yes. Then couple that with Karen McDougal, which then came out around the same time, and then on top of that, the Stormy Daniels matter. Yeah, the, and, and, and these things happened in the month before the election and almost one after the other. Uh, the Stormy Daniels revelation where prosecutors and officials uh, of the prosecutors uh, learned of, of, of that, uh, of that uh, matter uh, and prosecutors stated that the officials at the magazine contacted you about the story, and I'm, the, the magazine, of course, is the National Inquiry. Is, is that correct that they did? Yes, ma'am. Come to you. Um, were you concerned about this new story becoming uh, public right after the Access Hollywood study in terms of impact on the election? I was concerned about it, but more importantly, Mr. Trump was and concerned about it. That was my it. next question. What was the President's concern about these matters becoming public in October uh, as we were about to go into an election? I don't think anybody would dispute this belief that after the wild fire that encompassed the Billy Bush tape, that a second follow-up to it would have been um, pleasant. And he was concerned with the effect that it had had uh, on the campaign, on how women were seeing him, and ultimately whether or not he would have a shot uh, in the general election. And so you negotiated the $130,000 payment. Um the $130,000 number was not a number that was actually negotiated. It was told to me by Keith Davidson that this is a number that Ms. Clifford wanted. Well, you finally, you finally completed that deal, as it were, on October the 20th, 20th. Uh, days before the election. What happened in the interim? Contemplated whether or not to do it. Um, wasn't sure if she was really going to go public. There was, again, some communications back and forth between myself and Keith Davidson. 
And ultimately, it came to either do it or don't. At which time, again, I had gone into Mr. Trump's office, as I did after each and every conversation. And he had told me that he had spoken to a couple of friends, and it's 130000 It's not a lot of money, and we should just do it. So go ahead and do it. And I was at the time with Alan Weisselberg, where he directed us to go back to Mr. Weisselberg's office and figure this all out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Beddoes. Mr. Cohen, uh, do you know Lynn Patton? I'm, I'm right here. Oh, yes, sir. Do you know Lynn Patton? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I asked Lynn to come today in her personal capacity uh, to actually shed some light. H how long have you known Ms. Patton? I'm responsible for Lynn Patton joining the Trump Organization and the job that she currently holds. Well, uh, that's, I'm glad you acknowledged that because you made some very um, demeaning comments about the, the president that Ms. Patton doesn't agree with. In fact, it has to do with your claim of racism. She says that as a daughter of a man born in Birmingham, Alabama, that there is no way that she would work for, a, for a, an individual who was racist. How do you reconcile the two of those, Mr. As neither should I as the son of a Holocaust survivor. But, Mr. Cohen, I guess what I'm saying is, is I've talked to, to the president over 300 times. I've not heard one time a racist comment out of, out of his mouth in private. So how do you reconcile it? Do you have proof of those conversations? I would ask you to Do you ask have tape recordings of those conversations? No, sir. Well, you've taped everybody else. That's, Why wouldn't you have a tape? That's also not true, sir. That's not true. You haven't taped anybody? I, I have taped individuals. How many times have you taped individuals? Maybe 100 times over 10 years. Is that a low estimate? Because I've, I've heard it's over 200 times. No, I don't think. I think it's approximately about 100 from what I recall. But I would ask so you, why would, you ask me a question, if, sir. Do you have so proof? Here's, do you will, have proof, yes or no? I do. Oh, where's the proof? Ask Ms. Patton how many people who are black are executives at the Mi Trump Organization. Mi Mr. And the Cohen, answer is Mr. zero. Mr. Cohen, we can go through this. Here's, I, would ask you ask you, me, I would ask unanimous consent that her entire statement be put in the record. Without objection. All right, let me go on a little bit further. Did you collect... $1.2 million or so from Novartis. I did. For access to the Trump administration? No, sir. Why did you collect it? Because they came to me based upon my knowledge of the enigma, Donald Trump, what he thinks. So they how paid. He did, sir, please let me finish. No, did they pay you $1.2 million that, to yes. give them advice? Yes, they did. They, a multi billion dollar conglomerate, came to me looking for information, not something that's unusual here in D.C., looking for information, and they believed that I had a value. So how many times did you meet with them? was the insight that I was capable of offering them, how many and they times, were willing to pay. How many times did you meet with them? For $1.2 million, how many times did you meet with them? I provided them with both in person as well as telephone access whenever they needed. How many times? Yes, sir. That's a question, I, Mr. I Cohen. I don't recall, sir. So did you ever talk yeah, to them? I spoke to them on several occasions, yes. How many? Uh, six times. Six times. Wow. $200,000 a call. Sir, I also would like to, right, I also would like I, to bring to your attention five minutes, the contract. This is my five minutes, Mr. Cohen, not yours. Did you get money from the Bank of Kazakhstan? It's not a Bank of Kazakhstan. It's called BTA. BTA Bank, Kazakhstan BTA Bank. Did you get money from them? I did. For what purpose? The purpose was because the former CEO of that bank um, had absconded with over, it was between four to six billion dollars, and some of that money was here in the United States, and they sought my assistance in terms of finding, locating that money, and helping them to recollect it. So are you saying that all the reports that you were paid in some estimates, over $4 million, to have access and understanding of the Trump administration. You're saying that all of that was just paid to you just because you're a nice guy. Well, I am a nice guy, but more importantly, well, yeah, each I and would every, beg to differ. The, the record contract, reflects that you're not a nice sir, guy. Each and every contract contained the clause in my contracts that said, I will not lobby and I do not do government relations work. In fact, in fact, Novartis sent me their contract, 
which stated specifically that they wanted me to lobby, that they wanted me to provide access to government, including the president. That information, that paragraph was crossed out by me, initialed, and written in my own handwriting. It says, I will not lobby or do government relations work. So Novartis representatives say that it was like they were hiring a non-registered lobbyist. So you disagree with that? I don't know what they said, sir, but the contract Have you ever itself. contacted anybody in the administration? Yes. To, to advocate on behalf of, of any aspect of any of your contracts? I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman. I ask, I ask unanimous consent. The, gentleman, the gentleman's time has expired. You may answer the question. I, I, I don't know what you're referring to, sir. M Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Clay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, I'm pleased you agreed to testify today voluntarily. In my view, we are all here for just one reason, and that's the American people are tired of being lied to. Uh, they have been lied to by President Trump. They've been lied to by the president's children. They have been lied to by the president's legal representatives. And it pains me to say that they have been even lied to by his congressional enablers who are still devoted to per perpetuating and protecting this giant con game on the American people. Now, Mr. Cohen, I'd like to talk to you about the president's assets. Since by law, these must be reported accurately on his federal financial disclosures and when he submits them uh, for a bank loan. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you served for nearly a decade as then businessman Trump's personal attorney and so-called fixer. Uh, did, you have, did you also have an understanding of the president's assets and how he valued those items? Yes. In November of 2017, Crane's New York business reported that the Trump Organization provided, quote, flagrantly untrue revenue figures going back to at least 2010 to influence Crane's ranking of the largest private companies in New York. According to the reports, while the Trump Organization reported nearly $9.5 billion in revenues in 2016, public filings suggested revenues were actually less than one-tenth of that. To your knowledge, did the President or his company ever inflate assets or revenues? Yes. And uh, was that done with the president's knowledge or direction? Everything was done with the knowledge and at the direction of Mr. Trump. Well, tell us why he would do that and what purpose did it serve? It depends upon the situation. Um, there were times that I was asked, again with Alan Weisselberg, the CFO, mm -hmm. to go back and to speak with an individual from Forbes because Mr. Trump wanted each year to have his net worth rise on the Forbes wealthiest individuals list. And so what you do is you look at the assets and you try to find an asset that has, say, for example, 40 Wall Street, which is about 1.2 million square feet. Find an asset that is comparable, find the highest price per square foot that's achieved in the area, and apply it to that building. Or if you're going off of your rent roll, you can go by the gross rent roll times a multiple, and you make up the multiple, which is something that he had talked about. It's based upon what he wanted to value the asset at. You know, you, you have provided the com this committee with copies of the president's financial statements or parts of them from 2011, 2012, and 13. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit those for the record. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit the statements to the record. Without objection to order. Thank you. Can you explain why you had these financial statements and what you used them for? So these financial statements were used by me uh, for two purposes. One, 
was discussing with media, whether it was Forbes or other magazines, um, to demonstrate Mr. Trump's significant net worth. That was one function. Another was when we were dealing later on with insurance companies, we would provide them with these copies um, so that they would understand that the premium, which is based sometimes upon uh, the individual's capabilities to pay, um, would be reduced. And all of this was done at the president's direction and with his knowledge? Yes, because whatever the numbers would come back to be, we would immediately report it back. And did this information provided to us inflate the president's assets? I believe these numbers are inflated. And of course, inviting, inflating assets to win a newspaper poll to boost your ego is not a crime. But to your knowledge, did the president ever provide inflated assets to a bank in order to help him ob obtain a loan? But you may answer that question. These documents and others were provided to Deutsche Bank uh, on one occasion where I was with them in our attempt to <coughs> obtain money so that we can put a bid on the Buffalo Bills. Thank you for your answer. Mr. Heiser, Georgia. I'd like to yield a second to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I want to ask unanimous consent to put into the record an article from STAT which indicates that Mr. Cohen's uh, promise to access not just Trump, but also the circle around him. It was almost as if we were hiring a lobbyist, close quote. I ask unanimous consent. Without, without objection. I ask unanimous consent that we put into the record a criminal referral for violating Section 22 USC uh, of the uh, statute uh, number 6. 611, I ask unanimous consent that my letter referring uh, Mr. Cohen for violating FARA uh, for illegal lobbying activity be entered into the record. Without objection, so I ask unanimous consent that the first order of business uh, for this committee is for us to look in a bipartisan way at criminal referrals at the next business meeting. These are not documents. They're objections. They're objections. So, so we're objecting to a unanimous consent request? Is that what, Mr. Chairman? Heist. I'm, I'll take care of Heist, don't worry. Uh, I, yes. I will yield, yield back. All right. Now, let, let, me, let me be clear. Uh, Mr. Heist, I'm going to give you your whole five minutes, all right? All right. Thank you, Mr. And Chairman. And to you, all right? Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Mr. Meadows, uh, I, the Chairman made me a, uh, the ranking member made me aware that I had given a little more time to Ms. Washman Schultz. Uh, I was going to let you do that anyway. Uh, but, but I just want the committee to know that because there are so many members, I'm going to be strict on this five minutes, all right? All right, thank you very much. Mr. Heist, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, you claim that you've lied, but you're not a liar. Just to set the record straight, if you lied, you are a liar by definition. You also said a moment ago that the facts are inaccurate. If they are facts, they are accurate, and that would make you inaccurate. But I'd like to take a moment to, uh, I'd like to know who you consulted with to prepare for today's hearing, Lanny Davis, and who else? I consulted with my counsel, Lanny Davis, as well as Michael Monaco. All right. Uh, did uh, you or Michael or Lanny Davis or anyone else cooperate with the Democratic majority to prepare for this hearing? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, please. Did anyone, did you or anyone else on your team cooperate with the Democrat Party in preparing for this hearing? Uh, we've, we've spoken to the party. Okay, did you prepare with Chairman Cummings or anyone on your team? Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean by prepare? Prepare for this hearing. Prepare, I prepared with my counsel. Did I you prepare with, with, with any, the Democrat majority or Chairman Cummings? We spoke with Chairman Cummings and the party. With uh, Chairman uh, Schiff, spoke with Chairman Schiff and his part and uh, his people as well. Were there any other individuals uh, acting as a liaise uh, for you with the majority party? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, what are you saying? 
did you have a liaison other than these that you've mentioned who were working with the majority uh, to prepare for this hearing? Liaison. We spoke with the various individuals that you just raised, yes. Uh, Tom Steyer, um, regarding him or any of his representatives, uh, anyone associated with him, is, are the, is he or any of them paying Lanny Davis to represent you? Not that I'm aware of. Who is paying Lanny Davis? At the present moment, no one. Uh, so he's doing all this work for nothing? Yes, sir. Okay. And I hope so. Um, I kind of doubt it. But uh, how did Lanny Davis come to represent you? Did he approach you or did you approach him? I reached out to Lanny Davis at the recommendation of my former counsel over at um, McDermott, Will, and Emery who knew Mr. Davis and Mr. So Davis. you reached out to Mr. Davis? No, I did, yes, initially. Okay, uh, so did, did you want to testify before Congress or did he urge you to testify here? I was asked to come here and I am here, sir, voluntarily because it's my You were decision. asked by who? My question, did, did he ask you to come here? No, sir. Okay, uh, because he, he, he says that he did ask you to come here and that he convinced you, and also that he uh, did the same with uh, Chairman Cummings as well. So your, your testimony here is that you approached Lanny Davis uh, to represent you and to come here. He did not persuade you to come here. He did not persuade me. Actually, Chairman Cummings which is part of the conversations that we engaged in with his people, as well as Chairman Schiff and others. They, they, we spoke in order to ask me to come here voluntarily. I find the connecting of the dots here with, with Mr. Davis uh, and you, and frankly the chairman and perhaps others to be rather stunning that there is a, an agenda for all this uh, happening here today. And, uh, uh, I believe, frankly, that that's to bring uh, the president down, to impugn the president. Uh, you made an oath last time you were here, and that oath meant nothing to you then. Uh, we had an oath here in this very room about a month ago, and it was, quote, be clear that I will seek the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, end quote. That sounds like an oath to me. The chairman made that statement in this very room last month, but here we are today, our first big hearing with, as you and we all know, a convicted liar lying to Congress, a criminal, and I, I believe this witness is totally incompatible in, uh, with the stated goal of having to seek the truth in this hearing. This is the first time in the history of Congress we have someone testifying here who has already been convicted of lying to Congress. So congratulations for being the first in Congress to do that, and Mr. Thank Cummings you. as well. I can't believe we're coming, we have brought this committee to its knees in terms of losing its credibility. And it's a shameful mockery of what our purpose is. I yield back. Chairman Simon, the expired Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me just pick up on those last comments. You want to talk about a low point. How about Mr. Papadopoulos pled guilty, Mr. Manafort convicted, pled guilty to two other charges, Mr. Gates pled guilty, Mr. Flynn pled guilty, Mr. Pinedo pled guilty, Mr. Van der Zwan pled guilty, Mr. Kalimnik uh, indicted for obstruction of justice. And for two years, you want to talk about an agenda, my friends on the other side of the aisle refused to bring any of these people up before the committee. So today, for the first day, we have one witness who voluntarily is coming forward to testify. Your side ran away from the truth, and we're trying to bring it to the American people. So, Mr. Cohen, Sir. first of all, thank you for voluntarily coming before the committee to testify. I want to ask you about uh, your statements regarding Trump Tower in Moscow, and I want to drill down some of the facts and details. Now, you may not be aware of it, but uh, this goes back a ways. Back in 1987, Mr. Trump uh, wrote that he had had ongoing discussions with uh, Soviet officials back then uh, to build a luxury, uh, ho large luxury hotel across from the Kremlin. 
uh, in partnership with the Soviet Union. So uh, at that time, it was the Soviet Union. I want to ask you, uh, in your filing with the special counsel Mueller's office, uh, the prosecutors wrote, and I quote, Mr. Cohen discussed the status of pro and progress of the Moscow project with individual one on more than the three occasions Mr. Cohen claimed to the committee. And he briefed family members of individual one with the company about the project. Uh, I know this is redundant, but Mr. Cohen, uh, who are we referring to here when we refer to individual one? Donald J. Trump. Okay, and the company? The Trump Organization. Okay. Uh, through, a who, through a subsidiary. Okay. Uh, and who were the family members that you briefed on the Trump Tower Moscow project? Don Trump Jr. and Ivanka Trump. Okay. Now, were these in the regular course of business, or, or did the president or family request the briefings? This is in the regular course of business. Do you recall, uh, there's a question on the number of briefings. Do you recall how many there might have been? I'm sorry, sir? Do you recall how many of these briefings there might have been? It's approximately 10. Okay. In total. All right. In your written remarks, you also wrote, and I quote, there were at least a half dozen times between the Iowa caucus in January 2016 and the end of June when Mr. Trump would ask me, how's it going in Russia, referring to the Russia uh, Moscow Tower project. Now, how did the president communicate those questions to you? Was it verbally or over the phone? Verbally, most of the time, uh, or virtually all of the time, it would... So he would say to me, Michael, come walk with me. He was heading to, let's say, a rally to a car, and as I would walk him to the elevator, he would ask me questions quickly regarding a series of Could there be any issues. doubt about what he was referring to in terms of the project in Russia? No, this would be it. Okay. Uh, Otherwise, there would have been no reason to ask it of me. Right, right. Uh, you also wrote, and I quote, uh, to be clear, Mr. Trump knew of and directed the Trump Moscow negotiations throughout the campaign and lied about it, close quote. Uh, how, did, how did the president actually direct the negotiations? After what, each, what details did he direct? Well, after each communication that I had, I would report back to him. And our goal was to get this project. We were interested in building what would have been the largest building in all of Europe. You know, sir, I, I, just if I can say one last Please, thing go in ahead. regard to uh, the gentleman's statement, since this is on topic. Um, the lies that I told to Congress, in fairness, benefited Mr. Trump. It was in furtherance of my protection of Mr. Trump, which I stated in my testimony. And I am not protecting Mr. Trump anymore. And so, while I truly appreciate taking some of your time onto it, to attack me every single time about taxes, I have no credibility. It's for exactly that reason that I spent the last week searching boxes in order to find the information that I did so that you don't have to take my word for it. I don't want you to. I want you to look at the documents Cohen, and I want I you to make your own decision. I need my last time. Sorry, sir. That's okay. Uh, let, me, let me just say, I don't think my, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are afraid that you're going to lie. I think they're afraid you're going to tell the truth. Thank you, sir. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Gosar. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Oh, I, I appreciate the gentleman for yielding. I just want to respond to Mr. Lynch. I want you to think about this. When have you ever seen a federal agency where this has happened? James Comey, director, fired. Andy McCabe, deputy director, fired, lied three times under oath, under investigation, right, as we speak. Jim Baker, FBI counsel, demoted, then left, currently under investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Connecticut. Lisa Page, demoted, then left. Peter Strzok, deputy head of counterintelligence, demoted, then fired. That's what happened. That's what we're concerned about. And today, we actually asked for Rod Rosenstein. Oh, by the way, we now know three people have told us Rod Rosenstein actually was contemplating using the 25th Amendment to remove the guy from presidency who the American people put there. And we asked for him to be a witness today, and the chairman said no. And instead, we get 30 minutes from a guy who's going to prison, going to prison in two months for lying to Congress. Mr. Cohen, I got two quick questions before I yield back to my colleague. He, 
Mr. Heiss asked you who all you've talked to. You said you've talked to, you spoke to Mr. Schiff, obviously you spoke to Mr. Cummings. You've been, you're going in front of both committees. You're here today, you're going to be in front of Mr. Schiff's committee tomorrow. Have you spoken to Chairman Nadler or anyone on his staff, or have any of your attorneys spoken to Chairman Nadler? I don't know about my attorneys. I have not spoken to um, You don't know if your attorneys have spoken? I have not spoken to Congressman Nadler. You and I'm not aware, sir, I'm not aware if my attorneys, I can ask them. Can turn around and ask you. The answer, sir, is no. Okay. And you said at this present time, Mr. Davis is not getting paid. Does that are you anticipating him receiving some kind of compensation in the future? When I start to earn a living. Oh, he's going to wait three years? Yeah. Wow. The answer, the answer is yes. That's a first. I've never known a lawyer to wait three years to get paid. I guess he thinks it's important. All right. With that, I yield to the gentleman from Arizona. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Cohen, you know, you're a disgraced lawyer. I mean, you, you, you've been disbarred. And so um, I'm sure you remember, well, maybe you don't remember, duty of loyalty, duty of confidentiality, attorney-client privilege. I think the gentleman over your right side actually understands that very, very well and wouldn't do what you are doing here today. So let's go back at this credibility. You want us to make sure that we think of you as a real philanthropic icon, that you're about justice, that that you're the person that somebody would call at 3 o'clock in the morning. No, they wouldn't. Not at all. You saw Mr. Comer uh, dissect you. Right in front of this committee, you con conflicted your testimony, sir. You're a patholog pathological liar. You don't know truth from, from, tr from falsehood. Uh, sir, it's I'm sorry. Now. Are you, you, know, are you referring to me or the president? Hey, this is my time. <laughs> are you referring I'll, to I me, sir, or the president? When I ask you a question, yes. I'll ask for an answer. Sure. Now, are you familiar with Rule 35 of the Federal Rules and Criminal Proce Procedures? I am now. Oh. Hmm. So the committee understands that you've been in contact with the Southern District of New York. Is that true? I am in constant contact with the Southern District of New York regarding ongoing investigations. And part of that application is to reduce sentencing time, is it not? Yes. There is a possibility. Yes. It, the answer is yes. No, it's not, sir. Yes, it is. Okay. It it's is. not. And so testimony here could actually help you out in getting your sentence lessened. Isn't that true? I'm not really sure how my appearance here today is providing substantial information that the Southern District can use for the creation of a case. Now, if there is something that this group can do for me, I would gladly welcome it. Well, I, 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 I got to tell you. You know, America's watching you. I've been getting texts right and left saying, how can anybody listen to this pathological person? He's got a problem. He doesn't th know fact from fiction. And that's what's sad here, is, is that you didn't do this for Donald Trump, to protect Donald Trump. You did it for you. This is all, no, this is all about you. This is all about this Twitter feed and, and, and you know, let me read one of those, another one. Women who love and support Michael Cohen, strong, pit bull, sex symbol. Non, no nonsense, business oriented and ready to make a difference. 1,000 followers. A, a, a ready to make a difference against the law. That's pretty sad. You know, uh, it, it, over and over again, you know, we want to have trust. It's built on the premise that we're truthful, that we come forward. But there's no truth with you whatsoever. That's why that's important to you to look up here and, and look at the old adage that our moms taught us liar, liar, pants on fire. Hmm. No one should ever listen to you and give you credibility. It's sad. It's sad that we have come. In fact, I want to quote the chairman's very words. This is a real, hold on. Gentleman's time has expired. Sad state. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cover. Mr. Cohen, several times in your testimony, you state the bad things that you did for Mr. Trump. And at some point, um, you apparently changed your course of action. There's a recurring refrain in your testimony that says, and yet I continued to work for him. But at some point, you changed. What was the breaking point at which you decided to start telling the truth? There are several factors. Helsinki, Charlottesville, watching the daily destruction of our civility to one another, putting up silly things like this, oh, that's silly. really unbecoming of Congress, 
It's that sort of behavior that I'm responsible for. I'm responsible for your silliness because I did the same thing that you're doing now for 10 years. I protected Mr. Trump for 10 years. And the fact that you pull up a news article that has no value to it, and you want to use that as the premise for discrediting me, that I'm not the person that people called at 3 o'clock in the morning, would make you inaccurate. In actuality, it would make you a liar, which puts you into the same position that I am in. And I can only warn people, the more people that follow Mr. Trump, as I did blindly, are going to suffer the same consequences that I'm suffering. What warning would you give young people who are tempted, as you were, would you encourage them not to wait 10 years to see the light? What advice would you give young people, in particular young lawyers, so they do not abuse their bar license as you did? Look at what's happened to me. I had a wonderful life. I have a beautiful wife. I have two amazing children. I achieved financial success by the age of 39. I didn't go to work for Mr. Trump because I had to. I went to work for him because I wanted to. And I've lost it all. So if I'm not a picture perfect, that's the picture that should be up there. If I'm not a picture perfect example of what not to do, that's the example that I'm trying to set for my children. You make mistakes in life, and I've owned them, and I've taken responsibility for them. And I'm paying a huge price, as is my family. So if that in and of itself isn't enough to dissuade somebody from acting in the callous manner that I did, I'm not sure that that person has any, um, any chance, very much like I'm in right now. A recurring theme in your testimony is concern for your family's safety. What specifically are you most concerned about? Well, the president, unlike my Cohen for Trump that has 1,000 followers, he's got over 60 million people. And when Mr. Trump turned around early in the campaign and said, I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. I want to be very clear. He's not joking. He's telling you the truth. He said, you don't know him. I do. I sat next to this man for 10 years, and I watched his back. I'm the one who started the campaign, and I'm the one who continued in 2015 to promote him. And I, so many things I thought that he can do that are just great. And he can, and he is doing things that are great. But this destruction of our civility to one another is just, it's out of control. And when he goes on Twitter and he starts bringing in my in-laws, my parents, my wife, what does he think is going to happen? He's causing, he, he's sending out the same message that he can do whatever he wants. This is his country. He's becoming an autocrat. And hopefully something bad will happen to me on my children, on my wife, so that I will not be here and testify. That's what his hope was. It was to intimidate me. And again, I thanked everybody who joined and said that this is just not right. Have you ever seen Mr. Trump personally threaten people with physical harm? No. He would use others. He would hire other people to do that? I'm not so sure that he had to hire them. They were already working there. <laughs> Everybody's job at the Trump Organization is to protect Mr. Trump. Every day, most of us knew we were coming in and we were going to lie for him on something. And that became the norm. And that's exactly what's happening right now in, in this country. And it's exactly what's happening here in government, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. Mr. Armstrong. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Can, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, can, can we take a break? All right. Uh, I did, sir. <laughs> so it. That's okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you.
the House Oversight and Reform Committee hearing with President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, got underway this morning just after 10 o'clock. So they've been at it a little over two hours, and Mr. Cohen requested a uh, short break. We're not sure how long it will last, but obviously with the chairman in the room and other members, it should uh, should resume shortly. Our coverage on the C-SPAN networks includes our re-air tonight of all of today's hearing. We also have the cameras outside of the um, hearing room itself and possibly from members both during breaks and after the hearing this afternoon. We'll be here for all of it live here on C-SPAN 3. Chairman Cummings of the House Oversight and Reform Committee, we understand from reports that it will be a 10-minute break or so, but sometimes these hearings, these breaks have a tendency to go a little bit longer. It is expected to last for a total of four hours or so. And again, a reminder, we'll rear all of it in its entirety tonight, 8 o'clock Eastern on C-SPAN. You'll be f- able to find all of it live at uh, cspan.org. While we're waiting, though, for the hearing to resume, we'll show you, as much as we can, the opening testimony of Michael Cohen, which lasted 30 minutes. If you would please rise, and I will begin to swear you in. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative, and thank you, and you may be seated. The microphones are sensitive, so please speak directly into them. Without objection, your written statement will be made a part of the record. And with that, Mr. Cohen, you are now recognized to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Is your mic on? Yes. Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I have asked this committee to ensure that my family be protected from presidential threats and that the committee be sensitive to the questions pertaining to ongoing investigations. I thank you for your help and for your understanding. I am here under oath to correct the record, to answer the committee's questions truthfully, and to offer the American people 
what I know about President Trump. I recognize that some of you may doubt and attack me on my credibility. It is for this reason that I have incorporated into this opening statement documents that are irrefutable and demonstrate that the information you will hear is accurate and truthful. Never in a million years did I imagine when I accepted a job in 2007 to work for Donald Trump that he would one day run for the presidency to launch a campaign on a platform of hate and intolerance and actively win. I regret the day I said yes to Mr. Trump. I regret all the help and support I gave him along the way. I am ashamed of my own failings and publicly accepted responsibility for them by pleading guilty in the Southern District of New York. I am ashamed of my weakness and my misplaced loyalty of the things I did for Mr. Trump in an effort to protect and promote him. I am ashamed that I chose to take part in concealing Mr. Trump's illicit acts rather than listening to my own conscience. I am ashamed because I know what Mr. Trump is. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. He was a presidential candidate who knew that Roger Stone was talking with Julian Assange about a WikiLeaks drop on the Democratic National Committee emails. And I will explain each in a few moments. I am providing the committee today with several documents, and these include a copy of a check Mr. Trump wrote from his personal bank account after he became president to reimburse me for the hush money payments I made to cover up his affair with an adult film star and to prevent damage to his campaign. Copies of financial statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013 that he gave to such institutions such as Deutsche Bank. A copy of an article with Mr. Trump's handwriting on it that reported on the auction of a portrait of himself that he arranged for the bidder ahead of time and then reimbursed the bidder from the account of his nonprofit charitable foundation with the picture now hanging in one of his country clubs. And copies of letters I wrote at Mr. Trump's direction that threatened his high school, colleges, and the college board not to release his grades or SAT scores. I hope my appearance here today, my guilty plea, and my work with law enforcement agencies are steps along a path of redemption that will restore faith in me and help this country understand our president better. And before going further, I want to apologize to each member to use Congress as a whole. The last time I appeared before Congress, I came to protect Mr. Trump. Today, I am here to tell the truth about Mr. Trump. I lied to Congress when Mr. Trump stopped negotiating the Moscow Tower project in Russia. I stated that we stopped negotiating in January of 2016. That was false. Our negotiations continued for months later during the campaign. Mr. Trump did not directly tell me to lie to Congress. That's not how he operates. In conversations we had during the campaign, at the same time I was actively negotiating in Russia for him, he would look me in the eye and tell me there's no Russian business and then go on to lie to the American people by saying the same thing. In his way, he was telling me to lie. There were at least a half a dozen times between the Iowa caucus in January of 2016 and the end of June when he would ask me, how's it going in Russia, referring to the Moscow Tower project. 
You need to know. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, you have admitted to lying on your taxes. According to federal prosecutors in the Southern District of New York, you also lied to banks to get loans. The prosecutors wrote, quote, to secure loans, Cohen falsely understated the amount of debt he was carrying and omitted information for his personal financial statements to induce a bank to lend based on incomplete information, end quote. Is that correct? That's correct. You lied on financial documents. So you lied to financial institutions in order to secure loans. So we've established that you lie on your taxes, you lie to banks, and you have been convicted of lying to Congress. It seems to me that there's not much that you won't lie about when you stand to gain from it. In fact, the prosecutors for the Southern District of New York noted that each of your crimes, quote, bear common sense of characteristics which each involving deception and being motivated by your personal greed and ambition. Is your appearance here today motivated by your desire to remain in the spotlight for your personal benefit? No, ma'am. You have sought out ways to rehabilitate your image from tax evader, bank swindler, and all-around liar to an honorable, truthful man by appearing before cable news. I'm concerned you could be using your story and this congressional platform for your personal benefit such as a desire to make money from book deals. So can you commit under oath that you have not and will not pursue a book or movie deal based on your experiences working for the president? No. You cannot commit to making I, money off of a book or movie deal based on your work? No. No. What I just, what, there's two parts to your question. The first part of your question, you asked me whether or not I had spoken to people regarding a possible book deal. And I have. And I've spoken to people who have sought me out regarding a movie deal. No, I didn't ask you if you'd that spoken was the to first anybody. Part of your I said, can you commit under oath that you will not, that you have not and will not pursue a book deal? And I would not do that, no. Okay. Can you commit under oath that you will not pursue opportunities to provide commentary for a major news network based on your experiences working for the president? No. Can you commit under oath that you will not pursue political office in the state of New York? No. So you don't commit to uh, changing your ways, basically, because you want to continue to use your background as a liar, a cheater, a convicted liar, to make money. That's what you want to do. And that's going to get me a book deal and a movie deal and television and, and, a, and a spot on television? I, I don't think so. Well, it appears that it will. I yield my time, remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Thank Jordan. The, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Mr. S uh, Cohen, in your sentencing statement to the court in, de in December of last year, you said, I want to apologize to the people of the United States. You deserve to know the truth. Approximately a month later, BuzzFeed News ran a story that was the story in the country for a couple days. BuzzFeed story ran January 17th, 2019. On January 18th, your counsel went on TV and wouldn't confirm or deny the story. The next day, the special counsel's office did something that's never happened, never happened. They said the description of specific statements to the special counsel's office and the characterization of documents and testimony obtained by this office regarding Michael Cohen's congressional testimony are not accurate. Why didn't your lawyer, the day that he's on TV, when this story is the biggest thing in the news in the country, why didn't he deny the BuzzFeed story? Because I didn't think it was his responsibility to do that. We are not the fact checkers for BuzzFeed. He's on the... TV to talk about the very story you committed to the Sir. court when you were trying to get your sentence reduced, that, you, that the American people deserve to know the truth. You had the golden opportunity to give them the truth on a false story, the BuzzFeed story, and your lawyer didn't say a thing. He actually, actually, he said this, I can't confirm, I can't deny. You had an opportunity to do exactly what you told the judge you were going to do one month after you said it, and you didn't do it. Why not? Again, it wasn't our responsibility to be the fact checker for the news agencies. This is the there, biggest uh, story sir, in the country. sir. Please let me. 
The president says so far approximately well, 9,000. I, I got eight seconds. Asked, I got eight seconds. I'll let you finish. Cha Chairman, may I please finish? The special finish. counsel Chairman, can said I please finish? something they've never done. They said that Sir. story was false. Now okay. you can respond. Okay. My response. The president has told something over 9,000 lies to date. Do I ask Mr. Davis or Mr. Monaco, or do I go on television in order to correct his mistakes? When Mr. The Davis answer, goes on sir, to talk the answer about is that no. specific subject, the you answer should. is no. And I, I, I would like the to gentleman's time has Listen up. The gentleman's time has expired. You may finish answering the question, and then we're going to go to Mr. Connolly. All I wanted to say is I just find it interesting, sir, that between yourself and your colleagues, that not one question so far since I'm here has been asked about President Trump. That's actually why I thought I was coming today. Not to, not to confess the mistakes that I've made. I've already done that. And I'll do it again every time you ask me about taxes or mistakes. Yes, I made my mistakes. I'll say it now again. And I'm going to pay the ultimate price. But I'm not here today, and the American people don't care about my taxes. They want to know what it is that I know about Mr. Trump. And not one question so far has been asked about Mr. Trump. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, Mr. Cohen, based on your testimony and your tenure experience, um, I think you can recognize the behavior you're being subjected to on the other side of the aisle. Discredit, slander, uh, use any trick in the book to prevent your testimony from sticking. The idea that a witness would come to us who's flawed, and you certainly are flawed, means they can never tell the truth, and there is no validity whatsoever to a single word they say, would discredit every single cr uh, criminal trial of organized crime in the history of the United States, because all of them depend on someone who's turned. It would make RICO null and void. We couldn't use it anymore. This Congress historically has relied on all kinds of shady figures who turn. One of the most famous who led to the decapitation of the organized crime families in America, Joe Valachi, congressional hearing. He was a witness. And he committed a lot worse crimes than you're convicted of, Mr. Cohen. So don't be fooled by what my friends on the other side of the aisle are trying to do today. It is do everything but focus on the principle, known as individual number one in the Southern District of New York, as I recall. Is that correct, Mr. Cohen? That is correct. Now, Mr. Cohen, I want to ask you about something that's not in your testimony and that so far has not been made public. In our committee staff search of documents provided by the White House that were otherwise redacted or already in the public, and I guess the White House thought that was funny, they made one mistake, the White House. There was an email from a special assistant to the president to a deputy White House counsel, and the email is dated May 16, 2017, and it says, and I quote, POTUS, meaning the president, requested a meeting on Thursday with Michael Cohen and Jay Sekulow. Any idea what this might be about, end quote. Do you recall being asked to come to the White House on or around that time with Mr. Sekulow? May of 2017. Off the top of my head, sir, I don't. Um, I recall being in the White House with Jay Sekulow, and it was in regard to the, um, the documents the document production as well as my appearance before the House Select Intel. Um, but I'm not sure if that's specifically well, that, you're that, that, But what I will do is I will check uh, all my records, and I'm more than happy to provide you with any documentation uh, or um, a response to this question. Well, that, that's you sort of touch on the, presumably the purpose of the discussion, at least among others. This occurred, this meeting uh, occurred, just before your testimony before the Select Committee on Intelligence here in the House. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Was that a topic of conversation with the President himself? If this is the specific instance that I was there with Mr. Sekulow, yes. So you had a conversation with the President of the United States about your impending testimony before the House 
Intelligence Committee. Is that correct? That's correct. What was the nature of that conversation? He wanted me to cooperate. He also wanted just to ensure by making the statement, and I said it in my testimony, there is no Russia, there is no collusion, um, there is no, um, there is no uh, deal. He goes, it's all a witch hunt, and it's, he goes, this, this stuff has to end. Did you take those comments to be suggestive of what might flavor your testimony? Sir, he's been saying that to me for many, many months. And at the end of the day, I knew exactly what he wanted me to say. And why was Mr. Sekolo in the meeting? Because he was going to be representing Mr. Trump um, going forward as one of his personal attorneys in this matter. So it was sort of a handoff meeting? Correct. Um, in any way, final question, did the President in any way, from your point of view, coach you in terms of how to respond to questions or the content of your testimony before a House committee? Again, it's, it's a difficult answer because he doesn't tell you what he wants. What he does is, again, Michael, there's no Russia, there's no collusion, there's no involvement, there's no interference. I know what he means because I've been around him for so long. So if you're asking me whether or not that's the message that's staying on point, that's the party line that he created that so many others are now touting. Yes, that's the message that he wanted to reinforce. The gentleman's time has expired, Thank you. Mr. Massey. Mr. Cohn, can you just clarify, did you say that at times you would do what you thought Mr. Trump wanted you to do, not specifically what he told you to do? At times, yes. So you just went on your intuition? I don't know if I would call it intuition as much as I would just say, my knowledge of what he wanted, because it happened before, and does, I knew what he had wanted. Does a, does a lawyer have a duty to provide his client with good legal advice? Yes. Were you a good lawyer to Mr. Trump? I believe so. When you uh, arranged a payment to Ms. Clifford, you say in your testimony, I'm going to quote from your testimony, that you did so, quote, without bothering to consider whether that was improper much less whether it was the right thing to do. You said that, unquote, that's your testimony today. You said you didn't even consider whether it was legal. How could you give your client legal advice when you're not even considering whether it's legal? I did what I knew Mr. Trump wanted. This conversation with Mr. Trump I didn't started. Ask, I didn't ask whether you're a good fixer. I asked whether you were a good lawyer. Sometimes you have to melt both together. I needed to, at that time, ensure and protect Mr. Trump. So, and if I put my, so, which I'm clearly, clearly suffering the penalty of, I clearly you said, or let me, you erred said on the, on the side Trump. of wrong. So you feel like, by, without bothering to consider whether it was proper, much less whether it was the right thing to do, by ignoring any conscience, if you have one, mm. that you were protecting Mr. Trump. I'm sorry, sir, I don't you feel, understand You your feel question. that was how to protect, as his lawyer, you feel that you did a good job. You said you were a good lawyer, right? That's Is that correct. being a good lawyer? To not even consider whether it's legal or not? For I didn't client? work for the campaign. I was working and I was trying to I protect Mr. Trump. About a campaign. I, I sat Trump. with Mr. Trump, and this goes back all the way to 2011. This wasn't the first scenario with Ms. Daniels. Let's go back then. So what, my, point, my point is this, is this was an ongoing situation. Okay. It didn't just start in October. Right. Let's, Sorry, I please, but go you back. have to let me finish. Well, this, it, this, started in, it didn't start in October. Let me, let me it ask started you many years earlier. When were you disbarred? Yesterday, from what I read in the paper. Yesterday. When should you have been disbarred based on the legal counsel you were giving your client? I, I don't have an answer for your question. How long sir. were you uh, counsel for Mr. Trump? Since 2007. When is the first time you gave him bad legal advice or failed to inform him of his legal obligations? As you, as you testified today, you did in the case of the payment to Ms. Clifford. When was the first time you did that? Would that qualify for disbarment? 
I don't, I don't know, sir. I'm not the bar association. I think you uh, should consult with them maybe occasionally on some of these things. Is well, anybody, there's no point now. I lost my law license. Is anybody, uh, has anybody else promised to pay Mr. Davis for representing you? No. Nobody has? No. Are you offering? <laughs> Question, quickly. Uh, July, you said, and this is also in your testimony, in the days before the Democratic Convention, you became privy to a conversation that some of Hillary Clinton's emails would be leaked. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Was that in, you said, late July? Do you know the exact day? Uh, I believe it was either the 18th or the 19th, and I would but, guess that it would be on the 19th. But it was definitely July. I believe so, yes. Do you know that was public knowledge in June? This was Mr. Assange, and I'd like to submit this unanimous consent to submit this for the record. Without objection, so. Mr. Assange reported to the media on June 12th that those emails would be leaked. So I'm not saying you have fake news, I'm saying you have old news, and um, there's really not much to that. I would like to uh, yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Higgins. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cohen, you, you, you know, I'm quoting you close, I can earlier said, I spent last week looking through boxes to find documents that would support your accusation. Where are those boxes, good sir? Are they, where are those boxes? Are they in your garage? or They're in the storage. And are, are these not boxes that should have been turned over to investigative authorities during the many criminal investigations you've been subject to? Sir, these are the boxes that were returned to me if they, the if they include data pertinent to crimes that you've committed, should they not have been turned over and remanded to investigative authority? Did Mr. Lanny Davis know of these boxes? No, the gentleman's I don't time understand is expired. You may answer the question. I don't understand his question, sir. Very well. Mr. Christian Morsi. Mr. Cohen. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Cummings, for convening this hearing, and thank you, Mr. Cohen, for voluntarily testifying this morning. Mr. Cohen, you were the executive vice president and special counsel for the Trump Organization, correct? I was the executive vice president and special counsel to Donald J. Trump. And special counsel means you were the attorney for him, is that right? It just means I was there in order to handle matters that he felt were significant and important to him individually. And those included legal matters? Yes, sir. Sir, as a former attorney, you're familiar with legal documents known as non-disclosure agreements or NDAs, is that right? Yes. Sir, I'm sure you know that NDAs properly written in scope can be reasonable in certain business contexts, but they can also be abused to create a chilling effect to silence people, as we've seen in the Me Too movement and, and other places. Isn't that right, Mr. Cohen? Yes. And Mr. Cohen, the Trump Organization used NDAs extensively, isn't that right? That's correct. Mr. Cohen, I'm reading from a recent Washington Post article regarding the language in one of these types of NDAs where the terms were described as very broad. For instance, the terms confidential information was defined to be anything that, quote, Mr. Trump insists remain private or confidential, including but not limited to any information with respect to the personal life, political affairs, and or business affairs of Mr. Trump or any family member, close quote. Do those terms sound familiar to you? I've seen that document. In fact, there's a class action lawsuit filed this month by former Trump campaign worker Jessica Denson that this NDA language is illegal because it is too broad, too vague, and would be used to retaliate against employees who complain of illegality or wrongdoing. Would you agree that in the use of, the NDs, of these types of NDAs with this type of language, and later when Donald Trump sought to enforce them, that he intended to prevent people from coming forward with claims of wrongdoing? Yes. Would you agree that the effect of the use of these NDAs and their enforcement was to have a chilling effect on people or silence them from coming forward? I apologize. I, if you wanted to find chilling, I'm not sure. Oh, just uh, that he would, in using these NDAs or trying to enforce them, would basically try to keep people silent. That was the goal. And nothing at the Trump Organization was ever done unless it was run through President Donald Trump, correct? That's 100% certain. Okay. Mr. Cohen, D 
do you believe that there are people out there today, either from the president's business or personal life, who are not coming forward to tell their stories of wrongdoing because of the president's use of NDAs against them? I, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Sir, I have a couple other questions for you. When was the last communication with President Trump or someone acting on his behalf? I don't have the specific date, but it was a while ago. Okay. Do you, do you have a general time frame? I would suspect it was um, within two months post the raid of my, um, my home okay, so hotel. Okay, so early fall of last year, generally? Generally. And what did he or his uh, agent communicate to you? Un unfortunately, this topic is actually something that's being investigated right now by the Southern District of New York, and I've been asked by them um, not to discuss and not to talk about these issues. Fair enough. Is there any other wrongdoing or illegal act that you are aware of regarding Donald Trump that we haven't yet discussed today? Yes, and again, those are part of the investigation that's currently being looked at by the Southern District of New York. Sir, uh, Congressman Cooper asked you about uh, whether you were, you were aware of any physical violence committed by President Trump. I just have a couple quick questions. Do you have any knowledge of President Trump abusing any controlled substances? I'm not aware of that, no. Do you have any uh, knowledge of President Trump being delinquent on any alimony or child care payments? I'm not aware of any of that. Do you have any knowledge of President Trump arranging any health care pr procedures for any women not in his family? I'm not aware of that, no. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Cloud. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Cohen, can you tell me the significance of May 6th? After May 6th? In terms 6th, of, sir? A couple months from now. That's the day that I need to surrender yes, sir, to federal prison. Uh, could you, for the record, state uh, what you've been convicted of? I've been convicted on five counts of tax evasion. There's one count of misrepresentation of documents to a bank. There's two counts, one dealing um, with campaign finance for Karen McDougal, one count of campaign finance violation for Stormy Daniels, as well as lying to Congress. Thank you. Uh, can you state what your official title with the campaign was? I did not have a campaign title. And your position in the Trump administration? I did not have one. Okay, in today's testimony, you said that you were not looking to work in the White House. Uh, the Southern District of New York, in their statement, their sentencing memo, says this, Cohen's criminal violations in the federal election laws were also stirred, like others, crimes by his own ambition and greed. Cohen privately told friends, colleagues, and including seized text messages that he expected to be given a prominent role in the new administration. When that did not materialize, Cohen found a way to monetize his relationship in excess with the president. So uh, were they lying or were you lying today? I'm not saying it's a lie. I'm just saying it's not accurate. This I did not want to go to the White House. I retained a, and I brought an attorney in and I sat with Mr. Trump with him for well over an hour explaining the importance of having a personal attorney that every president has had one in order to handle matters like the matters I was dealing with, which included, say, like um, Summer Zervos, Stormy Daniels, uh, was dealing with Stephanie Clifford, and other personal matters that needed. Memo. Excuse me, this is my time. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent to submit the sentencing memo from the Southern District of New York, New York for the record. Without objection, so ordered. All right, I'll give that to you in a second. Okay, this memo states that you committed four distinct federal crimes over a period of several years. You were motivated to do so by personal greed and repeatedly used your power to influence for deceptive ends. It goes on to say that uh, you were, that they each involved, they were distinct in their harms, but bear a common set of characteristics that they involved deception and were each motivated by personal greed and ambition. 
Um, there's a lot we don't know in regards to this investigation, but here's what we do know. We know that you were expecting a job at the White House and didn't get it. You made millions lying about your close access to the president. You have a history of lying for personal gain, including that's banks, your, about your accountant, to law enforcement, and your family, the Congress, the American people. The Southern District of New York, New York, you said that you did all this out of blind loyalty to Mr. Trump, but your sentencing memo set, states this. This was not an act out of blind loyalty, as Cohen suggests. Cohen was driven by a desire to further ingratiate himself with a potential future president for whom's political sec success Cohen himself claimed credit for. Now, we're in a search for truth, and I don't know, Chairman, how we're supposed to ascertain the truth in this quagmire of a hearing when the best witness we can bring before this has already been convicted of lying before us. And what's sad is the American people have seen this play out before. We have people in prominent positions fail, and then a couple years later they get a book deal. Now, you're set to go to, to jail for a couple years. You come out with a multi-million book deal. That's, that's not bad living. And uh, so my question is, is will you uh, today Will you today to commit to donate any further proceeds to book deals, to film reviews, to charity? No. Thank you. I yield my well, time. Will the gentleman yield? Now, will the gentleman if, yield? If, now, if you, if, or, may, yield. May, I, may, I fin may I finish? Will the gentleman yield? Yield to Mr. Meadows. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, may, I, may I finish? Mr. Cohen. No says the may, I fin may I finish? My Mr. Cohen, uh, he's yielded to me. And so, I didn't uh, finish, uh, sir, my, my response. Uh, li listen. Everything's been chairman, made. Mr. Chairman, may I finish my response, uh, please? I'll let you respond, but let's answer his question, please. Mr. C Mr. Cohen, everything's been made of your lies in the past. I'm concerned about your lies today. Mm -hmm. under, under your testimony just a few minutes ago, to me, you indicated that you had contracts with foreign entities, and, and yet we have a truth and testimony disclosure form, which requires you to list those foreign contracts for the last two years and you put N.A. on there. And it's a criminal offense to not have that accurately. So when, when were you lying, either in the testimony to me earlier today or when you filled out the form? The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Cohen, you may answer his question and then whatever you wanted to say on that. His, his, his question is, unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer for his question. But as it relates... Well, no, 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 Mr. Chairman. As, as it relates... The gentleman is out of order. I, 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 he said he does not have an answer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when, when we were in the majority, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, hold on. Regular order. The, the gentleman has just said he doesn't have an answer. And you had gone well, on over your time. Well, he's under oath. He's under oath to tell the truth. One of again, them is not accurate, again, Mr. We, Chairman. You will, you will have time to answer Mr. the question. Chairman, just a question, Mr. Chairman, just a question. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Cohen, thank you for your composure today. Our colleagues are not upset because you lied to Congress for the president. They're upset because you stopped lying to Congress for the president. Now, you've described the Trump campaign as a once-in-a-lifetime money-making opportunity, the greatest infomercial of all time, I think you said, and this may be the most trenchant observation of your whole testimony. Do you think the Trump campaign or presidency ever stopped being about making money for the president, his family, and his organization? Yes. When did it stop being that? When he won the election. And it, what did it become about at that point? Then it had to be about figuring out what to do here in Washington. Can you carefully explain to America how the hush money payments to Karen McDougal and Stormy Daniels worked? Can you carefully explain what catch and kill is? Sure. I received a phone call regarding both Karen McDougal as well as Stormy Daniels, obviously at different times, stating that there were issues that were going to be damaging to Mr. Trump. With the Stormy Daniels, it started in 2011 when she wanted to have something removed from a website. And that was the first time I met Keith David. I spoke with Keith Davidson, her then acting attorney. And we were successful in having it taken down from the website. It wasn't until years later, did, right uh, by around the time of the campaign, did they come back and they ask, what, what are you going to do now because she's back on the trail trying to sell the story? 
at which point in time David Pecker, on behalf of the National Enquirer, reached out to her and her attorney in order to go take a look at a um, lie detector test that would prove that she was telling the truth. They then contacted me and told me that she was telling the truth, at which point, uh, again, all the time... She took a lie detector she test. She allegedly took a lie detector test and was seen by an employee of the National Enquirer, at which point in time I went straight into Mr. Trump's office and I explained why this time it's different than another time. Okay, now when you say different than another time, were there other women paid sexual hush money by Donald Trump or his organization? Was this a standard operating practice? No. So you're not aware of any other cases where it had taken place? I'm not aware of any other case that Mr. Trump paid, So, which brings us to the Karen McDougal. He was supposed to pay. He was supposed to pay $125,000 for the life story of Karen McDougal. For whatever the reason may be, he elected not to pay it. David Pecker was very angry because there was also other monies that David had expended on his behalf. Unfortunately, David never got paid back for that either. So David Pecker had done this in other cases of other mistresses or women? Other cir uh, circumstances, yes. Okay. Not all of them had to do with women. Are, are you aware of anything that the president uh, has done at home or abroad that may have subjected him to or may subject him to extortion or blackmail? I am not, no. Okay. Um, are you aware of any videotapes that may be the subject of extortion or blackmail? I've heard about these tapes for a long time. I've had many people contact me over the years. Uh, I have no reason to believe that that tape exists. In December 2015, Donald Trump was asked about his relationship with Felix Sater, a convicted felon and real estate developer, and he replied, Felix Sater, boy, have to even think about it. I'm not that familiar with him. Um, why did Trump endeavor to hide his relationship with Felix Sater, and what was his relationship? Well, he certainly had a relationship. Felix was a partner in a company called Bayrock that was involved in the um, deal of the Trump Soho Hotel, uh, as well as, I believe, the Trump Fort Lauderdale project. Why did he want to distance himself? That's what Mr. Trump does. He distances himself when things go bad for someone. And at that point in time, it was going bad for Mr. Sater. You said you lied to Congress about Trump's negotiations to build uh, his Moscow Tower because he'd made it clear to you that he wanted you to lie. One of the reasons you knew this is because, quote, Mr. Trump's personal lawyers reviewed and edited my statement to Congress about the timing of the Moscow Tower negotiations before I gave it. So this is a pretty breathtaking claim, uh, and I just want to get to the facts here. Um, which specific lawyers reviewed and edited your statement to Congress on the Moscow Tower negotiations, and did they make any changes to your statement? There were changes made, um, additions. Uh, Jay Sekulow, for one. Were there changes about the timing, the question of... Gentlemen's gentleman's time has expired. You may answer that question. There, there were uh, several changes that were made, including um, how we were going to handle that message, Mr. which Rogan. was... Uh, will you finish? Yes, so the, the message, of course, being uh, the length of time that the Trump Tower Moscow project stayed and remained um, alive. That was one of the changes. Yes. Mr. Grothman. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to clear up something, uh, just a little something that bothers me. Uh, you started off your testimony, and you said, I think, in response to some question, that President Trump never expected to win. I just want to clear, clarify that I dealt with several... President Trump several times as he was trying to get Wisconsin. He was always confident. He was working very hard. And this idea that somehow he was just running to raise his profile for some future adventure, at least in my experience, is preposterous. And I, I always I'll find it offensive when anti-Trump people imply that he just did this on a lark and didn't expect to win. But be that as it may, um, my first question concerns uh, your relationship with the court. Um, do you expect, um, I mean, right now I think you're, you're sentenced to three years, correct? That's correct. Do you expect any time uh, using this testimony, other testimony, after you get done doing whatever you're going to do this week, do you ever expect to go back and ask for any sort of reduction in sentence? Yes, there are ongoing investigations currently being conducted that have nothing to do with this committee or Congress that 
I am assisting in, and it is for the benefit of a Rule 35 motion, yes. So you expect, and perhaps what you testify here today will affect going back and reducing this, what we think is a relatively light three year sentence. You, you expect to go back and ask for a further reduction. Based off of my appearance here today? Well, based upon whatever you do between now and, and your request for The report. Rule 35 motion is in the complete hands of the Southern District of New York. And the way the Rule 35 motion works is what you're supposed to do is provide them with information that leads to ongoing investigations. I am currently working with them right now on several other issues of investigation that concerns them that they're looking at. If those investigations become fruitful, then there is a possibility for a Rule 35 motion. And I don't know what the benefit in terms of time would be, but this congressional hearing today is not going to be the basis of a Rule 35 motion. I wish it was, but it's not. I'd like to yield some time to uh, Congressman Jordan. I yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I'm going to come back to the question I asked before with regards to your false statement that you submitted to Congress. On here, it was very clear that it asked for contracts with foreign entities over the last two years. Have you had any foreign contract with foreign entities, whether it's Navaris or the Korean Airline or Kazakhstan BTA Bank? Your testimony earlier said that you had contracts with them. In fact, you it, it went it into talks, detail. Sir, I believe on those it talks contracts. about lobbying. I did no lobbying. On top of in that, your they are not government. In, I'm not asking about lobbying, Mr. Cohen. They I'm are saying, not government do you, agencies. Do you they are have private, do you they are have foreign or publicly contracts? traded companies? Do you have foreign contracts? I currently have no foreign. Did contracts. you have foreign contracts over the last two years? Foreign contracts. Contracts with foreign entities. Did you have yes. contracts? Yes. Yes. Why didn't you put them on the form? It says it's a criminal offense to not put them on this form for the last two years. Why did you not do that? Because those foreign companies that you're referring to are not government companies. It, it says non-governmental, Mr. Cohen. You signed they're talking about, it. They're talking about me as being non-governmental. No, and right, it says foreign agency. It, it says foreign contracts. Do you want us to read it to you? I, I, I read it, and it was reviewed by my counsel. And I am a non-government employee. It was not lobbying, and they are not. This has nothing to do with lobbying. It says it's a criminal offense to not list all your foreign contracts. That's what it says. Well, then I'm going to take a look at it before I leave. No, you've heard. I will, and hopefully I will amend it prior to leaving because that's not the way I read your document. You know, it's just one more example, Mr. Cohen of you skirting the truth. Okay, I want to ask one other sure. question. Sure. One other That's question, Mr. Cohen. It's my time, not yours. Were you advised or was your counsel advised to withhold your written testimony to the latest possible date, as John Dean said last night on CNN? Was it my what? Were you advised or was your counsel advised to withhold your written testimony to this committee at the latest possible date to get it to this committee at the latest possible date as John Dean said that he advised you? We yes will, or no? No. We will he never it. advised you. We will, John Dean? I've he, never spoken with John he, Dean. Has he spoken to your attorney? I, I, I don't know. I've never spoken well, to John Dean. Well, ask your attorney. He's right we there behind you. We were working last night till, till 11, 12 o'clock at You've night known that you've been coming committee. for some time. I, you may answer the question. Answer the question. We were working until 11, 12 o'clock last night to finish everything. So you were writing it last night, Mr. Cohen? We, we were Don't give edits. me that bull. We were making edits all the way through the night. Recognize Mr. Rudolph. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, in November 2013, President Donald Trump testified under oath in a lawsuit related to the failed real estate project, Trump International Hotel and Tower in Fort Lauderdale. During the deposition, President Trump was asked about his knowledge of Felix Sater, a Russian-born real estate developer and convicted member of the Russian Mafia, who, according to press reports, pled guilty for his role in a 40 million stock manipulation scheme. And it's worth noting, as well publicized, the direct relationship between the Russian Mafia and the Kremlin. Over the years, President Trump was asked 
how many times he interacted with convicted Russian mobster Felix Sater. In 2013, President Trump testified that, quote, not many. If he were sitting in the room right now, I really wouldn't know what he looked like, unquote. Mr. Cohen, as you previously testified, isn't it true that President Trump knew convicted Russian mobster Felix Sater in 2013 when he made that statement? Yes. Isn't it true that because of Mr. Sater's relationship to the Trump Organization that he had an office in the Trump Tower? And on the 26th floor, Mr. Trump. And the 26th floor is important. Why? Because it's Mr. Trump's floor. So he had an office on the same floor as President Trump. In fact, his office, when he left, became my office. And isn't it also true that convicted Russian mobster Sater even had business cards indicating that he was a senior advisor to Donald Trump, as reported by the Washington Post? Yes. Did convicted Russian mobster Sater pay rent for his office? No, he did not. So, based on those facts, isn't it true that President Trump misled at best or worse, lied under oath? Yes. That's correct. In December 2015, President Trump was asked again about his relationship to convicted Russian mobster Mr. Sater by a reporter for the Associated Press. He stated, quote, Felix Sater, boy, I have to even think about it, unquote. He added, quote, I'm not that familiar with him, unquote. Mr. Cohn, where would we find business records that explain the president's relationship to the convicted Russian mobster Felix Sater? Would those be in the Trump Organization's files? They'd be in the Trump Organization's files. There would be CCs to Bayrock, which was the name of Mr. Sater's company. Um, I suspect on Mr. Sater's email address, possibly hard files in possession um, of Mr. Sater. And when you say in possession of the Trump Organization, where? It depends upon who the attorney was that was working on it. Now it would probably be um, in a box um, off-site. They have storage facility that they okay. put uh, old files. In, in addition to convicted Russian mobster Sater, do you know of any other ties to convicted or alleged mobsters President Trump may have? I am not aware. Is it true that many people with ties to Russia ultimately bought condos in Trump properties, usually for cash? And if so, how many are we talking? 10, 20, 50? I'm not, hundreds? honestly, sir, I'm not aware of any. Um, you know, the statement that was, you're referring to, I believe, was made by either Eric or Don, and I, I don't agree with it. So are you aware of any cash purchases by Russian uh, oligarchs and family members of Trump properties? I'm not aware of that. I can tell you when you say cash, if you mean walking in with a satchel of rubles, uh, the answer is I've never seen that happen. I've never heard of it. I will tell you when we sold Mr. Trump's property in Palm Beach, the home for $95 million, it came in by wire. And that came from um, Mr. Rebolovyev's bank account. One other question. You also talked about President Trump doing negotiations throughout the campaign regarding uh, the Trump Tower in Moscow. Uh, was he directly involved in those nego negotiations? And if so, how do you know? Well, the answer is yes. And as it relates to negotiations, it was merely follow-ups as to what's currently happening, what, what's happening with Russia, meaning he wanted me to give him a status report. The problem with this is that the project never advanced because they were unable, Mr. Sater was unable to provide me with proof that somebody owned or controlled a piece of property that we can actually build on. The gentleman's time has expired, Thank Mr. You. Amash. Mr. Cohen, uh, why did Mr. Trump choose to hire you and why did he trust you with the various tasks that you performed for him? I don't know, sir. You would have to ask him that question. Well, uh, we've heard here that you have bad character. You've admitted to that over the years. You have no idea why he chose to hire you. 
In 2006, I was asked by Don Jr. to come meet with his father. I did. He then followed up by asking if I would take a look at an issue that was occurring at Trump World Tower with the board. I went ahead and I looked into it and I found that the um, statements that were the board were making about Mr. Trump were inaccurate. And the reason Don came to me is because I had an apartment there for investment. My parents had an apartment there. My in-laws lived there. Friends of mine, we all bought as a big block from a, from a brokerage company and we got a good price on each unit. And we ultimately turned over the board and I became actually the treasurer of the board uh, because the out of control spending was gonna put the building into bankruptcy. And I was proud to say that within a year we had plus a million dollars versus minus one three. At the end of the day, Mr. Trump appreciated that and he tasked me with something else. It was to handle a problem that Don Jr. had um, created in terms of a business, um, um, a license deal, and we resolved that. And then on top of that, the third time, Mr. Trump had asked me to take a look at the third Trump Entertainment Resort um, Chapter 11 reorganization because he had a series of questions that he wanted answered. And I read these two stack books, um, gave him the answers that he needed, and with that, he, the next time I was sitting in his office and he asked me if I was happy at the sleepy old firm that I was with, I said yes. He said, would you rather work for me? And I asked if you offer me a job. And he said, yeah. And we negotiated and I actually never went back to my office. All right. But, uh, you suggested that the president sometimes communicates his wishes indirectly. Uh, for example, you said, quote, Mr. Trump did not directly tell me to lie to Congress. That's not how he operates, end quote. Can you explain how he does this? Sure. It would be no different if I said, that's the nicest looking tie I've ever seen, isn't it? What are you going to do? Are you going to fight with him? The answer is no. So you say, yeah, it's the nicest looking tie I've ever seen. That's how he speaks. He doesn't give you questions. He doesn't give you orders. He speaks in a code. And I understand the code because I've been around him for a decade. And it's your impression that others who work for him understand the code as well? Most people, yes. Mr. Cohen, I don't know whether we should uh, believe you today, but I'm going to ask you uh, this one last question. What is the truth that you know President Trump fears most? That's a tough question, sir. I don't, I, don't, I, don't have an, I don't have an answer for that one. What does he fear most? What's the truth that he fears most? From your perspective. And again, I don't know whether we should believe you here today, but. You know, it's, it's a tough question, sir. I, I don't know even how to right. answer that question. Let, let me ask you this. What principles have you chosen to follow in your life? And do you wish to follow different principles now? I've always tried to be a good person. I've tried to be a great friend. There were many, I think over 40 statements written in my support uh, to the sentencing judge. I have friends who I treat incredibly well that I know for over 40 years, and I treat people after 40 minutes the same exact way. Um, did I, am I perfect? No. Do I make mistakes? Yes. Have I made mistakes? Absolutely. I'm going to pay the consequences for it, but I, all I would like to do is be able to get my life back to protect my wife and my children, support and grow old. That's pretty much where I'd like to be. And you feel you're, you're following a different set of principles now than you followed throughout your life. I, I do, and I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying very hard. I thank you for your questions. Some of the other ones are really make it difficult to try to, you know, show some redemption. Um, but, you know, I am, I am trying. I am trying. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Ms. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to mention really quick a clarification on the truth and testimony form. Uh, the, the mention was around whether it talks about uh, foreign entities at all. And the question is, in fact, 
whether witnesses have any contracts or payments originating with a foreign government. It does not cover all foreign entities, just foreign government entities. So Mr. Cohen, what I'd like you to ask you to do is review this issue over lunch uh, with your attorneys. And if you need to amend your form, we ask that you do that before the conclusion of today's hearing. Uh, also, I represent a purple district. I did not come here for partisan bickering. In fact, I actively wanted to avoid it. So when I ask these questions today, it is not as someone who has a vendetta against the president. It's as someone who comes from generations of service members who swore an oath to obey the orders of the President of the United States and who, along with myself and every single other person up here, swore to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. My forefathers served their country, they served their commander in chief, and they served the idea that America is free and just and that the law of the land rules us all, especially those in the highest levels of our government. So I ask these questions to help determine whether our very own president committed felony crimes while serving in the Oval Office, including efforts to conceal payments that were intended to mislead the public and influence the outcome of an election. I hope to God that is not the case. So Mr. Cohen, on January 22nd, 2018, just days after the Wall Street Journal broke the story that Mr. Cohen paid $130,000 to Stephanie Clifford to silence her during the 2016 presidential campaign, a nonprofit watchdog called Common Cause to file a complaint with the called Common Cause filed a complaint with the Department of Justice and FEC alleging the payment to Ms. Clifford may have represented an illegal in-kind contribution to the Trump campaign. I ask that their complaint be entered into the record. On February 13th, 2018, Mr. Cohen, you sent a statement to the reporters that said, quote, I used my own personal funds to facilitate a payment of $130,000 to Ms. Stephanie Clifford, and neither the Trump Organization nor the Trump campaign was party to the transaction with Ms. Clifford, and neither reimbursed me for the payment, either directly or indirectly. Was the statement false? The statement is not false. I purposefully left out Mr. Trump individually from that statement. Okay. Uh, why did you say it that way? Because that's what was discussed to do between myself, Mr. Trump, and Alan Weisselberg. So it was carefully worded? Yes, ma'am. Great. Mr. Cohen, a, per a reporter for the magazine Vanity Fair has reported that she interviewed you the very next day on February 14th, 2018, about the payment and reimbursement. And she wrote, quote, last February 14th, I interviewed Cohen in his office about the statement he gave the FEC in which he said Trump didn't know about the stormy payment or reimburse him for it. Do you recall this meeting with the reporter? I do. The reporter also wrote, Trump called while I was there. I couldn't hear much, but he wanted to go over what the public messaging would be. Is that accurate? It is. Did the president call you while you were having a meeting with the reporter? Yes. Did the president call you to coordinate on public messaging about the payments to Ms. Clifford's in or around February 2018? Yes. What did the president ask or suggest that you say about the payments or reimbursements? He was not knowledgeable of these reimbursements and he wasn't knowledgeable of my actions. He asked you to say that? Yes, ma'am. Great. Uh, in addition to the personal check for $35,000 in July 2017, is there additional corroborating evidence that Mr. Trump, while a sitting president of the United States, directly reimbursed you hush money as part of a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws? There are 11 checks that I received for the year. Um, the reason why 11, because as I stated before, one had two checks. And you have copies of all of those? I can get copies. I'd have to go to the bank. So we will get. be able to get copies of all 11 checks that Mr. Trump prov provided to you as part of this criminal scheme? It's either from his personal account, as what was demonstrated in the exhibit, or it would come from the um, Donald J. Trump account, the um, trust account. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I yield back the remainder of my time. Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I, I'm just been sitting here. I'm new to the committee. I'm not an attorney. Sometimes Mr. Chairman, your answers are either a competent or are a liar. I think maybe I could be a better attorney. I don't know. Um, I'm looking through this. Uh, you come in here and you rail on the President of the United States, Commander-in-Chief, while he's over in, across the Pacific Ocean trying to negotiate a deal to make this world safer. And Mr. Chairman, this, just having this committee at this time when the Commander Chiefs out, out of the country is just, is just uh, I think it's a new president. But you great, call him a racist, a cheat, uh, and you know, he's attacking his character. 
And I've been with the president a little bit, uh, and, and uh, I, don't, I didn't see that in the president. I see a president who's very sincere, who's trying to make this country better for every American. And, and, and for you to come in here and do that, and just, just repentance on your part is really unbelievable. Real repentance would be go serve your time and, 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 and uh, don't, don't come back here and, and make allegations towards a man you can't uh, substantiate. Now, I'm looking here from the uh, remarks from the prosecutor in the Southern District of New York. Uh, false statements to Bank 3, which Cohen pleaded guilty, was far from an isolated event. It was one of the long series of self-serving lies Cohen told in numerous financial institutions. Early in your testimony, I think I heard you say that only there was a home equity loan, but apparently the prosecutors in New York think that there's other financial things that you did. He also, they said, managed to commit a series of crimes, all withholding himself out as a licensed attorney and a standing member of the bar. Um, also, the Southern District uh, prosecutor said that, uh, wrote that your consciousness of wrongdoing is fleeting, that your remorse is minimal, and that your instinct is to blame others is strong. Uh, so I'm kind of left here. Why? You worked for the president for 10 years before he was president. If you have any sense of integrity that you're trying to tell us you have now, and it was that bad, why didn't you leave? You weren't, you weren't stuck there for financial reasons. You had ways to leave. You were an attorney. Um, and so that's just kind of, you know, the president's working tirelessly, and you come to make these allegations, and you could have left any time you want. It looks like to me you're trying to save face. And, and with the other questions that came out here was, it looks like to me you're going to have a, a very uh, lucrative deal at some point in your life because you don't look like you're any close to, to retirement, but you're going to have some type of a lucrative deal. And so one of my questions is, and it's come up a little bit, uh, talks with you and your attorney, and there's been talks about members of Congress and staff, and, and, and you said there was some discussions. Was any of those discussions that you or your attorneys had with members of Congress or staff or prosecutors uh, to get considerations to favor or other considerations to you or your family in the future? No, the conversations were about the topics and because uh, there were things that originally we could not speak about at the request of whether it was the special counsel's office or the Southern District or any of the other agencies, including um, the House Select Intel or the Senate Select Intel. Um, sir, just for your personal edification here, I was asked to come here. Um, your chairman sent a letter to Mr. Davis, and I accept it, so I'm here voluntarily. And oh, I, I understand you, that. But sir, and if you believe that I'm my here... I understand. I think this is political theater. Sir, if you believe it's not political theater for me, and I take no pleasure in saying anything negative about Mr. Trump, you've met him for a short period of time. I've been with him for over a decade. I've traveled with him internationally. I've spent dinners with him. It doesn't make me feel good about what's going on here. And as far as saving face, I'm not sure how being in front of the world, being called well, a this, cheat, this world being, today with, with these lucrative book deals and movies that come about, I think you, you'll be pretty good in about five years. I yield the rest of my time to the chair, ranking member. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, earlier you said you started the campaign? That's correct, in 2011. You started the campaign for President of the United States for Donald Trump? I certainly did, sir. Now that's news. Shouldtrumprun.com. Wow. 2011. It was my idea. I saw a document in the newspaper that said, who would you vote for in 2012? Six percent of the people Cohen. said Michael, Michael Cohen. Cohen. Six percent of the Michael people Cohen turned around and said they'd vote for Donald reason Trump. Reason Donald Trump is president because so Michael I brought Cohen it into started. his office and I said to him, Mr. Trump, take a look at this. And he goes, Well, wouldn't that be great? And with that is where it all started. Yeah. Okay. Like I'm sure I'm sure he had never thought of anything like that until you came. No, I didn't. Let me say ask you that one question. One, I got eight seconds. It. I got eight seconds. Um, what did you talk to Mr. Schiff about? I spoke to Mr. Schiff about topics that were going to be raised at the upcoming hearing. Whoa. Not just what time you show up, time. actually what you're going to talk about? The gentleman's time to expired. Wow. Mr. Sarbanes. <laughs> Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Cohen. I know the other side is suggesting that um, you are a incorrigible liar and that you're lying here today. I can't think of anything you have to gain 
at this point from lying. I mean, they talk about book deals and other things that you want to do, but I see a lot more that you could lose um, by telling the truth today, given the threats and other things that have been made against you uh, and your family. So that's how I'm interpreting it. And of course, you brought documents with you as well to bolster the credibility of your uh, testimony. I did want to go back to an earlier line of questioning regarding the preparation um, of your testimony before you came before the Intelligence Committee. You've talked about a meeting um, at the White House where the testimony was being reviewed. I think you said that there was at least one White House attorney, Jay Sekulow, um, who was there, and you acknowledged that there were some edits that were made to your testimony. Um, so on that topic, who, who at the White House reviewed your testimony? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the document was, was um, originally created by myself, mm -hmm. um, along with my attorney at the time, uh, for McDermott, Will, and Emery. And there was a joint defense agreement, so the document circulated around. Um, I believe it was also reviewed by Abby Lowell, uh, who represents Ivanka and Jared Kushner. Um, Why did you provide um, the testimony to the White House? It was pursuant to the joint defense agreement that we were all operating under. Mm -hmm. What were the edits that came back substantively on the testimony? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know, sir. I'd have to take a look at the document. Uh -huh. Did you um, have a do you have a reaction to why there might not have been, in a sense, a protest to what was going to be false testimony that was going to be provided? No, sir, because the committee? goal was to stay on message. It just limit the relationship whatsoever with Russia. It was short. There's no Russian contacts. There's no Russian collusion. There's no Russian deals. That's, that's the message. That's the same message that existed well before my need to come and testify. So it's an example of, of where this idea, this, this mentality of you tow the line, whatever the storyline or the narrative of the day or the month or the year is going to be, you tow that line whether it results in false testimony or not. I towed the party line and I'm now suffering and I'm going to continue to suffer for a while along with my family as a result of it, so yes. Let me switch gears uh, quickly before my time expires. And you may not have direct knowledge of some of these things, but you're offering us some very helpful uh, perspective on how the Trump world operates. And frankly, another reason I find your testimony fairly compelling and credible is because a lot of the things you're describing, a lot of the behavior you're describing, is very consistent with what we all see every single day. So it's not, it's not a leap for us to arrive in the same place of perspective that you uh, presented. Uh, I'm interested in, in some of the activities around the inaugural um, committee, the inauguration of the president. There was an article um, that appeared um, in ProPublica, the watchdog group, about some negotiation on pricing of things at the Trump Hotel, where it looks like the, um, the rental that was being quoted was substantially even double what you would expect to pay according to what the market uh, should bear. And um, so in a, in a sense, the, the Trump Hotel was upcharging to the inaugural Even I couldn't um, afford to stay there. Committee. Yeah. And so I'm just curious, do you have a sense of whether that kind of a practice is something that um, is consistent or inconsistent? Is it possible that that kind of upcharging could be done uh, inside a, a Trump operation? It did, it did happen. And Gentlemen, well, like, all, what I can say to you is I wasn't part of the inaugural committee. Um, I raised a lot of money for the inauguration, 
but I was not part of it, and there was a lot of um, things in that actually, that issue is something that's also, um, obviously, we've read about in the paper being investigated at the current moment. Thank you. Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, it's on my heart to tell you, sir, that and I'm, I'm sorry for what your family is going through. I feel for your family. You. The word tells us clearly that a man's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. And I, I see you, a man, trapped in that. However, I must tell you that I've arrested several thousand men, and you remind me of many of them, the ones that immediately become humble and remorseful at the time they're actually booked, and while they're incarcerated, they're quite penitent, and then return to their former selves when they're back on the street. So respectful to your family and what they're going through, I owe you the honesty to tell you that that's my sense of you, good sir. I'm going to give you another opportunity to respond to what you brushed off earlier regarding your own statement during his testimony from C-SPAN notation at two hours and 50 seconds in, you stated regarding your credibility that you're being accused of having no credibility that it is exactly for that reason I spent the last week searching boxes to find the information that I did so that you don't have to take my word for it. I want you to look at the documents and make your own decisions. Now, the documents you're referring to Mr. Cohen, are the documents that you submitted in your, with your testimony today, is that correct? That is correct. Do you believe they to be, those documents to be worthy of evidence for this oversight hearing today? I leave that to you to decide. And I ask you again, sir, and please don't be incredulous, this is a serious question. Where are those boxes that contain documents worthy of evidence to be presented to Congress, and why have they not been turned over to investigating authorities looking into some of the many criminal activities that you're allegedly cooperating in. Where are these boxes? Who knows of the, where is this treasure of evidence? The boxes that I'm referring to were boxes that were in my law office when the FBI entered and seized documents. Mr. Chairman, when I, would I hope was that the moving, investigating authorities have noted what the gentleman had just stated and that actions be taken for those boxes to be seized and reviews based upon proper warrant signed by a sitting judge. You noted earlier today, Mr. Cohen, quite incredulously, one of my colleagues asked you regarding the television deal. Um, you expressed wonderment that your predicament could possibly get you on television. It certainly got you on television today, has it not, sir? So I was on television representing Mr. Trump going back into 2011. Well, I didn't know who you were until today, really, until, until the, the FBI raided your home. Most of Americans didn't know who you were. How many attorneys do you think Mr. Trump has had through the course of his career? Quite a few, I would imagine. You're, you're just one that's in a trap right now, and I understand you're trying to get out of it. You're in a bind. But I ask you, good sir, have you discussed film and book deals with, with your, your stated current attorney, Mr. Davis, Lanny Davis? With Mr. Davis? Yes. No. But I have been approached by many people who are looking to do book deals, movie deals, and so on. So yes, the answer you're to right, that is yes. an American, but it, it, it leads me back to my instinct that compares you to many of the men that I've arrested during the course of my career. Mr. Chairman, with, with all due respect, that sir. Our, that, our, that our primary hearing to introduce the Oversight Committee, the 116th Congress of the American people, has manifested in the way that it obviously is. This is an attempt to injure our president and lay some sort of soft cornerstone for future impeachment proceedings. This is the full intent of the majority. I yield my remaining 30 seconds to the ranking member. Mr. Cohen, earlier you said the United States Southern District of New York is not accurate in that statement. I'm sorry, say that earlier again. Earlier you said that the United States Southern District of New York, 
attorney's office, that statement is not accurate. You said it's not a lie. You said it's not accurate. Do you stand by that? Yes, I did not want a role in the new administration. So the, the court's wrong? I, sir, can, can, I, can I finish, sure. please? I got exactly the role that I wanted. There is no shame in being personal attorney to the president. I got exactly what I wanted. I asked Mr. Trump for that job, and he gave it to me. All I'm asking, if I could, but quick, and I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, you're saying that statement from the Southern District of New York attorneys is wrong. I'm saying I didn't write it, and it's not accurate. All right. Thank Mr. you. Welch. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the most significant events in the last presidential campaign, of course, was the dump of emails stolen from the Democratic National Committee, dumped by WikiLeaks. Uh, Mr. Cohen, during your opening statement, uh, which was at, at the height of the election, you testified you were actually meeting with Donald Trump in July 2016 when Roger Stone happened to call and tell Mr. Trump that he had just spoken to Julian Assange. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And you said that Mr. Assange told Mr. Trump about an upcoming, quoting your opening statement, quote, massive dump of emails that would damage Hillary Clinton's campaign. So I want to ask you about Roger Stone's phone call to the president. First of all, was that on speakerphone? Is that what you indicated? Yes. So Mr. Trump has a black speakerphone that sits on his desk. Right. Um, he uses it quite often because with all the number of phone calls he gets. Right. Now, in January like of this year, 2019, the New York Times asked President Trump if he ever spoke to Roger Stone about these stolen emails, and President Trump answered, and I quote, no, I didn't. I never did. Was that statement by President Trump true? No, it's not accurate. And can you please describe for us, to the best of your recollection, you were present, exactly what Mr. Stone said to Mr. Trump? It was a short conversation, and he said, Mr. Trump, I just want to let you know that I just got off the phone with Julian Assange, and in a couple of days, there's going to be a massive dump of emails that's going to severely hurt the Clinton campaign. And was Mr. Trump and Mr. Stone aware of where those emails came from? That I'm not aware of. Did Mr. Trump ever suggest then or later to call the FBI to report this breach? He never expressed that to me. Uh, did the president at that time or ever since, in your knowledge, uh, indicate an awareness that this conduct was wrong? No. The reason I ask is because on July 22nd, on the eve of the Democratic Convention, WikiLeaks published, as you know, the 20,000 uh, leaked internal DNC emails. Could your uh, meeting with Mr. Trump have been before that date? Yes. So Mr. Trump was aware of the upcoming dump before it actually happened? Yes. Right. And is there any record? Though, sir, I don't know whether he knew or not, and I don't believe he did, what the sum and substance of the dump was going to be, only that there was going to be a dump of emails. And he was aware of that before the dump occurred, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And are there any records that would corroborate the day of this meeting, calendars perhaps? I'm not in possession, but I believe, again, this is part of the special counsel, and they and probably it, best suited to um, corroborate that information. Was, was anyone else present uh, in the room during the call? I don't recall for this one, no, sir. Is there anyone else the committee should talk to about the president's knowledge of the, the WikiLeaks email dump? Well, um, again, when he called, uh, Rona Graf uh, yelled out to Mr. Trump, Rogers on line one which was regular practice. And that's his assistant? That's his, yes. All right. And during a news conference on July 27th, 2016, then candidate Trump public, publicly appealed uh, to Russia to hack Hillary Clinton's emails and make them public. He stated, and I quote, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Now, going back to Mr. Stone's phone call to the president, do you recall if Mr. Trump had knowledge of the WikiLeaks dump at the time of his direct appeal to Russia? I, I am not. But the call with Mr. Stone, you believe, was before 
Yes. This 27. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. If you're t I, I thought you were talking about a different set of um, documents that got dumped. So I was in Mr. Trump's office, it was either July 18th or 19th, and yes, he went ahead. I don't know if the 35,000 or 30,000 emails was what he was referring to, no, but it, he certainly had knowledge. All right, thank you. Just yes, one sir. last question. Uh, Mr. Raskin had been asking you some questions, and one of the things in your answer was that Mr. Pecker uh, expended other monies to protect uh, Mr. Trump. Can you elaborate on what some of those other activities were? Sure. There was the story about Mr. Trump having uh, a love child with an employee, um, with, with an employee, and actually the husband of that employee works for the company as well. And there was a elevator operator who claims that he overheard the conversation taking place between uh, one of Mr. Trump's other executives and somebody, and he ended up paying like $15,000 in order to buy that story to find out whether it was true or not. And that's just one example of things that David had done over the years. It was the reason why in the recording, when David was looking to become the CEO of Time Magazine, we were concerned about, we'll call it the treasure trove of documents that had been created over the years, that if he left, somebody could open up the key to a drawer and find all this information. So we were going to look to buy all of those life rights and so on. Gentleman's time expired, Mr. Norman. Ms. Corwin, thank you for testifying. I join Mr. H Congressman Higgins in um, feeling for your family. They have no uh, part in this. Uh, you know, I've heard all the testimony, and I'm trying to decide what Clay's trying to decide. It's, are you really um, uh, sorry for what you did, or you just got caught? And the thing that amazed me uh, is that in your opening statement, uh, which, let me quote, Last fall, I pled guilty in federal court to felonies for the benefit of, at the direction of, and in coordination with individual one. Was that uh, present? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, your, your crimes were of your own to, to benefit yourself. Uh, go some, through of, some of them, you, yes. No, go through all the ones with the real estate, with the banks, uh, on your HELOC loan. You failed to disclose more than $20 million in debt. You failed to disclose, uh, disclose 70000 in monthly payments um, on your $14, 14 million line of credit. Uh, you failed to disclose that you had drawn on that. So this was all for yourself. This wasn't for the benefit of President Trump. This was to benefit Michael Cohen. So that's, what, that's my question. Uh, did you just get caught? Uh, and you worked for this man for, for 10 years, Mr. Cohen. You came in here with, with these, with these uh, uh, he's a con man. He's a cheat. This is the very man that didn't you wiretap him illegally? Did you not wiretap President Trump without his knowledge? I did record Mr. Trump in a conversation, yes. Is that lawyer-client privilege? Is that some, something that an honest guy would do, an honest lawyer? I actually never thought that this was going to be happening and that that recording even existed. I had forgotten. But you did it. Yes, I did. Have you ever... Um, I had a reason for doing it. What was your reason? Because I knew he wasn't going to pay that money. And David Pecker had already chewed me out on multiple occasions regarding other monies that he expended. But this is a man that you trusted, you take a bullet for, you secretly recorded. Let me ask you this, Mr. Cohen. Have you, done, have you uh, legally or illegally recorded other clients? I have recordings of people, yes. Legally or illegally? I believe that they're legal. Did you tell them? In New York State, you don't have to do that. So you didn't tell them? No, I did not. Okay. Sometimes I also use the recordings for contemporaneous note-taking instead of writing it down. I find it easier. If the shoe were reversed, would you like a, so your, your trusted lawyer recording you? I probably would not, no. No, sir. It, it's, it's untrustworthy. It's something people just would not do. Now, your bank loans that I just ran down, did you ever default on any of these loans? No, sir. So the bank didn't take any loss? No, no, no bank has. I am not in default. I have never filed a bankruptcy. Um, the HELOC you're referring to, um, I replaced that from a different HELOC um, 
Yeah, but paid it off. There is, I owe no banks any money. How about your medallion taxi cab? Did they, did you have to sell that? I'm still, well, the ones in Chicago, yes, I do have to sell. Um, however, um, New York, the answer is no, I don't. And um, they are, the industry is going through a major, major correction because of ride sharing. Uh, it's changed a lot of things. The value of it has. Yes, sir. Right. Has the, uh, so no bank, uh, would the banks make you a loan again based on your record? Actually, they did. They did. Post the, yes, um, the, the bank um, actually redid and they refinanced uh, the entire package. Currently. Post this, yes. Okay. Have they never had to do a loan loss reserve for the projected losses? I don't know what they did, but it's still the same amount. Well, I didn't get the benefit of it, no, sir. Most likely they did. I was on an audit committee. They, they, they may have. They may have done that, sir, but that's for their own banking, and not for no, me. No, it's by my, law. My they have to, if, if they suspect you of lying, which you admitted to, if they suspect you of maybe not being able to make a loan payment, they have a have to have a loan loss reserve. That's 125 percent of what you. If it's 20 million, they have to post uh, in their account uh, 20 million plus. So they get no interest on. And you know who pays who pays for that? The American public who deals with that bank. Yes, but sir, I'm not in default and I'm current on each and every one of those medallion loans. And I've never owed any money to First Republic Bank. In fact, at the time that I had the HELOC, I had more cash sitting in that same bank okay. than, Last question. than, I'm, than, I'm gonna, than the HELOC and my mortgage time. combined. Have you ever been to Prague? I've never been to Prague. Never have? I've never been to the Czech Republic. You have my balance my time. Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cohen. On page five of your statement, you say, and I quote, you need to know that Mr. Trump's personal lawyers reviewed and edited my statement to Congress about the timing of the Moscow Tower negotiations. Who were those attorneys? Jay Sekulow, from the White House? Yes. Jay Sekulow, I believe Abby Lowell as well. And you have a copy of your original statement that you can provide to the committee? I can try to get that for you. All right, if you would do that. Do that. Um, the letter of intent for the Moscow Tower was in the fall of 2015, correct? Correct. Uh, was there an expiration date on that letter of intent? There was no expiration so date. So it could technically still be in effect today? Oh, no, no, it's been terminated. It has been terminated? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did Mr. Trump tell you to offer Vladimir Putin a free penthouse? No, ma'am. So that was that, that was Felix Sater. It was a marketing stunt that so, he spoke about. So Felix Sater had suggested to you that Mr. Trump offer a penthouse to Mr. Putin. Yes, because it would certainly drive up the price per square foot. No different than in any condo where they start listing celebrities that live in the property. In 2016, did you travel to Europe? Yes. Did you meet with um, persons associated with the Moscow Tower project? No. It was for personal? Or? Personal. My daughter was studying at Queen Mary in London. So you did not meet with any Russians? No. There is an elevator tape that has been referenced as a catch and kill product. Um, it was evidently of Mr. Trump and a woman, presumably Mrs. Trump, is that correct? Are we talking about in Moscow or the, the Trump Tower elevator tape? There's, a, there's an elevator tape that went up for auction ostensibly yes. in 2016, is yes, that correct? Yes, I've heard, I've heard about this. And who is on that tape? It's Mr. Trump with Melania. And what happened in that tape? Well, the story goes that he um, uh, struck Melania while in that elevator, because there's a camera inside, which I'm not so sure. Um, actually, I'm certain it's not true. I've heard about that tape for years. I've known four or five different people, including folks from AMI, um, who have So, But there was claimed, some tape that went up for auction, correct? I, I don't believe that auction was real, and I don't believe anybody, I don't believe Mr. Trump ever struck Mrs. Trump, ever. I don't believe it. And are you aware of anyone purchasing that tape then? I don't believe it was ever So you never purchased. saw this tape? No, ma'am, and I know several people who went to go try to purchase it for catch and kill purpose. It doesn't exist. That, right. Mr. Trump would never, do, in my opinion, it's, that's, that's not Good something to know. that he Good to know. Um, is there a love child? 
There is not, to my, to the best of my knowledge. So you would pay off someone to uh, not It wasn't me, ma'am. It was AMI. It was David Pecker. So he paid off someone about a love child that doesn't exist. Correct. It was about $15,000. OK. Um, how many times did Mr. Trump ask you to threaten an individual or entity on his behalf? Quite a few times. 50 times? More. 100 times? More. 200 times? More. 500 times? Probably. Over the, over the 10 years? Over the 10 years, he sure. asked you. And when you say threaten, I'm talking with litigation or um, an argument with um, intimidation, a, a, a nasty reporter that has, is writing an article. What do you know about, uh, let's go to your tapes. You said there's probably 100 tapes. Voice recordings. Voice recordings. And will you make them available to the committee? If you would really like them. <laughs> Did Mr. Trump you have to, tape uh, conversation? Don't you have to gavel that, sir? <laughs> We would. Sorry. Mr. Trump, uh, did Mr. Trump tape any conversations? Not that I'm aware of, no. Were you involved in the $25 million settlement to Trump University? I had, I had a role in that, yes. Who paid the settlement? I believe it was Mr. Trump. I don't know the answer to that. You don't know the answer, but you were involved in the Yes, in a different aspect. There's some reference to a businessman in Kansas being involved in that. Are you familiar with that? I'm, I'm not familiar with that, no. All right. Uh, finally, near my 13 seconds left, what do you want your children to know? That I'm sorry for everything, and I'm sorry for the pain that I've caused them. And um, I wish I can go back in time. Thank you. I yield back. Young lady's time has expired. To the, to the members of the committee before we go to Ms. Miller for your, so that you can plan, properly plan. There's a vote apparently coming up in about uh, 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, and what we will do is we will recess and we will come back, listen up, 30 minutes after the last vote begins. Got that? Not it ends. 30 minutes after it begins, and we'll do that promptly. All right? All right, Ms. Miller. I am very disappointed to have you in front of this committee today. Quite frankly, this isn't the reason the people of West Virginia sent me to Congress. I find this hearing not in the best interest of the American people. This is another political game with the sole purpose of discrediting the president. If it was not already obvious, there are members here with a singular goal in Congress to impeach President Trump. To achieve this goal, they will waste not only precious taxpayer dollars, but also time in this committee and Congress as a whole. In fact, they will go so far as to bring a convicted felon in front of our committee. We are supposed to take what you say, Mr. Cohen, at this time about President Trump as the truth. But you're about to go to prison for lying. How can we believe anything you say? The answer is, we can't. This begs the question, why are those in the majority holding this hearing? I am appalled. We could be focused on actual issues that are facing America like border security, neonatal abstinence syndrome, or improving our nation's crumbling infrastructure. Instead, the Democrats are trying to grasp at straws. Let's talk about this witness. From his sentencing hearing in the Southern District of New York, Judge Pauley stated, Mr. Cohen pled guilty to a veritable smorgasbord of fraudulent conduct willful tax evasion, making false statements to a financial institution, illegal campaign contributions, and making false statements to Congress. Each of the crimes involved deception, and each appears to have been motivated by personal greed and ambition. This is who we have in front of us today in our committee someone who is about to be sent to prison for three years for evading his taxes, deceiving a financial institution, lying to Congress, among other counts. 
One of the most appalling facts about this hearing is that Mr. Cohen has used his experiences with President Trump both before and after he was elected for his own greed and profit. I'd like some yes or no answers. Isn't it true you tried to sell a book about your time with President Trump entitled Trump Revolution from the Tower to the White House, Understanding Donald J. Trump? Yes, that, that happened and early on when I was still even part, I believe, of the RNC. And this book deal, which you had with Hatchet Books, was worth around $500,000. Isn't that correct? No more, ma'am. How much more? Uh, I think it was about seven fifty. Wow. Mr. Cohen. I, I did turn it down. Given that you continue to profit from publicly discussing your time with Mr. Trump, I worry that this committee hearing the majority has given you will only serve as a platform for you to continue to lie and sensationalize and exaggerate wherever it suits you. Do you plan to pursue another book deal about your experiences? Yes. I would presume this book would be a little different than your latest pat pitch, but your new angle might please some new fans. Anything to sell books. Mr. Chairman, we've canceled hearings on child separation and on other issues that are close to my heart for this media circus. What a waste of time and money. For a man who has gladly exploited the name of the president, to promote his own name and fill his own pockets, it pains me that we are sitting here adding another chapter to his book. Thank you, and I yield the remainder uh, of my time to Mr. Jordan. I thank the gentlelady for, for yielding. Earlier, Mr. Cohen, um, uh, the gentlelady from California talked about this, um, this tape. I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I can't hear you. Earlier, the gentlelady from California talked about this tape, this elevator tape that you said does not exist. That's correct. I do not believe it exists. But it was, is it also your testimony that the Trump team was willing to pay to make sure a story about a non-existent tape um, never became public? No, sir, that's not, what, that's not what I said. They were willing to stop a false tape? We looked, we learned that this tape was potentially on the market and that it existed. And so what we did is exactly what we did with all the other catch and kill. We looked for it. And if in fact that it did exist, we would have tried to stop it. That's what I would have but done. It's a false tape. But it's it a not. false tape. I've never Got it. heard it. And, and I can assure you one thing about Mr. Trump. Many things, he would never ever do something like that. I don't see it. Ms. Exactly. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cohen, I'd like to ask you more about the details of the $130,000 payment you made to Stephanie Clifford, the adult film actress known as Stormy Daniels, in order to purchase her silence shortly before the 2016 election. First, according to documents filed by federal prosecutors in New York, you created a shell company called Essential Consultants, LLC. Is that correct? It's correct. And you created this company for the purpose of making the payment to Ms. Clifford, is that correct? Amongst other things, yes. You then used a home equity line of credit to fund the account in the name of Essential Consultants, LLC, is that correct? That's correct. You then wired $130,000 to the attorney representing Ms. Clifford at that time and wrote in the memo field for the wire the word, quote, retainer, is that correct? Correct. Can you tell us why you decided to use this complicated process to make this payment? Well, starting an LLC is not a sophisticated means. LLC, you call up a company, you pay for it, and they open it for you. And the reason that I used the home equity line of credit as opposed to cash that I had in the same exact bank was I didn't want my wife to know about it because she handles all of the banking. And I didn't want her coming to me and asking me what was the $130,000 for. And then I was going to be able to move money from one account to the other and to pay it off because I didn't want to have to explain to her what that payment was about. I sent it to the IOLA account, the interest on a lawyer's account, to Keith Davidson, California, Ms. Daniel's attorney. He would hold it in escrow until such time as I received the executed NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Did Mr. Trump know you were going through this process to hide the payment? Yes. 
why not just use Mr. Trump's personal or company bank account to make the payment? Why was the distraction so important beside you not wanting your wife to know? What his concern was was that there would be a check that has his very distinct signature onto it. And even after she cashed the check, all you need to do is make a photocopy of it, and it's kind of proof positive on exactly what took place. So here he, the goal was to keep him far away from it as possible. Can anyone corroborate what you have shared with us? Absolutely. And that is? Keith Davidson, Alan Weisselberg, President Trump. Now, let's talk about the reimbursement. According to federal prosecutors, and I quote, after the election, Cohen sought reimbursement for election-related expenses, including the $130,000 payment. Prosecutors stated that you, and I quote, presented an, execu an executive of the company with a copy of a bank statement reflecting the $130,000 wire transfer. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Do you still have a copy of that bank statement? Yes, it's actually made part of the exhibit. So you will provide it to the committee? Yes, ma'am. According to federal prosecutors, executives at the company then, and I quote, agreed to reimburse Cohen by adding 130000 and 50000 grossing up that amount to 360000 for tax purposes and adding a $60,000 bonus such that Cohen would be paid 420000 in total. Executives of the company decided to pay the 420000 in monthly installments of 35000 over the course of a year. Is that accurate? That is accurate. What was the purpose of grossing up the amounts, essentially doubling what you had paid to Mrs. Ms. Clifford and others? Because if you pay $130,000 and you live in New York where you have a 50 percent tax bracket, um, in order to get you 130 back, you have to have 260. Otherwise, my, if he gave me back 130, I would only, then I'd be out 65,000. What was the purpose of spreading the reimbursements to you over the 12 monthly installments? That was in order to hide what the payment was. I obviously wanted the money in one shot. I would have preferred it that way. But in order to be able to um, put it onto um, the books, Alan Weisselberg made the decision. Um, that it should be paid over the 12 months so that it would look like a retainer. And did Mr. Trump know about this uh, reimbursement method? Oh, he knew about everything, yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Cohen. So the president not only knew about the payments, he knew and helped to hide the payments and the reimbursements to you. Yeah, we discussed it. Everything had to go through Mr. Trump, and it had to be approved by Mr. Trump. And now you're going to prison, and he's And I am going White to House. prison, yes, ma'am. I yield back. John Strong. If I'm, if I'm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, earlier, you yes, I yield my time. Oh, she did. Uh, earlier, you said uh, I'm assuming Nor New York's a one-party consent state. One person can record the other one without it being illegal. Correct. But you also were a member of the New York Bar. I was. Yes. How would you rate uh, recording clients in the ethical realm of being a lawyer? I know it's it's not illegal, and I I'm not asking if it's illegal. I'm asking if it's ethical. I, I don't I don't know that okay. we'd have to leave and the judgment of the bar association. So, well, I think every other lawyer in here knows exactly where it is and the ethical standard. Um, when you said you had a hundred tapes, were any of those tapes of other clients? Yes. And it, I think this is pretty amazing. I I really do. Did any of them waive privilege? No. Nope. So five minutes ago. In the middle of our hearing on oversight, you just immediately responded that you would, re you would hand over tapes to this committee without any of your previous clients waiving privilege. I'm not the only one in possession of those documents. Those documents are in the hands I, of all of the Whoever else is in already. charge of those documents is not my concern. My concern is I know lawyers that would go to jail before they would violate attorney-client privilege. And in a matter of a second, you just said, absolutely, I will turn those over. Just trying to cooperate, sir. <laughs> At the expense of clients who have never waived privilege. They are already in the hands, sir, of all of the agencies. As was, I didn't ask people. What to law take my enforcement phone. determines to do with something and what you determine to do with something, client privilege and attorney trust accounts are about the two most sacred things that you can ever do in your entire career as a lawyer. And, and, and by the in way, sir, a the matter of a second, 
And the tape you, with Mr. Trump, completely the that it's out there is because Rudy Giuliani waived the privilege. I'm not talking about Rudy Giuliani. I'm talking about you. And this is, I don't know who's on those tapes. Only you know who is on those tapes. There's a hundred of them. The other one is also subject to an ongoing. My point is, it, within a matter of a second, one second, you took no, absolutely no calculation of your role as those clients' counselor, the role that plays in privacy, and in the role that plays in a solemn vow you took when you passed the bar, when you signed onto the bar until recently were a member of the bar, and you just immediately said, if it, if it helps me out in the two day in front of TV, yes, absolutely, Mr. Chairman, you can have that. And I think, and that just goes into what we're gonna talk about next briefly. We talk about these tax, these indictments on tax fraud and bank fraud as if they are isolated incidents. But they're not isolated incidents of bad judgment. These were intricate, elaborate lies that created near, that needed to be held with constant, mis, or, I mean, just constant deceptions of banks, businesses, associates, accountants, potentially your family. Um, you received over 2.4 million in personal loans from taxi company, taxi medallion company one. And those, those, those were loan payments for a business loan, correct? No, sir. They, you weren't receiving those. Okay, go ahead. Those were payments that were made by the management company that was operating the medallions. To you. To me. So, and you, those were, dis, those were deposited into your personal account or in some instances your wife's account? It was, it was deposited into the joint checking account of my wife and I that's located at the base of the building that we reside in. And were those disclosed on your tax returns? They are not, they were not disclosed on my tax return. And in fact, when uh, your, your accountant talked to you about those, those deposits, you told them you wouldn't pay for a memo that you didn't ask to be done? That's inaccurate. So the that, that's, that's inaccurate. sentencing court in New York has it wrong? Okay. Um, I don't know what Mr. Getzel wrote, okay. my accountant, um, there are series of issues regarding his memo anyway, including the fact he's almost directing me in an earlier memo to commit fraud. But putting all that aside with Jeff Getzel, um, the answer to that is I pled guilty, all right? And I made my mistake, and I'm going, as I've said a hundred times now, right? I'm not so sure why the singular attack on my taxes, if you want to look at them, we, I'm more than happy to show them to you. If, but if, every if the chairman single word will give me 20 minutes, I got plenty of other things to talk every about. Every single word that's written All right, I'm going to reclaim my time. It's not 100 percent accurate. Okay. Well, I'm done. And that's exactly why, when it comes to the credibility, why I asked Mr. Davis, Mr. Monaco, to please let's figure out how. But to that's my point with the credibility, so these, that you understand. These aren't isolated. The in, these are not isolated trying. incidents of attack. These were constant deceptions. Whether it's rolling over a $20 million line of credit to a $14 million credit. You went through great lengths to conceal that from one bank, while at the same time, you are reducing your net income to another bank. These aren't things that happened on January 1 of 18, January 1 of 17, January 1 of 15. These are things that were constantly involved on a... My question is, was it exhausting keeping track of all the lies that you were telling all these people? The gentleman's time has expired. You may... I don't have an answer for him. I Very well, thank Mr. you for continuing. Sergei. The thank narrative. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, good luck on your road to redemption. Thank you. Opposite, it's going to be a long way. Yeah, the opposite of that is perdition, as I remember. And um, that's particularly hard on your children. So I wish you well, and I wish your family well. Mr. Cohen, as you sort of describe your road to here, Mr. Cooper asked you where, when the moment was or moments when you decided you needed to change. It strikes me there is a transition that you have you have illuminated here. Your period of time, the 10 years working for somebody who you admired as a developer, and then when Charlottesville happened, and quite frankly, uh, when the special counsel called you, called you in, obviously was a key part of it, or you wouldn't be here. Um, but the in-between part I find really interesting and troubling, at least in terms of appearances and confidence that the American people would have in this institution and, and democracy, quite frankly. So during that period of time, I want to ask you about two specific, if we have enough time. First, uh, the Trump Tower. So you were negotiating for this. As you said, it was to be the tallest building in Europe. Um, in your guilty plea with the special counsel, you quote, say, uh, it, it quotes, Cohen asked individual one, is that President Trump? Yes. Okay. 
about the possibility of, of President Trump traveling to Russia in connection with the Moscow Project and asked a senior campaign official about potential businesses travel, business travel to Russia. Uh, what, when did this conversation happen, do you recall? Early on in the campaign. And who was the campaign official? Corey Lewandowski. What, what did you discuss in this meeting? possibility of which dates that Mr. Trump would have availability if, in fact, that we were going to go over to Russia to take a look at the project. Unfortu the I'm sorry, sir? So go ahead. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, it never came to fruition because we were never successful in getting the first prong of what I needed, which was ownership or control over a piece of property. And until such time, there was no reason to come up with a date, but when I first received the information request to go to Russia, what I decided to do is I spoke to Mr. Trump about it. He told me to speak to Corey and see what dates might be available if I got the information I needed. So it stopped because of appearances or, or did it stop because the parties decided not to pursue it? I'm so sorry, I don't understand your question. So why did the pursuit of the Trump Tower that Mr. Mr. Trump has now said, of course he pursued it because he thought he might be going back into the development business. Why was the reason that the, the deal stopped? Because he won the presidency. Okay. So in that interim period of time, you must admit it looks troubling that now that we know what foreign influence was attempting to do, whether there was collusion or not, it certainly appears troubling that you were Mr. Trump was part of this negotiation, and at the same time, what we know, perhaps separately, that the Russians were engaged in our election. Well, I don't know about them being engaged in the election. I can only talk for myself. Here I would say to Mr. Trump, um, in response to his question, what's going on with Russia, I'm still waiting for documents, and then that night at a rally, he would turn around and do his battle cry of no Russia, no collusion, no involvement, witch hunt. Okay, on, on a separate subject, but somewhat related. On January 17 of this year, the Wall Street Journal published a story stating that you hired John Gager, the owner of a consulting company who works for Liberty University in Virginia, to rig at least two online polls related to Donald Trump. Did you hire him? Those were back um, in, I believe, 2015? 2014. 2014. 2014. So you did hire him? Yes, I spoke with Mr. Gauger about manipulating these online polls. And did he use bots to manipulate the poll? He used algorithms, and if that includes bots, then the answer is yes. Yes, that's accurate. Did the president have any involvement? Yes. In directing you to do this? Yes. What were the results of the poll? Exactly where we wanted them to be. In the CNBC poll, we came in at number nine, and the Drudge Report, um, he was top of the Drudge Report as well, Okay. poll. And it's just Please understand also, the CNBC poll was called the Contenders, and it was the top 250 people that they named, and it was supposed to be the top 10 most influential people. Let me just finish with, earlier today, you directed a comment to uh, my colleagues, and I'm quoting, so I, correct me if I got this wrong. You said, the more people who follow Mr. Trump, the more people will be where I am. Is it your expectation that people in the administration will end up where you are? Sadly, if they follow blind, blindly like I have, I think the answer is yes. Thank you. Time has expired. Mr. Subi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when I ran for Congress, I talked about how Washington was broken. But I certainly did not expect the level of political gamemanship, partisanship, and sheer stagnation of policies that would improve the lives of Americans that I'm witnessing today. It is terribly disappointing to me that this committee and its chairman chose to spend our time in questioning an individual that has zero probative value and zero credibility instead of spending our limited time focusing on improving the lives of Americans, creating jobs, or streamlining the functioning of our federal government. Yet here we are, taking testimony from a convicted liar and not someone who has just lied to his clients or family or friends, but testimony from an individual who deliberately and premeditatedly lied to this body. He lied to Congress through false statements and written statements. He lied to Congress through his testimony. He then amplified his false statements by releasing and repeating his lies to the public, including the other potential witnesses. Yet now, we on this committee and the American people are expected to believe Mr. Cohen's testimony. 
I don't know a juror in America that would believe anything Mr. Cohen says given his past actions and lies. Mr. Cohen, you stood before multiple congressional committees before today and raised your right hand and swore an oath to be honest. Is that correct? That is correct. And you lied to those congressional committees. Is that correct? Previously? Correct. Yes, sir. You stated that Trump never directed you to lie to Congress. Is that correct? That's correct. Therefore, you lied to Congress on your own accord and then admitted to lying to Congress. Correct? I've, I've already stated my piece on that. I knew what he wanted me to do. I was staying on party line. But he never directed you to lie to Congress. He did not use those words, no. In your evidence that you provided this committee a mere two hours before the hearing started, were payments made to you by Mr. Trump, correct? Amongst other things, yes. Yet other than your testimony here today, there is absolutely no proof that those specific payments were for those specific purposes. Is that correct? It's my testimony that the check that I produced as part of this testimony, the 35000 and then the second check that's signed by Alan Weisselberg and Don Trump Jr. were two checks out of the 11 that were meant for the reimbursement of the hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. So in your testimony on page 13, you claim, and I quote, Mr. Trump directed me to use my own personal funds from a home equity line of credit to avoid any money being tracked back to him that could negatively impact his campaign. Do you have any proof of this direction? Just the payment, sir. So no email? Mr. Trump doesn't have email. So no recording? I do not have recordings, no. No text message? Mr. Trump doesn't text message. So no direction other than your testimony today that that's what the payment was for? And the fact that I paid on his behalf, at his direction, the money to Keith Davidson's IOLA account. You're right, there's no other, test, there's no other documentation I have. So nothing that you produce as part of your exhibits proved that President Trump directed you in any way to make that payment? I don't even know how to answer that, sir. Well, it's, it's pretty simple. There's nothing in the evidence that shows, or the exhibits that you provided today, that show that Trump directed you to make those payments. Other than the non-disclosure agreement that has been seized by government authorities and is widely shown, I don't believe there's anybody out there that believes that I just decided to pay $130,000 on his behalf. Well, you were, you were his attorney for over 10 years. That doesn't mean that I pay $130,000. Well, it doesn't also 30. mean that he wasn't paying you for representation of counsel. Okay. So how did President Trump even knew you had a HELOC? I'm so sorry, sir. How did President Trump even know you had a HELOC? Because we discussed it. Because I told him the same thing, that I didn't want my wife to find out about it. And as an, a, a, one additional, Rudy Giuliani himself came out and expressed that Mr. Trump reimbursed me for the, f for the money that was spent um, to pay Stormy Daniels. And did you tell Chris Como that you had no access to Mr. Trump during October and November of 2016? I'm sorry, I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, your interview with Chris Como. I, I, I would need to see the document. I uh, did you also know. tell Chris Como that you made these payments without telling Mr. Trump because you wanted to protect Mr. Trump? And I was protecting Mr. Trump. And you told him that you made these payments without telling him? When I said that, if that's what I said to Chris Como, yes. That was my, that was my line. And if this unsupported claim was true, then it would be part of an ongoing investigation as evidence of a crime, and the Department of Justice would not let you discuss it during your testimony here today. Is that correct? I don't know. So much time has expired. Did you answer? Yes, I, I, I did want to say one last thing. Not only did I lie to the American people, I lied to the First Lady. When the President called me and I was sitting in a car with a friend of mine, and he had me speak to her and explain to the First Lady. So the answer is there, you're, you're, not, you're not accurate. And I don't feel good about any of this. And this was not my intention. Ms. Lawrence. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to put on the record as being a black American and having endured the public comments of racism from the sitting president as being a black person, I can only imagine what's being said in private. And to prop up one member of our entire 
race of black people and say that that nullifies that is totally insulting. And in, in, in this environment of expecting a president to be inclusive and to look at his administration speaks volume. So I have some questions. I want to talk to you about this intimidation of witness. Mr. Cohen, you were initially scheduled to testify before the House Oversight Committee on February the 7th, but your legal team delayed your testimony, quoting, ongoing threats against your family from the president and attorney Giuliani. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And then on November 29th, after you admitted that the president's negotiations over a real estate project in Russia continue well through the summer before the 2016 election, President Trump called you, quote, a weak person and accused you of lying. And then on December 16th, after 18, 2018, after you disclosed that it was the president who directed you to arrange hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and Karen McDool to conceal his extramarital affairs, he called you, the president of the United States, a rat. Mr. Cohen, why do you feel or believe that the president is repeatedly attacking you? You are stating that you feel intimidated, asking us to protect you, following your cooperation with the law enforcement. When you have access to 60 plus million people that follow you on social media, and you have the ability within which to spark some action by individuals that follow, that follow him, and from his own words that he can walk down Fifth Avenue, shoot someone and get away with it, it's never comfortable when the President of the United States- What do you think he can do to you? A lot, and it's not just him. It's those people that follow him in his rhetoric. What is a lot? I don't know. I don't walk with my wife if we go to a restaurant or we go somewhere. I don't walk with my children. I make them go before me because I'm, I have fear, and it's the same fear that I had before when he initially decided to drop that tweet in my cell phone. I receive some, and I'm sure you you'll understand. Mm -hmm. I receive some tweets, I receive some uh, Facebook Messenger, all sorts of social media attacks upon me, whether it's the private direct message that I've had to turn over to Secret Service because they are the most vile, disgusting statements that anyone can ever receive and when it starts to affect your children, that's yes. when it really affects you. On January 20th, 2019, Mr. Giuliani called your father-in-law, quote, a criminal, and said that he may have ties to, to organized crime. Mr. Cohen, do you believe that the president, Mr. Giuliani, publicly targeted your father-in-law as an effort to intimidate you? Can you elaborate why is your father-in-law being pulled into this? I don't know the answer to that. My father-in-law was in the clothing business. Um, came to this country because they in the 1972-73 the expulsion of Jews from the Ukraine. He came here uh, to this country. He worked hard, and he's now enjoying his retirement. Never in my life did I think that Mr. Trump would do something so disgraceful. And he's attacking him because he knows I care about my family. And to hurt me, he's trying to hurt them. Interestingly enough, my father-in-law's biggest investments happened to be in a Trump property. So it just doesn't make any sense to me. I want to be clear, any efforts to prevent a witness from testifying in front of Congress is against the law. I want to be real clear about that. And as the chairman has said, retaliating against witnesses and threatening their families and members is a textbook mob tactic that does not benefit the president of the United States or this country. And I want to be on the record, this hearing is not about discrediting the president. It's about the awful office that we take as members of Congress to have checks and balances and to meet the laws and the policies of this country to serve. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Roy. Mr. Cohen, uh, I too want to offer my um, heartfelt thoughts for your family and what they're going through. I know it's tough and for your time here today, I know it's tough for you to stand here in front of this committee. 
The chairman suggested you volunteered to come here. You testified that you were asked to come here. Is it correct you were asked to come here, yes or no? Yes. The combined total of the crimes for which you were sentenced would bring a maximum of 70 years, yes or no? Yes. Yet you are going to prison for three years, yes or no? Yes. The prosecutors of the Southern District of New York say to secure loans, Cohen falsely understated the amount of debt he was carrying and omitted information from his personal financial statements to induce a bank to lend on incomplete information. You told my colleague here today that you did not commit bank fraud. Not parsing different statutes, which I understand could be, I want for clarity, are you or are you not guilty of making false statements to a financial institution, yes or no? Yes, I pled guilty. You said clearly to Mr. Cloud and Mr. Jordan that the Southern District of New York lawyers were being untruthful in characterizing your desire to work in the administration. Do you say again that the lawyers of the Southern District of New York are being untruthful in making that characterization, yes or no? I'm saying that's not accurate. Okay, so you're saying they're being untruthful. I didn't, I'm not using the word untruthful. That's yours. I'm saying that that's not accurate. I did not want a role or a title in the administration. I'm sure the lawyers... I got the title that I wanted. I'm sure the lawyers of the SDNY appreciate that distinction. Question, you testified today you have never been to Prague and have never been to the Czech Republic. Do you stand behind that statement? Yes, I do. I offer into the record an article uh, in known conservative news magazine, Mother Jones, by David Korn, in which he says he reviewed his notes from a phone call with Mr. Cohen that Mr. Cohen said, quote, I haven't been to Prague in 14 years. I was in Prague for one afternoon 14 years ago, end quote. Question, you, as my friend Mr. Armstrong rightly inquired, offered to the committee taped information involving clients with the bat of an eye. Do you stand behind that, yes or no? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't understand I don't what you said so fast. You, as my friend Mr. Armstrong rightly inquired, offered to this committee taped information involving your clients with the bat of an eye. Do you stand behind that offer? If the chairman asks me, and it's, I'll take it under advisement now, and it's not a problem in terms of attorney-client privilege, yes, I will turn it over. You, as my friend Mr. Meadows pointed out, misled this committee even today in a written submission that contradicted your testimony. You have suggested you are going to review that. Did you review, are you going to review it in our next break to correct the record, yes or no? Yes. Question, you helped out the president's campaign or were involved in the campaign as a representative, as a spokesman, even in your words today. It was your idea for the campaign dating back to 2011. Is that accurate, yes or no? Yes. 2011 is a year that sticks in my head, for it's the year my daughter was born and it was the year I was diagnosed with cancer. I was not then pushing for Donald Trump to be president. I was fighting cancer. Even in 2016, I was publicly backing a certain Republican from Texas. Some might guess who it was. But you, you were all in. And you either wanted Donald Trump to be your president because it would be good for the country or you did it for your own personal advancement or both. So sort of the two options. Real Americans in my district and across the country wanted the president to be president not in any way because he's perfect, but rather because they are sick and tired of this hellhole. They supported the president because they are sick and tired of the games that we are seeing here today. They are sick and tired of politicians who refuse to secure the border, balance our budget, restore health care freedom, and then get the hell out of their way so they can lead their life. They are mystified that we amass about $100 million of debt per hour, which means we've blown through $300, $400, $450 million during this charade in amassing debt. $450 million. They're sick and tired of a Democrat party that willfully ignores cartel-driven asylum crisis on our border that endangers American citizens and the migrants who seek to come here. Just yesterday in Eagle Pass, Texas, Border Patrol agents arrested an MS-13 gang member. In McAllen, Texas, federal authorities are offering a reward for a man to Mexico, tied to Mexico's Gulf Cartel for his alleged roles in various murders, kidnappings, and home invasions in South Texas. A mass Honduran migrant rush at the Texas border, Texas border forced brief closure of the Laredo port. This is this week. This is what we're ignoring. This is not what we're doing for the American people while we engage in this charade. This is not what the American people sent us here to do. This is an embarrassment for our country. I talked to my beautiful wife back in Dripping Springs, Texas, just before the hearing. I said, don't bother, I said, don't bother watching. She said, as I roughly expected, don't worry, I won't. I have more important things to do. And she, like the rest of the American people, have a hell of a lot more important things to do than to watch this. I said, amen, darling. I can't help but think that, that is what the majority of the American people are thinking while watching this unbelievable circus. I yield back. Ms. Blaskett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a lot to do as well. 
Um, I've got houses and schools to help rebuild in the Virgin Islands, expansion of voting rights, educational opportunities, criminal justice reform. Thank God the Democratic majority can walk and chew gum at the same time. So we're here with you right now. Um, Mr. Cohen, you learned well in the 10 years that you worked with Donald Trump. What was your position with the GOP in the up to eight months ago? I was vice chair of the RNC Finance Committee. You were vice chair of the finance of the Republican National Committee, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I do want to say I was a Democrat until Steve Wynn found out I was a Democrat and made me switch parties. That would be said a smart thing right to do. it wasn't right for the Democrat to be the vice chair. Good. Let's get to it. I, I only, only have a little bit of time. On behalf of the many members uh, here who have expressed to your family uh, our apologies to your family, but I want to apologize for the inappropriate comments and tweets that have been made by other members of this uh, body. Um, and as a former prosecutor and as former counsel on House ethics, I think that at the very least there should be a referral to the Ethics Committee of witness intimidation or tampering under USC 1512 of my uh, colleague Matt Gates, and it may be possibly him being referred for a criminal prosecution. So I want to put that on the record. On May 2nd, 2018, the President's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who was his personal attorney like you, appeared on Fox News and referred to the President's reimbursement to you for the 130 payment for Stephanie Clifford as part of a retainer. And on May 3rd, 2018, one day after Mr. Giuliani's appearance, the President tweeted, and I quote, Mr. Cohen, an attorney, received a monthly retainer not from the campaign and having nothing to do with the campaign from which he entered into through reimbursement, a private contract between two parties known as a non-disclosure agreement, or NDA. The Office of Government Ethics, which is the agency which the federal government with responsibility over what the president needs to report publicly about his assets, was puzzled by this, it seems, and they were skeptical that a retainer was actually in place and asked to see the retainer agreement on call uh, of May 8th with the president. The president's personal counsel, Sherry Dillon, replied that she would, and I quote, not permit OGE staff to read the agreement because it is privileged. Ms. Dillon would not even let OGE staff come to her office to review the retainer agreement. Mr. Cohen, in a court filing made in August of last year, federal prosecutors stated that, quote, in truth and in fact, there was no such retainer agreement. Mr. Cohen, did you ever have a retainer agreement in place with the president for the payment to Ms. Clifford? No. So was Mr. Uh, Giuliani's statement inaccurate? Yes. Was Ms. Dillon's statement about the retainer agreement inaccurate? I'm sorry, Ms. Dillon's statement is? About the retainer agreement. Is it inaccurate? And her, sta her statement is what? And her statement to them was, quote, uh, not to permit OGE staff to read the agreement because it is privileged. There was no agreement. And is the president's tweet or his statement accurate? And, I'm sorry, one more time. And his statement was, Mr. Cohen, an attorney, received a monthly retainer, not from the campaign and having nothing to do with the campaign, from which he entered in through, through a reimbursement. That's not accurate. Um, you've mentioned some individuals to my colleague from New York, Ms. Connolly, and also in your testimony uh, about Mr. Uh, Weisenberg and other individuals, Ms. Rona. Who are those individuals? Uh, are they with the Trump Organization? They and are. Are there other people that we should be meeting with? So. Alan Weisselberg is the chief financial officer. Uh huh. The you got to quickly give us as many names as you can so we can get to them. Yes, ma'am. As uh, Ms. Rona, what is Ms. Rona's position? Rona Graff is the, Mr. Trump's executive assistant. And would she be able to corroborate many of the statements that you've made here? Yes, she was, her office is directly next to his, and she's involved in a lot um, that went on. Okay, Mr. Cohen, when the president's lawyers were having the discussions, with the Office of Government Ethics in 2018. Did they reach out to you to talk with you about these payments? No, ma'am. And what did you, did you share anything with them otherwise in any other conversation? I do, I do not recall, no. Can the committee obtain more information about these facts by attaining testimony and documents from the White House, the Trump Organization, and the President's attorneys? I believe so. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that those are the individuals that we should be speaking with. Um, and I yield back at this time. The committee will now stand in recess again. We will come back. Listen up, 30, 35 minutes, 35 minutes after the last vote begins. So uh, for Mr. Cohen, Mr. Cohen, 
We're talking about probably about an hour, about an hour or so. All right. So much. The House Oversight and Reform Committee taking a break here. It'll probably be uh, an hour or so. There's a series of votes on the House floor, a series of four votes, and you can follow that over on C-SPAN. We'll resume with live coverage when the committee gavels back in, which, again, should be about uh, about uh, an hour or so. They've been in session for four and a half hours. Michael Cohen testifying on the uh, 2016 campaign and his relationship with President Donald Trump. It's the second of three hearings this week with uh, Michael Cohen. As our Capitol Hill producer, Craig Kaplan, points out, he's testified yesterday in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee behind closed doors and tomorrow behind closed doors before the House Intelligence Committee on the Russia investigation. Again, we'll be back with live coverage once the committee gavels back in. And until then, we'll show you the opening this morning of the question, the Q&A, the questions and responses, starting with the chairman, uh, Congressman Cummings.
If you would please rise and I will begin to swear you in. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative, and thank you, and you may be seated. The microphones are sensitive, so please speak directly into them. Without objection, your written statement will be made a part of the record. And with that, Mr. Cohen, you are now recognized to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Is your mic on? Yes. Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I have asked this committee to ensure that my family be protected from presidential threats and that the committee be sensitive to the questions pertaining to ongoing investigations. I thank you for your help and for your understanding. I am here under oath to correct the record, to answer the committee's questions truthfully, and to offer the American people what I know about President Trump. I recognize that some of you may doubt and attack me on my credibility. It is for this reason that I have incorporated into this opening statement documents that are irrefutable and demonstrate that the information you will hear is accurate and truthful. Never in a million years did I imagine when I accepted a job in 2007 to work for Donald Trump that he would one day run for the presidency to launch a campaign on a platform of hate and intolerance and actively win. I regret the day I said yes to Mr. Trump I regret all the help and support I gave him along the way. I am ashamed of my own failings and publicly accepted responsibility for them by pleading guilty in the Southern District of New York. I am ashamed of my weakness and my misplaced loyalty of the things I did for Mr. Trump in an effort to protect and promote him. I am ashamed that I chose to take part in concealing Mr. Trump's illicit acts rather than listening to my own conscience. I am ashamed because I know what Mr. Trump is. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. He was a presidential candidate who knew that Roger Stone was talking with Julian Assange about a WikiLeaks drop on the Democratic National Committee emails. And I will explain each in a few moments. I am providing the committee today with several documents, and these include a copy of a check Mr. Trump wrote from his personal bank account after he became president to reimburse me for the hush money payments I made to cover up his affair with an adult film star and to prevent damage to his campaign. Copies of financial statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013 that he gave to such institutions such as Deutsche Bank. A copy of an article with Mr. Trump's handwriting on it that reported on the auction of a portrait of himself that he arranged for the bidder ahead of time and then reimbursed the bidder from the account of his nonprofit charitable foundation with the picture now hanging in one of his country clubs. And copies of letters I wrote at Mr. Trump's direction that threatened his high school, colleges, and the college board not to release his grades or SAT scores. I hope my appearance here today, my guilty plea, and my work with law enforcement agencies are steps along a path of redemption that will restore faith in me and help this country understand our president better. 
And before going further, I want to apologize to each member, to you as Congress as a whole. The last time I appeared before Congress, I came to protect Mr. Trump. Today, I am here to tell the truth about Mr. Trump. I lied to Congress when Mr. Trump stopped negotiating the Moscow Tower project in Russia. I stated that we stopped negotiating in January of 2016. That was false. Our negotiations continued for months later during the campaign. Mr. Trump did not directly tell me to lie to Congress. That's not how he operates. In conversations we had during the campaign, at the same time I was actively negotiating in Russia for him, he would look me in the eye and tell me there's no Russian business and then go on to lie to the American people by saying the same thing. In his way, he was telling me to lie. There were at least a half a dozen times between the Iowa caucus in January of 2016 and the end of June when he would ask me, how's it going in Russia, referring to the Moscow Tower project. You need to know that Mr. Trump's personal lawyers reviewed and edited my statement to Congress about the timing of the Moscow Tower negotiations before I gave it. So to be clear, Mr. Trump knew of and directed the Trump-Moscow negotiations throughout the campaign and lied about it. He lied about it because he never expected to win. He also lied about it because he stood to make hundreds of millions of dollars on the Moscow real estate project. And so I lied about it too. Because Mr. Trump had made clear to me, through his personal statements to me, that we both knew to be false, and through his lies to the country, that he wanted me to lie. And he made it clear to me because his personal attorneys reviewed my statement before I gave it to Congress. Over the past two years, I have been smeared as a rat by the President of the United States. The truth is much different. And let me take a brief moment to introduce myself. My name is Michael Dean Cohen. And I am a blessed husband of 24 years and a father to an incredible daughter and son. When I married my wife, I promised her that I would love her, I would cherish her, and I would protect her. As my father said countless times throughout my childhood, you, my wife, and you, my children, are the air that I breathe. So to my Laura, and to my Sammy, and to my Jake, there's nothing I wouldn't do to protect you. I have always tried to live a life of loyalty, friendship, generosity, and compassion. Those qualities my parents ingrained in my siblings in me since childhood. My father survived the Holocaust, thanks to the compassion and selfless acts of others. He was helped by many who put themselves in harm's way to do what they knew was right. And that is why my first instinct has always been to help those in need. And mom and dad, I am sorry I let you down. As the many people that know me best would say, I am the person that they call at 3 a.m. if they needed help. And I proudly remember being the emergency contact for many of my children's friends when they were growing up because their parents knew that I would drop everything and care for them as if they were my own. Yet last fall, I pled guilty in federal court to felonies for the benefit of, at the direction of, and in coordination with individual number one. And for the record, individual number one is President Donald J. Trump. It is painful to admit that I was motivated by ambition at times. 
it is even more painful to admit that many times I ignored my conscience and acted loyal to a man when I should not have. Sitting here today, it seems unbelievable that I was so mesmerized by Donald Trump that I was willing to do things for him that I knew were absolutely wrong. For that reason, I have come here to apologize to my family, to my government, and to the American people. Accordingly, let me now tell you about Mr. Trump. I got to know him very well, working very closely with him for more than 10 years as his executive vice president and special counsel, and then as personal attorney when he became president. When I first met Mr. Trump, he was a successful entrepreneur, a real estate giant, and an icon. Being around Mr. Trump was intoxicating when you were in his presence, you felt like you were involved in something greater than yourself, that you were somehow changing the world. I wound up touting the Trump narrative for over a decade. That was my job. Always stay on message. Always defend. It monopolized my life. At first, I worked mostly on real estate developments and other business transactions. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Trump brought me into his personal life and private dealings. Over time, I saw his true character revealed. Mr. Trump is an enigma. He is complicated, as am I. He is both good and bad, as do we all. But the bad far outweighs the good. And since taking office, he has become the worst version of himself. He is capable of behaving kindly, but he is not kind. He is capable of committing acts of generosity, but he is not generous. He is capable of being loyal, but he is fundamentally disloyal. Donald Trump is a man who ran for office to make his brand great, not to make our country great. He had no desire or intention to lead this nation only to market himself and to build his wealth and power. Mr. Trump would often say, this campaign was going to be the greatest infomercial in political history. He never expected to win the primary. He never expected to win the general election. The campaign, for him, was always a marketing opportunity. I knew early on in my work for Mr. Trump that he would direct me to lie to further his business interests. And I am ashamed to say that when it was for a real estate mogul in the private sector, I considered it trivial. As the president, I consider it significant and dangerous. But in the mix, lying for Mr. Trump was normalized and no one around him questioned it. In fairness, no one around him today questions it either. A lot of people have asked me about whether Mr. Trump knew about the release of the hacked documents, Democratic National Committee email, ahead of time. And the answer is yes. As I earlier stated, Mr. Trump knew from Roger Stone in advance about the WikiLeaks drop of emails. In July of 2016, days before the Democratic Convention. I was in Mr. Trump's office when his secretary announced that Roger Stone was on the phone. Mr. Trump put Mr. Stone on the speakerphone. Mr. Stone told Mr. Trump that he had just gotten off the phone with Julian Assange and that Mr. Assange told Mr. Stone that within a couple of days, there would be a massive dump of emails that would damage Hillary Clinton's campaign. Mr. Trump responded by stating to the effect, wouldn't that be great? Mr. Trump is a racist. The country has seen Mr. Trump court white supremacists and bigots. You have heard him call poorer countries shitholes. His private, in private, he is even worse. He once asked me if I could name a country run by a black person that wasn't a shithole. 
This was when Barack Obama was president of the United States. And while we were once driving through a struggling neighborhood in Chicago, he commented that only black people could live that way. And he told me that black people would never vote for him because they were too stupid. And yet, I continue to work for him. Mr. Trump is a cheat. As previously stated, I am giving to the committee today three years of Mr. Trump's personal financial statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013, which he gave to Deutsche Bank to inquire about a loan to buy the Buffalo Bills and to Forbes. These are exhibits 1A, 1B, and 1C to my testimony. It was my experience that Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes, such as trying to be listed amongst the wealthiest people in Forbes and deflated his assets to reduce his real estate taxes. I'm sharing with you two newspaper articles side by side that are examples of Mr. Trump inflating and deflating his assets, as I said, to suit his financial interests. These are exhibit two to my testimony. As I noted, I'm giving the committee today an article he wrote on and sent to me that reported on an auction of a portrait of Mr. Trump. This is exhibit 3A to my testimony. Mr. Trump directed me to find a straw bidder to purchase a portrait of him that was being auctioned off at an Art Hamptons event. The objective was to ensure that this portrait, which was going to be auctioned last, would go for the highest price of any portrait that afternoon. The portrait was purchased by the fake bidder for $60,000. Mr. Trump directed the Trump Foundation, which is supposed to be a charitable organization, to repay the fake bidder, despite keeping the art for himself. And please see Exhibit 3B to my testimony. And it should come as no surprise that one of my more common responsibilities was that Mr. Trump directed me to call business owners, many of whom are small businesses that were owed money for their services, and told them that no payment or a reduced payment would be coming. When I asked Mr. Trump, or when I told Mr. Trump of my success, he actually reveled in it. And yet, I continued to work for him. Mr. Trump is a con man. He asked me to pay off an adult film star with whom he had an affair and to lie about it to his wife, which I did. And lying to the First Lady is one of my biggest regrets because she is a kind, good person, and I respect her greatly, and she did not deserve that. And I'm giving the committee today a copy of the $130,000 wire transfer from me to Ms. Clifford's attorney during the closing days of the presidential campaign that was demanded by Ms. Clifford to maintain her silence about her affair with Mr. Trump. And this is exhibit four to my testimony. Mr. Trump directed me to use my own personal funds from a home equity line of credit to avoid any money being traced back to him that could negatively impact his campaign. And I did that too, without bothering to consider whether that was improper, much less whether it was the right thing to do or how would it impact me, my family, or the public. And I am going to jail in part because of my decision to help Mr. Trump hide that payment from the American people before they voted a few days later. As Exhibit 5A to my testimony shows, I am providing a copy of a $35,000 check that President Trump personally signed from his personal bank account on August 1st of 2017. When he was President of the United States, 
pursuant to the cover-up, which was the basis of my guilty plea, to reimburse me, the word used by Mr. Trump's TV lawyer, for the illegal hush money I paid on his behalf. This $35,000 check was one of 11 check installments that was paid throughout the year while he was president. Other checks to reimburse me for the hush money payments were signed by Donald Trump Jr. and Alan Weisselberg. And see for exa that for example, 5B. The President of the United States thus wrote a personal check for the payment of hush money as part of a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws. And you can find the details of that scheme directed by Mr. Trump in the pleadings in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. So picture this scene. In February of 2017, one month into his presidency, I'm visiting President Trump in the Oval Office for the first time, and it's truly awe-inspiring. He's showing me all around and pointing to different paintings, and he says to me something to the effect of, don't worry, Michael, your January and February reimbursement checks are coming. They were FedExed from New York, and it takes a while for that to get through the White House system. As he promised, I received the first check for the reimbursement of $70,000 not long thereafter. When I say con man, I'm talking about a man who declares himself brilliant, but directed me to threaten his high school, his colleges, and the college board to never release his grades or SAT scores. As I mentioned, I'm giving the committee today copies of a letter I sent at Mr. Trump's direction threatening these schools with civil and criminal actions if Mr. Trump's grades or SAT scores were ever disclosed without his permission. And these are under Exhibit C, uh, 6. The irony wasn't lost on me at the time that Mr. Trump, in 2011, had strongly criticized President Obama for not releasing his grades. As you can see in Exhibit 7, Mr. Trump declared, let him show his records after calling President Obama a terrible student. The sad fact is that I never heard Mr. Trump say anything in private that led me to believe he loved our nation or wanted to make it better. In fact, he did the opposite when telling me in 2008 or 2009 that he was cutting employees' salaries in half, including mine. He showed me what he claimed was a $10 million IRS tax refund. And he said that he could not believe how stupid the government was for giving someone like him that much money back. During the campaign, Mr. Trump said that he did not consider Vietnam veteran and prisoner of war, Senator John McCain, to be a hero because he likes people who weren't captured. At the same time, Mr. Trump tasked me to handle the negative press surrounding his medical deferment from the Vietnam draft. Mr. Trump claimed it was because of a bone spur, but when I asked for medical records, he gave me none and said that there was no surgery. He told me not to answer the specific questions by reporters, but rather offer simply the fact that he received a medical deferment. He finished the conversation with the following comment, you think I'm stupid? I'm not going to Vietnam. And I find it ironic, Mr. President, that you are in Vietnam right now. And yet, I continue to work for him. Questions have been raised about whether I know of direct evidence that Mr. Trump or his campaign colluded with Russia. I do not. And I want to be clear. But I have my suspicions. Sometime in the summer of 2017, I read all over the media 
that there had been a meeting in Trump Tower in June of 2016 involving Don Jr. and others from the campaign with Russians, including a representative of the Russian government, and an email setting up the meeting with the subject line, dirt on Hillary Clinton. And something clicked in my mind. I remember being in a room with Mr. Trump, probably in early June of 2016, when something peculiar happened. Don Trump Jr. came into the room and walked behind his father's desk, which in and of itself was unusual. People didn't just walk behind Mr. Trump's desk to talk to him. And I recall Don Jr. Leave, leaning over to his father and speaking in a low voice, which I could clearly hear, and saying, the meeting is all set. And I remember Mr. Trump saying, Okay, good, let me know. What struck me as I looked back and thought about the exchange between Don Jr. and his father was first, that Mr. Trump had frequently told me and others that his son Don Jr. had the worst judgment of anyone in the world. And also that Don Jr. would never set up any meeting of significance alone and certainly not without checking with his father. I also knew that nothing went on in Trump world, especially the campaign, without Mr. Trump's knowledge and approval. So I concluded that Don Jr. was referring to that June 2016 Trump Tower meeting about dirt on Hillary with the Russian representatives when he walked behind his dad's desk that day and that Mr. Trump knew that was the meeting Don Jr. was talking about when he said, that's good, let me know. Over the past year or so, I have done some real soul searching, and I see now that my ambition and the intoxication of Trump power had much to do with the bad decisions in part that I made. And to you, Chairman Cummings and Ranking Member Jordan, and the other members of this committee, and the members of the House and Senate, I am sorry for my lies and for lying to Congress. And to our nation, I am sorry for actively working to hide from you the truth about Mr. Trump when you needed it most. For those who question my motives for being here today, I understand. I have lied, but I am not a liar. And I have done bad things, but I am not a bad man. I have fixed things, but I am no longer your fixer, Mr. Trump. And I am going to prison and have shattered the safety and security that I tried so hard to provide for my family. My testimony certainly does not diminish the pain that I have caused my family and my friends. Nothing can do that. And I have never asked for, nor would I accept, a pardon from President Trump. And by coming today, I have caused my family to be the target of personal, scurrilous attacks by the President and his lawyer, trying to intimidate me from appearing before this panel. Mr. Trump called me a rat for choosing to tell the truth, much like a mobster would do when one of his men decides to cooperate with the government. And as Exhibit 8 shows, I have provided the committee with copies of tweets that Mr. Trump posted, attacking me and my family. And only someone burying his head in the sand would not recognize them for what they are. It's encouragement to someone to do harm to me and my family. And I never imagined that he would engage in vicious, false attacks on my family and unleash his TV lawyer to do the same. And I hope this committee and all members of Congress on both sides of the aisle make it clear that as a nation, we should not tolerate attempts to intimidate witnesses before Congress and attacks on family are out of bounds and not acceptable. And I wish to especially thank Speaker Pelosi for her statements, and it's Exhibit 9, 
to protect this institution and me and the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Adam Schiff, and you, Chairman Cummings, for likewise defending the institution and my family against the attacks by Mr. Trump, and also the many Republicans who have admonished the President as well. I am not a perfect man. I have done things I am not proud of, and I will live with the consequences of my actions for the rest of my life. But today, I get to decide the example that I set for my children and how I attempt to change how history will remember me. I may not be able to change the past, but I can do right by the American people here today. And I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer the committee's questions. Uh, Mr. Cohen, before I start, I want to make sure you really understand something. You have admitted lying to Congress, to this very body, and now you're going to prison for it. Do you, Mr. Cohen, recognize the gravity of your offenses? You are a lawyer, right? As of yesterday, I am no longer a lawyer. I have lost my law license amongst other things. But you understand the gravity of this moment. I most certainly do, Mr. Chairman. I want you to really hear this, Mr. Cohen. We will not tolerate lying to this Congress by anybody. We're in search of the truth. Do you understand that? I do. Now, the President has also made numerous statements that turned out to be inaccurate. For example, he said he knew nothing about the hush money payments to Ms. Clifford. And his 2017 financial disclosure form said he never owed money to reimburse you for those payments. Yet, in your testimony, Mr. Cohen, you said that you met with the President in the Oval Office in February of 2017 and discussed his plans to reimburse you for money you paid. You say he told you, and I quote, don't worry, Michael, your January and February reimbursement checks are coming. Is that accurate? And was that in the Oval Office? The statement is accurate, but the discussions regarding the reimbursement occurred long before he became president. Would you explain that? Back in 2017, when, uh, actually I apologize, in 2016, prior to the election, I was contacted by Keith Davidson, who is the attorney, or was the attorney for Ms. Clifford, for Stormy Daniels. And after several rounds of conversations with him about purchasing her life rights, for $130,000. What I did each and every time is go straight into Mr. Trump's office and discuss the issue with him. When it was ultimately determined, and this was days before the election, that Mr. Trump was going to pay the $130,000. In the office with me was Alan Weisselberg, the chief financial officer of the Trump Organization he acknowledged to Alan that he was going to pay the 130000 and that Alan and I should go back to his office and figure out how to do it. So, yes, sir, I stand by the statement that I gave, but there was a history to it. In your testimony, uh, you, have, you said you bought some, some checks. Is that right? You said you bought some checks. Yes, sir. Let me ask you about one of these. Um, this uh, from the Trump Trust that holds the uh, president businesses. Can you tell me who signed uh, this check? I believe that the top signature is Donald Trump Jr. And, and the bottom signature, uh, I believe, is Alan Weisselberg's. And can you tell me the date of that check? March 17th of 2017. 
Now, wait, wait a minute, hold up. The date on the check is after President Trump held his big press conference claiming that he gave up control of his businesses. How could the President have arranged for you to get this check if he was supposedly playing no role in his business? Because the payments were designed to be paid over the course of 12 months, and it was declared to be a retainer for services um, that would be provided for the year of 2017. Was there a retainer agreement? There is no retainer agreement. Would Don Jr. or Mr. Weisselberg have more information about that? Mr. Weisselberg, for sure, about the entire discussions and negotiations prior to the election, and Don Jr. would have cursory information. Now, here's another one. This, uh, this one appears to be signed by Donald Trump himself. Is that his signature? That is Donald Trump's signature. So let me make sure I understand. Donald Trump wrote you a check out of his personal account while he was serving as President of the United States of America to reimburse you for hush money payments to Ms. Clifford. Is that what you are telling the American people today? Yes, Mr. Chairman. One final question. The President claimed he knew nothing about these payments. His ethics filing said he owed nothing to you. Based on your conversations with him, is there any doubt in your mind that President Trump knew exactly what he was paying for? There is no doubt in my mind, and I truly believe there is no doubt in the mind of the people of the United States of America. And these new documents appear to corroborate what you just told us. With that, I'll yield to I will make sure that you and I meet one day while we're in the courthouse, and I will take you for every penny you still don't have, and I will come after your daily beast and everybody else that you possibly know. So I'm warning you, tread very effing lightly, because what I'm going to do to you is going to be effing disgusting. You understand me. Mr. Cohen, who said that? I did. And did you say that, Mr. Cohen, uh, in your testimony on page two? <laughs> You said you did things for Mr. Trump in an effort to protect him. Was that statement that I just read that you admitted to saying, did you do that to protect Donald Trump? I did it to protect Mr. Trump, Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka Trump, and Eric Trump. And in your sentencing statement back in December in front of the judge, you said this, Mr. Cohen, my weakness can be characterized as a blind loyalty to Donald Trump a blind loyalty that led me to choose a path of darkness. Is that accurate, Mr. Cohen? I wrote that. You wrote that and said that in front of the judge. Is that right? That's correct. Let me read a few other things here, and let me ask you why you did some of these things. When you filed a false tax return in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016, was all that out of blind loyalty to the president? No, it was not. When you failed to report $4 million in income to the Internal Revenue Service, did you do that to protect Donald Trump? No, I did not. And when you failed to pay $1.4 million in taxes, I got constituents who don't make that in a lifetime. When you failed to pay $1.4 million in taxes to the U.S. Treasury, was that out of some blind loyalty to the President of the United States? It was not, but the number was 1.38 and change, and I have paid that money back to the IRS I at this the, time. I think the American people will appreciate that 1.38. And, and I would also just like to say it was over a course of five years, approximately 260000 a year. Yeah, and that's what I said, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2000, that's five years. Yes. Got it. When you made false statements to financial institutions concerning a home equity line of credit, taxi medallions and your Park Avenue apartment in 2013, 2014, and 2015, and you pled guilty to making those false statements to those banks, was that all done to protect the President? No, it was not. How about this one? 
when you created the fake Twitter account, Women for Cohen, and paid a firm to post tweets like this one. In a world of lies, deception, and fraud, we appreciate this honest guy, at Michael Cohen, hashtag TGIF, hashtag handsome, hashtag sexy. Was that done to protect the president? Yeah, Mr. Jordan, I didn't actually set that up. It was done by a young lady that worked for Red Finch. And during the course of the campaign, which you would know gets somewhat crazy and wild, we were having fun. That's what it was, sir. We were having fun. Was it done to protect the president? That was not done to protect the president. Was it a fake Twitter account? That was, no, that was a real Twitter account. It Did exists. You pay a firm to create this Twitter I didn't account pay the firm to do Cohen. that. It was done by a young lady that works for the firm. And again, sir, we were having fun during a stressful time. The point is, Mr. Cohen, did you lie to protect the president or did you lie to help yourself? I'm not sure how that helped me, sir. I'm not sure how it did either. Right. And the I would like to I also note that more than half the people and, and on that site point. are men. Here's the point. The chairman just gave you a 30-minute opening statement, and you have a history of lying over and over and over again. And frankly, you don't have to take my word for it. Take what the court said. Take what the Southern District of New York said. Cohen did crimes that were marked by a pattern of deception and that permeated his professional life. These crimes were distinct in their harms but bear a common set of circumstances. They each involved deception and were each, each motivated by personal greed and ambition. A pattern of deception for personal greed and ambition and you just got 30 minutes of an opening statement where you trashed the President of the United States of America. Mr. Cohen, how long did how long did you work for Donald Trump? Approximately a decade. Ten years? That's correct. And you said all these bad things about the president there in that last 30 minutes, and yet you worked for him for 10 years? All those bad things, I mean, if it's that bad, I can see you working for him for 10 days, maybe 10 weeks, maybe even 10 months. But you worked for him for 10 years. Mr. Cohen, how, how long did you... Uh, how long did you work in the White House? I never worked in the White House. And that's the point, isn't it, Mr. Cohen? No, sir. Yes, it is. No, it's not, sir. You wanted to work in the White House. No, you sir. You didn't get brought to the dance. Sir. And now? I was extremely proud to be personal attorney to the President of the United States of America. I did not want to go to the White House. I was offered jobs. I can tell you a story of Mr. Trump reaming out Reince Priebus because I had not taken a job where Mr. Trump wanted me to, which is working with Don McGahn at the White House General Counsel's Office. Mr. Cohen, office. you work for the sir, president. Sir, one, one second. All right. What I said at the time, and I brought a lawyer in who produced a memo as to why I should not go in because there would be no attorney-client privilege. And in order to handle Mr. some Cohen? of the matters that I talked about in my opening, that it would be best suited for me not to go in and that every president had a personal Cohen, here's attorney. What I see. Here's what I see. I see a guy who worked for 10 years and is here trashing the guy he worked for for 10 years, didn't get a job in the White House, and now, and now you're, you're behaving just like everyone else who's got fired or didn't get the job they wanted, like Andy McCabe, like James Comey, same kind of selfish motivation after you don't get the thing you want. That's what I see here today, and I think that's what the American people Mr. See. Jordan, all I wanted was what I got to be personal attorney to the president, to enjoy the senior You're year of my form, son in high school and waiting for my daughter who's graduating from college to come back to New York. I got exactly what I want. Gentlemen, stop. Exactly what you want? What you I want wanted, prison that's right. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I received exactly what I wanted. Gentlemen, time has expired. Ms. Washington Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, thank you for being here today. As you likely know, I served as the chair of the Democratic National Committee at the time of the Russian hacks and when Russia weaponized the messages that it had stolen. But I want to be clear. My questions are not about the harm done to any individual by WikiLeaks and the Russians. It's about the possible and likely harm to the United States of America and our democracy. I have a series of questions that I hope will connect more of these dots. Mr. Cohen, is it your testimony that Mr. Trump had advanced knowledge of the Russia WikiLeaks release of the DNC's emails? 
it's, um, it's a, I, can't, I cannot answer that in a yes or no. He had advanced notice that there was going to be a dump of emails, but at no time did I hear the specificity of what those emails were going to be. But you do testify today that he had advanced knowledge of their, of their imminent release. That, that is what I had stated that, in my testimony. And that he cheered that outcome? Yes, ma'am. Did Mr. Trump likely share this information with his daughter Ivanka, son Don Jr., or Jared Kushner? I'm not aware of that. Was Ivanka, Jared, or Don Jr. still involved in the, in the Russian Tower deal at that time? The company was involved in the deal, which meant that the family was involved in the deal. If Mr. Trump and his daughter Ivanka and son Don, Donald Jr. are involved in the, rump, in, the, in the Russian Trump Tower deal, is it possible the whole family is conflicted or compromised with a foreign adversary in the months before the election? Yes. Based on your experience with the president and knowledge of his relationship with Mr. Stone, do you have reason to believe that the president explicitly or implicitly authorized Mr. Stone to make contact with WikiLeaks and to indicate the campaign's interest in the strategic release of these illegal materials? I'm not aware of that. Was Mr. Stone a free agent reporting back to the president what he had done, or was he an agent of the campaign acting on behalf of the president and with his apparent authority? No, he was a free agent. A free agent that was reporting back to the president what he had done. Correct. He frequently reached out to Mr. Trump, and Mr. Trump was very happy to take his calls. It was free service. Hmm. Roger Stone says he never spoke with Mr. Trump about WikiLeaks. How can we corrob corroborate what you are saying? I don't know, but I suspect that the special counsel's office and other um, government agencies have the information that you're seeking. Moving on to a little later in 2016, a major WikiLeaks dump happens hours after the Access Hollywood tape is released. Do you believe or are you aware of Mr. Trump coordinating or signaling for this email dump? I am unaware of that. I actually was not even in the country at the time of the Billy Bush um, tape. I was in London visiting my daughter. Knowing how Mr. Trump operates with his winning at all costs mentality, do you believe that he would cooperate or collude with a foreign power to win the presidency? Is he capable of that? calls on so much speculation, ma'am. It would be unfair for me to I understand, but you have a that. tremendous amount of experience. Given Mr. Trump today. is all about winning. And and he will your, do what is necessary and in within your which to opinion win. And experience, would he have the potential to cooperate or collude with a foreign power to win the presidency at all costs? Yes. Based on what you know, would Mr. Trump or did he lie about colluding and coordinating with the Russians at any point during the campaign? So as I stated in my testimony, um, I wouldn't use the word colluding. Um, was there something odd about the back and forth praise with President Putin? Yes but I'm not really sure that I can answer that question um, in terms of collusion. I was not part of the campaign. Um, I don't know the other conversations that Mr. Trump had with other individuals. There's just so many dots that all seem to lead to the same direction. And finally, before my time expires, Mr. Cohen, the campaign and the entire Trump organization appeared to be filthy with Russian contact. There are Russian business contacts. There are campaign Russia, Russian contacts. There are lies about all of those contacts. And then we have Roger Stone informing the president just before the Democratic National Convention that, these, that WikiLeaks was going to drop documents in the public arena that we knew at that point were hacked and stolen by Russia from the Democratic National Committee. The gentle lady's time has expired. You may answer her inquiry. My, my question is, Quickly. given all those connections, is it likely that Donald Trump was fully aware and had every intent 
of working with Russia to help make sure that he could win the presidency at all costs. Okay. So let, let me say that this is a matter that's currently being handled by the House Select and the Senate Select Intelligence Committees, and so I would rather not answer that sp specific question other than just to tell you that Mr. Trump's desire to win would f have him work with anyone. And one other thing that I had said uh, in my statement is that when it came to the Trump Tower Moscow um, project, it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and we never expected to win the election. So this was just business as usual. Right. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. This is great of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Jordan. The chairman in this committee have promised members of the American people a fair and open process. Yet the Democrats have vastly limited the scope of this hearing. They've issued a gag order to try to tell members of this committee what we can and cannot talk about. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle claim that they want the truth, that they want transparency and fair oversight. Yet the Democrats, witness to testify before Congress today, is none other than a scorned man who's going to prison for lying to Congress. Let that sink in. He's going to prison for lying to Congress, and he's the star witness to Congress. If you read the sentencing report on Mr. Cohen, words like deceptive and greedy are scattered throughout that report. It paints a picture of a narcissist, a bully, who cannot tell the truth, whether it's about the president or about his own personal life. But today, he's the majority party's star witness. If the Democrats were after the truth, they'd have an honest person here testifying. And if they were really after the truth, they'd not restrict the questioning to just a few topics. But let's, let's take a look at those restricted topics. Mr. Chairman, the first topic in your limited scope that I can ask Mr. Cohen is about the president's debts. But Mr. Chairman, didn't Mr. Cohen plead guilty to lying to banks about his personal finances? So we're asking a guy going to jail for lying about his debts to comment about the president's debts. He's the expert. Mr. Chairman, your next couple of topics say that I can ask Mr. Cohen about the president's compliance with financial disclosures and campaign finance laws, but didn't Mr. Cohen on two occasions break campaign finance law with his own donations? So again, the majority party star witness on the president's compliance is a guy who broke compliance laws himself. Mr. Chairman, you graciously allow us to ask questions of Mr. Cohen on the President's dealings with the IRS and tax law. Your star witness here broke the law with regards to the IRS at least five times. He pled guilty on cheating on his taxes, lying to the IRS. He's the best witness you got. Next up, with the permission of the chairman, I get to ask Mr. Cohen about his perspective on the president's business dealings. Let me get this straight. The, the witness lied to multiple financial institutions to get loans to pay off other loans just to keep himself afloat, and he's going to be the expert on business practices. Obviously, Mr. Chairman, the witness may produce documents that he suggests incriminates the president, yet he lies to banks. All of those lies were done on fraudulent documents, documents that he forged. Nothing he says or produces has any credibility. Apparently, he even lied about delivering his own child, which his wife had to correct the record of. Ladies and gentlemen, how on earth is this witness credible? With all the lies and deception, the self-serving fraud, it begs the question, what is the majority party doing here? No one can see this guy as credible. He will say whatever he wants to accomplish his own personal goals. He's a fake witness, and his presence here is a travesty. I hope the American people see through this. I know the people back in Tennessee will. And with that statement, sir, I have a few questions of the witness. With your loss of your law license, I think you mentioned in your opening statement that you had been disbarred. What is your source of income in the future? I don't expect I'm going to have a source of income when I'm in federal penitentiary. What, uh, 
is there a book deal coming or anything like that? I have no book deal right now in the process. I have been contacted by many, including for television, the movie. If you want to tell me who you would like to play you, I'm more than happy to write <laughs> the name down. I'm sure that's a very I would also like to man. turn around and just to correct your statement on me. No well, let me ask one other question, though. I, I only have a limited amount of time. No individual. One quick, one quick question. Who paid your expenses to be here today? Who's paid my expenses? To be here today. I paid my expenses. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the remaining of my time to uh, the, the ranking member. Mr. Cohen, how many times did you talk to the special counsel's office? Seven. How, uh, did they talk to you at all in preparation for today's hearing between the seven times you talked to him prior to your sentencing? Uh, have you had any conversations with the special counsel's office between sentencing and today? I'm sorry, sir. I don't understand your question. You talked to him seven times. That's in the sentencing uh, uh, memorandums that were in front of the court back in December. What I'm asking is have, how many times have you talked to the special counsel's office since then uh, up to today's appearance here in Congress? The gentleman's time has expired. You may answer the question now. That one question. I, I'm sorry. I don't have the answer to that. Mr. Maloney. It wasn't, well, I'll come back to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Cohen, in, in your, your 10 years of uh, working for Donald Trump, did he control everything that went on in the Trump organization? And did you have to get his permission in advance and report back after every meeting of any importance? Yes. My there, was, there was nothing that happened at the Trump Organization from whether it was a response as the Daily Beast story that you referred to, ranking member, that did not go through Mr. Trump with his approval and sign off, as in the case of the payments. How many, how many times did the President, Michael, uh, ask you or direct you to try to reach settlements with women in 2015 and 2016. Yeah, I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I'd have to go back and try to recollect. It's certainly the two that we know about. And uh, why, why do you think the president did not provide the accurate information in his 2017 uh, financial disclosure form? What was he? Uh, trying to hide. He corrected other forms, but he didn't correct this one. The payment on the reimbursement of the funds that I extended on his behalf. Uh, can you elaborate more? Well, going back into the story, as I stated, when we, Alan Weisselberg and I left the office and we went to his office in order to make the determination on how that money was going to be wired to the IOLA, the interest on a lawyer's account uh, for Keith Davidson in California. I had asked Alan to use his money. Didn't want to use mine, and he said he couldn't, and we then decided um, how else we can do it. And he asked me whether or not I know anybody who wants to have a party at one of his clubs that could pay me instead, or somebody who may have wanted to become a member of one of the golf clubs. And I also don't have anybody that was interested in that. And it got to the point where it was down to the wire. It was either we, somebody wire the funds and purchase the life rights to the story from Miss Clifford, or it was going to end up being sold to television and that would have embarrassed the president and it would have interfered with the election. But the president has never amended his 2017 form uh, to this day. And while you're facing the consequences of going to jail, he is not. Well, I believe that they amended a financial disclosure form, and there's a footnote somewhere buried. Um, I don't recall specifically what it says, but there is a footnote buried somewhere. Can you describe, Michael, to the American people, catch and kill? So catch and kill is a method that exists when you're working with a news outlet. In this specific case, it was a AMI, National Enquirer, David Pecker, Dylan Howard, and others, where they would contact me or Mr. Trump or someone and state that there's a story that's percolating out there that you may be interested in. 
And then what you do is you contact that individual and you purchase the rights to that story from them. And, and you practice this for the president? I was involved in several of these um, catch and kill episodes, but these catch and kill scenarios existed between David Pecker and Mr. Trump long before I started working for him in 2007. Michael, can you suggest who else this committee should talk to for additional information on this or anything else? Yes, I believe David Pecker, Dylan Howard, um, Barry Levine of AMI as well, um, Alan Weisselberg, Alan Garten of the Trump Organization as well. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. And Mr. Chairman, this is a story of redemption. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Comer. Mr. Cohen, in your testimony, you stated that you began work for the Trump Organization as a lawyer dealing with real estate transactions. Is that, that correct? That's correct. Uh, prior to coming to Congress, I served as a director of two different banks, so I've seen hundreds of loan applications. And to uh, try to determine your credibility here today, I just wanted to ask you a couple of real estate transaction questions just to see how, in fact, you, you operate. According to the Southern District of New York prosecutors, you lied to banks to secure loans by falsely stating the amount of debt you were carrying. Mr. Cohen, my question to you, was it Donald Trump's fault that you knowingly committed a crime of deception to defraud a bank? No, it's not. Was that fraudulent loan you obtained for the Trump Organization or for you personally? It would be for me, though I'm not familiar with which loan that you're referring to. Mr. I would, Cohen, like, to, I would the, like to say one thing, Mr. Sir. Cohen, Sorry, I would like you, just to respond. When, the loan we're that you about, guilty. when we're talking about the home equity line of credit, which is what I believe you're referring to. We're also um, referring, I'm no, going to ask a question no pertaining individual, to your summer home yes, that you purchased. I too. never purchased a summer home. No individual or no bank in the 22 years that I've had loans have ever lost a dollar with me. I owe no money to any bank. Well, the banks usually find out if someone's trying to deceive them. In 22 did, did your, years, your so I have no money loyalty? that's ever been owed Mr. Cohen, to any individual Mr. Chairman, or any bank. Mr. Cohen, did your so-called blind loyalty to the president cause you to defraud the bank for your own personal gain? Sir, I take exception to that because there has never been a fraud on a, a – I never defrauded any bank. Well, let's dig a little deeper on that, on the bank fraud. According to the Southern District of New York, you failed to disclose more than $20 million in liabilities, as well as tens of thousands of dollars of monthly expenses. That's according to the Southern District of New York. Now, Mr. Cohen, you being a lawyer, surely you knew you were breaking the law. Now, now why would you have done that? Sir, I'm not a CPA, and um, I pled guilty. I'm going to prison as a because result of it. Because you're a con? Uh, no, sir. Because I pled guilty and I am going to be doing the time, I have caused tremendous, tremendous pain to my family, and I take well, let's, no let's go happiness back to the, one in the last statements. question about the bank. When the bank found out about the liabilities that you failed to disclose, you lied again to the bank, this is according to the Southern District of New York, and said it had been expunged when in fact you just shifted the debt to another bank. So apparently, According to the information that, that we received, your intent to defraud the bank was for the de desire to purchase the summer home for $8.5 million? No, sir. That's that would correct. have been off of an equity line, considering I had less than a 50% loan to value on the assets, and there was a pre-existing line of credit that existed years before the date that you're referring to, where... This is all surrounding New York City taxi medallions. But you understand that when you fail to disclose liabilities, especially $20 million in liabilities, that is, in fact, fraud. Except even with the $20 million in liability. How much was it? The medallions were at that time worth over $45 million. Mr. Mr. Cohen, you called Donald Trump a cheat in your opening testimony. Uh, what would you call yourself? A fool. You calling... Okay, well, no comment on that. I, I appreciate Mr. it. Mr. Chairman, we said we were in search of the truth. I, I don't believe that Michael Cohen is capable of telling the truth. 
And I would hope that as this committee moves forward, that when we have the opportunity to subpoena witnesses, we subpoena witnesses that are not uh, recently disbarred, are not convicted felon, and witnesses that haven't committed bank fraud and tax fraud. That is how we're going to determine the truth. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time to the ranking member. They, I think the gentleman for you. I would just make one point. We just had a, a, a five-minute debate where Mr. Cohen disputes what the Southern District of New York found, what the judge found, that he was actually guilty of committing bank fraud. If, if this statement back here doesn't say it all, Cohen's consciousness of wrongdoing is fleeting. His remorse is minimal. His instinct is to blame others is to blame others is strong. There's only thing one wrong with that statement. His remorse is non-existent. He just debated a member of Congress saying, I really didn't do anything wrong with the false bank things that, that I'm guilty of and going to prison for. Mr. Jordan, that that's, not, that's not what I said, involved. and you know that that's, that's not exactly what I said. What well, I said, you. I pled guilty, guilty and I take responsibility for my actions. Shame on you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Mr. That's Mr. Not Chairman. not what I said. Shame Mr. On Mr. You. Mr. Chairman. That's not what I said. What I said is, I took responsibility and I take responsibility. What I was doing is explaining to the gentleman that his facts are inaccurate. I still, I take responsibility for my mistakes, all right? I am remorseful and I am going to prison. I will be away from my wife and family for years. So before you turn around we and you cast that. more dispersion, I understand please understand, I understand, there are people watching you today that know me a whole lot, but I made mistakes. I own them, and I didn't fight with the Southern District of New York. I didn't put the system through an entire scenario. But what I did do is I pled guilty, all right, and I am going to be, again, going to prison. Mr. Norton. Mr. Cohn. Uh, at the center of uh, the reasons you're going to prison uh, is conviction for campaign finance uh, violations. And they center around uh, some salacious re revelations. The Washington Post uh, reported uh, or aired uh, a Access Hollywood video it, it set a record for the number of people who watched, crashed the newspaper's server. But this happened in early October on the cusp of the election. Uh, what was Mr. Trump's reaction to the video becoming public at that time, and was he concerned about the impact of that video on the election? The answer is yes. As I stated before, I was in London at the time visiting my daughter who was studying there for Washington semester abroad. And I received a phone call during the dinner from Hope Hicks stating that she had just spoken to Mr. Trump and we need you to start making phone calls to the various different news outlets that you have relationships with. And we need to spin this. And what we want to do is just to claim that this was men locker room talk. What's the concern about the election in particular? The answer is yes. Then couple that with Karen McDougal, which then came out around the same time. And then on top of that, the Stormy Daniels matter. Yeah, the, and, and, and these things happened in the month before the election and almost one after the other. Uh, the Stormy Daniels revelation where prosecutors and officials, uh, of the prosecutors uh, learned of, of, of that, uh, of that uh, matter. Uh, and prosecutors stated that the officials at the magazine contacted you about the story. And I'm, the, the magazine, of course, is the National Inquiry. Is, uh, is that correct that they did? Yes, ma'am. Come to you. Um, were you concerned about this new story becoming uh, public right after 
the Access Hollywood study in terms of impact on the election? I was concerned about it, but more importantly, Mr. Trump was and concerned about it. That was my it. next question. What was the President's concern about these matters becoming public in October uh, as we were about to go into an election? I don't think anybody would dispute this belief that after the wild fire that encompassed the Billy Bush tape, that a second follow-up to it would have been um, pleasant. And he was concerned with the effect that it had had uh, on the campaign, on how women were seeing him, and ultimately whether or not he would have a shot uh, in the general election. And so you negotiated the $130,000 payment. Um, the $130,000 number was not a number that was actually negotiated. It was told to me by Keith Davidson that this is a number that Ms. Clifford wanted. Well, you finally, you finally completed that deal, as it were, on October the 20th. 20th. Uh, days before the election, what happened in the interim? Contemplated whether or not to do it. Um, wasn't sure if she was really going to go public. There was, again, some communications back and forth between myself and Keith Davidson. And ultimately, it came to either do it or don't. At which time, again, I had gone into Mr. Trump's office, as I did after each and every conversation. And he had told me that he had spoken to a couple of friends, and it's 130000 it's not a lot of money, and we should just do it. So go ahead and do it. And I was at the time with Alan Weisselberg, where he directed us to go back to Mr. Weisselberg's office and figure this all out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Beddoes. Mr. Cohen, uh, do you know Lynn Patton? I'm, I'm right here. Oh, yes, sir. Do you know Lynn Patton? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I asked Lynn to come today in her personal capacity uh, to actually shed some light. H how long have you known Ms. Patton? I'm responsible for Lynn Patton joining the Trump Organization and the job that she currently holds. Well, uh, that's, I'm glad you acknowledge that because you made some very um, demeaning comments about the, the president that Ms. Patton doesn't agree with. In fact, it has to do with your claim of racism. She says that as a daughter of a man born in Birmingham, Alabama, that there is no way that she would work for, a, for a, an individual who was racist. How do you reconcile the two of those, Mr. As neither should I as the son of a Holocaust survivor. But, Mr. Cohen, I guess what I'm saying is, is I've talked to, to the president over 300 times. I've not heard one time a racist comment out of, out of his mouth in private. So how do you reconcile it? Do you have proof of those conversations? I would ask you to Do you ask have tape recordings of those conversations? No, sir. Well, you've taped everybody else. That's, Why wouldn't you have a tape? That's also not true, sir. That's not true. You haven't taped anybody? I, I have taped individuals. How many times have you taped individuals? Maybe 100 times over 10 years. Is that a low estimate? Because I've, I've heard it's over 200 times. No, I don't think. I think it's approximately about 100 from what I recall. But I would ask so you, why would, you ask me a question, you, sir. Do you have so proof? Here's, do will, you have proof, yes or no? I do. Oh, where's the proof? Ask Ms. Patton how many people who are black are executives at the Mi Trump Organization. Mi Mr. And the Cohen, answer is Mr. zero. Mr. Cohen, we can go through this. Here, I, would ask you ask you, me, I would ask unanimous consent that her entire statement be put in the record. Without objection. All right, let me go on a little bit further. Did you collect... $1.2 million or so from Novartis. I did. For access to the Trump administration? No, sir. Why did you collect it? Because they came to me based upon my knowledge of the enigma, Donald Trump, what he thinks. So they paid. Did, uh, sir, please let me finish. Uh, no, did they pay you $1.2 million to yes. give them advice? Yes, they did. They, a multi billion dollar conglomerate, came to me looking for information, not something that's unusual here in D.C., 
looking for information, and they believed that I had a value. So how many and times that the value did you meet with them? Was the insight that I was capable of offering them? How many and they times? They were willing to pay. How many times did you meet with them? For one point two million dollars, how many times did you meet with them? I provided them with both in person as well as telephone access whenever they needed. How many times? Yes, sir. That's a question, I, Mr. I Cohen. I don't recall, sir. So did you ever talk yeah, to them? I spoke to them on several occasions, yes. How many? Uh, six times. Six times. Wow. Two hundred thousand dollars a call. Sir, I also would like All to right, I also on. would like I, to bring this to is your my attention five minutes, Mr. Cohen, not yours. Did you get money from the Bank of Kazakhstan? It's not a Bank of Kazakhstan. It's called BTA. BTA Bank, Kazakhstan BTA Bank. Did you get money from them? I did. For what purpose? The purpose was because the former CEO of that bank um, had absconded with over, it was between four to six billion dollars, and some of that money was here in the United States, and they sought my assistance in terms of finding, locating that money, and helping them to recollect it. So are you saying that all the reports that you were paid in some estimates over $4 million to have access and understanding of the Trump administration. You're saying that all of that was just paid to you just because you're a nice guy. Well, I am a nice guy, but more importantly, well, yeah, each I and would every, beg to differ that the record contract, reflects that you're not a nice sir, guy. Each and every contract contained the clause in my contracts that said, I will not lobby and I do not do government relations work. In fact, in fact, Novartis sent me their contract, which stated specifically that they wanted me to lobby, that they wanted me to provide access to government, including the president. That information, that paragraph was crossed out by me, initialed, and written in my own handwriting. It says, I will not lobby or do government relations work. So Novartis representatives say that it was like they were hiring a non-registered lobbyist. So you disagree with that? I don't know what they said, sir, but the contract Have you ever itself. contacted anybody in the administration? Yes. To, to advocate on behalf of, of any aspect of any of your contracts? I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman. I ask, I ask unanimous consent. The, gentleman, the gentleman's time has expired. You may answer the question. I, I, I don't know what you're referring to, sir. M Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Clay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, I'm pleased you agreed to testify today voluntarily. In my view, we are all here for just one reason, and that's the American people are tired of being lied to. Uh, they have been lied to by President Trump. They've been lied to by the president's children. They have been lied to by the president's legal representatives. And it pains me to say that they have been even lied to by his congressional enablers who are still devoted to per perpetuating and protecting this giant con game on the American people. Now, Mr. Cohen, I'd like to talk to you about the president's assets. Since by law, these must be reported accurately on his federal financial disclosures and when he submits them uh, for a bank loan. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you served for nearly a decade as then businessman Trump's personal attorney and so-called fixer. Uh, did, you have, did you also have an understanding of the president's assets and how he valued those items. Yes. In November of 2017, Crane's New York business reported that the Trump Organization provided, quote, flagrantly untrue revenue figures going back to at least 2010 to influence Crane's ranking of the largest private companies in New York. According to the reports, while the Trump Organization reported nearly $9.5 billion in revenues in 2016, public filings suggested revenues were actually less than one-tenth of that. To your knowledge, did the president or his company ever inflate assets or revenues? Yes. 
And uh, was that done with the president's knowledge or direction? Everything was done with the knowledge and at the direction of Mr. Trump. Well, tell us why he would do that and what purpose did it serve? It depends upon the situation. Um, there were times that I was asked, again, with Alan Weisselberg, the CFO, mm -hmm. to go back and to speak with an individual from Forbes, because Mr. Trump wanted each year to have his net worth rise on the Forbes wealthiest individuals list. And so what you do is you look at the assets and you try to find an asset that has, say, for example, 40 Wall Street, which is about 1.2 million square feet. Find an asset that is comparable, find the highest price per square foot that's achieved in the area, and apply it to that building. Or if you're going off of your rent roll, you can go by the gross rent roll times a multiple, and you make up the multiple, which is something that he had talked about. It's based upon what he wanted to value the asset at. You know, you, you have provided the com this committee with copies of the president's financial statements or parts of them from 2011, 2012, and 13. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit those for the record. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit the statements to the record. Without objection to order. Thank you. Can you explain why you had these financial statements and what you used them for? So these financial statements were used by me uh, for two purposes. One was discussing with media, whether it was Forbes or other magazines, um, to demonstrate Mr. Trump's significant net worth. That was one function. Another was when we were dealing later on with insurance companies, we would provide them with these copies um, so that they would understand that the premium, which is based sometimes upon uh, the individual's capabilities to pay, um, would be reduced. And all of this was done at the president's direction and with his knowledge? Yes, because whatever the numbers would come back to be, we would immediately report it back. And did this information provided to us inflate the president's assets? I believe these numbers are inflated. And of course, inviting, inflating assets to win a newspaper poll to boost your ego is not a crime. But to your knowledge, did the president ever provide inflated assets to a bank in order to help him ob obtain a loan? But you may answer that question. These documents and others were provided to Deutsche Bank uh, on one occasion where I was with them in our attempt to obtain money so that we can put a bid on the Buffalo Bills. Thank you for your answer. Mr. Heiser, Georgia. I'd like to yield a second to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I want to ask unanimous consent to put into the record an article from STAT which indicates that Mr. Cohen's uh, promise to access not just Trump, but also the circle around him. It was almost as if we were hiring a lobbyist, close quote. I ask unanimous consent. Without, without objection. I ask unanimous consent that we put into the record a criminal referral for violating Section 22 USC uh, of the uh, statute uh, number 6. 611, I ask unanimous consent that my letter referring uh, Mr. Cohen for violating FARA uh, for illegal lobbying activity be entered into the record. Without objection, so I ask unanimous consent that the first order of business uh, for this committee is for us to look in a bipartisan way at criminal referrals at the next business meeting. No. These are not documents. They're <laughs> objections. They're objections. So, so we're objecting to a unanimous consent request? Is that what, Mr. Chairman? I'm, I'm, I'll take care of Heist, don't worry. Uh, I, yes. I will yield, yield back. All right. Now, let, let, me, let me be clear. Uh, Mr. Heist, I'm going to give you your whole five minutes, all right? All right. Thank you, Mr. And Chairman. And to you, all right? Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Mr. Meadows, uh, I, the Chairman made me a, uh, the ranking member 
made me aware that I had given a little more time to Ms. Washman Schultz. Uh, I was going to let you do that anyway. Uh, but, but I just want the committee to know that because there are so many members, I'm going to be strict on this five minutes, all right? All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Heiss, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, you claim that you've lied, but you're not a liar. Just to set the record straight, if you lied, you are a liar by definition. You also said a moment ago that the facts are inaccurate. If they are facts, they are accurate, and that would make you inaccurate. But I'd like to take a moment to, uh, I'd like to know who you consulted with to prepare for today's hearing, Lanny Davis, and who else? I consulted with my counsel, Lanny Davis, as well as Michael Monaco. All right. Uh, did uh, you or Michael or Lanny Davis or anyone else cooperate with the Democratic majority to prepare for this hearing? Um, I'm sorry. Say that again, please. Did anyone, did you or anyone else on your team cooperate with the Democrat Party in preparing for this hearing? Uh, we've, we've spoken to the party. Okay. Did you prepare with Chairman Cummings or anyone on your team? Uh, I'm sorry. What do you mean by prepare? Prepare for this hearing. Prepare. I prepared with my counsel. Did I you prepare with, with, with any, the Democrat majority or Chairman Cummings? We spoke with Chairman Cummings and the party. With uh, Chairman uh, Schiff? Spoke with Chairman Schiff and, his, par and uh, his people as well. Were there any other individuals uh, acting as a liaise uh, for you with the majority party? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, what are you saying? Did you have a liaison other than these that you've mentioned who were working with the majority uh, to prepare for this hearing? We spoke with the various individuals that you just raised, yes. Uh, Tom Steyer, um, regarding him or any of his representatives, uh, anyone associated with him, is, are the, is he or any of them paying Lanny Davis to represent you? Not that I'm aware of. Who is paying Lanny Davis? At the present moment, no one. Uh, so he's doing all this work for nothing? Yes, sir. Okay. And I hope so. Um, I kind of doubt it. But uh, how did Lanny Davis come to represent you? Did he approach you or did you approach him? I reached out to Lanny Davis at the recommendation of my former counsel over at um, McDermott, Will, and Emery who knew Mr. Davis and Mr. So Davis. So you reached out to Mr. Davis? N I did, yes, initially. Okay. Uh, so did, did you want to testify before Congress, or did he urge you to testify here? I was asked to come here, and I am here, sir, voluntarily, because it's my you decision. You were asked by who? My question, did, did he ask you to come here? No, sir. Okay, uh, because he, he, he says that he did ask you to come here and that he convinced you, and also that he uh, did the same with uh, Chairman Cummings as well. So your, your testimony here is that you approached Lanny Davis uh, to represent you and to come here. He did not persuade you to come here. He did not persuade me. Actually, Chairman Cummings which is part of the conversations that we engaged in with his people, as well as Chairman Schiff and others. They, they, we spoke in order to ask me to come here voluntarily. I find the connecting of the dots here with, with Mr. Davis uh, and you, and frankly the chairman and perhaps others to be rather stunning that there is a, an agenda for all this uh, happening here today. And, uh, uh, I believe, frankly, that that is to bring uh, the president down, to impugn the president. Uh, you made an oath last time you were here, and that oath meant nothing to you then. Uh, we had an oath here in this very room about a month ago, and it was, quote, be clear that I will seek the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, end quote. That sounds like an oath to me. The chairman made that statement in this very room last month, but here we are today, our first big hearing with, as you and we all know, a convicted liar lying to Congress, a criminal, and I, I believe this witness is totally incompatible in, uh, with the stated goal of having to seek the truth in this hearing. This is the first time in the history of Congress 
we have someone testifying here who has already been convicted of lying to Congress. So congratulations for being the first in Congress to do that, and Mr. Thank Cummings you. as well. I can't believe we're coming. We have brought this committee to its knees in terms of losing its credibility, and it's a shameful mockery of what our purpose is. I yield back. Gentleman Simon has expired. So, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me just pick up on those last comments. We want to talk about a low point. How about Mr. Papadopoulos pled guilty, Mr. Manafort convict, convicted, pled guilty to two other charges, Mr. Gates pled guilty, Mr. Flynn pled guilty, Mr. Pinedo pled, pled guilty, Mr. Van Der Zwan pled guilty, Mr. Kalimnik uh, indicted for obstruction of justice. And for two years, you want to talk about an agenda, my friends on the other side of the aisle refused to bring any of these people up before the committee. So today, for the first day, we have one witness who voluntarily is coming forward to testify. Your side ran away from the truth, and we're trying to bring it to the American people. So, Mr. Cohen, Sir. first of all, thank you for voluntarily coming before the committee to testify. I want to ask you about uh, your statements regarding Trump Tower in Moscow, and I want to drill down some of the facts and details. Now, you may not be aware of it, but uh, this goes back a ways. Back in 1987, Mr. Trump uh, wrote that he had had ongoing discussions with uh, Soviet officials back then uh, to build a luxury, uh, ho large luxury hotel across from the Kremlin uh, in partnership with the Soviet Union. So uh, at that time, it was the Soviet Union. I want to ask you, uh, in your filing with the special counsel Mueller's office, uh, the prosecutors wrote, and I quote, Mr. Cohen discussed the status of pro and progress of the Moscow project with individual one on more than the three occasions Mr. Cohen claimed to the committee. And he briefed family members of individual one with the company about the project. Uh, I know this is redundant, but Mr. Cohen, uh, who are we referring to here when we refer to individual one? Donald J. Trump. Okay, and the company? The Trump Organization. Okay. Uh, through, a who, through a subsidiary. Okay. Uh, and who were the family members that you briefed on the Trump Tower Moscow project? Don Trump Jr. and Ivanka Trump. Okay. Now, were these in the regular course of business, or, or did the president or family request the briefings? This is in the regular course of business. Do you recall, uh, there's a question on the number of briefings. Do you recall how many there might have been? I'm sorry, sir? Do you recall how many of these briefings there might have been? It's approximately 10 okay. in total. All right. In your written remarks, you also wrote, and I quote, there were at least a half dozen times between the Iowa caucus in January 2016 and the end of June when Mr. Trump would ask me, how's it going in Russia, referring to the Russia-Moscow uh, Tower project. Now, how did the president communicate those questions to you? Was it verbally or over the phone? Verbally, most of the time, uh, or virtually all of the time, it would okay. say, he would say to me, Michael, come walk with me. He was heading to, let's say, a rally to a car, and as I would walk him to the elevator, he would ask me questions quickly regarding a series of Could there be any issues. doubt about what he was referring to in terms of the project in Russia? No, this would be it. Okay. Uh, Otherwise, there would be no reason to ask it of me. Right, right. Uh, you also wrote, and I quote, uh, to be clear, Mr. Trump knew of and directed the Trump-Moscow negotiations throughout the campaign and lied about it, close quote. Uh, how, did, how did the president actually direct the negotiations? After what, each, what details did he direct? Well, after each communication that I had, I would report back to him. And our goal was to get this project. We were interested in building what would have been the largest building in all of Europe. You know, sir, I, I, just if I can say one last Please, thing go in ahead. regard to uh, the gentleman's statements, since this is on topic. Um, the lies that I told to Congress, in fairness, benefited Mr. Trump. It was in furtherance of my protection of Mr. Trump, which I stated in my testimony. And I am not protecting Mr. Trump anymore. And so, while I truly appreciate taking some of your time onto it, to attack me every single time about taxes, 
I have no credibility. It's for exactly that reason that I spent the last week searching boxes in order to find the information that I did so that you don't have to take my word for it. I don't want you to. I want you to look at the documents, Mr. Cohen, and I, I want you to make your own decision. I need my last time. Sorry, sir. That's okay. Uh, let, me, let me just say, I don't think my, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are afraid that you're going to lie. I think they're afraid you're going to tell the truth. Thank you, sir. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Gosar. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Oh, I, I appreciate the gentleman for yielding. I just want to respond to Mr. Lynch. I want you to think about this. When have you ever seen a federal agency where this has happened? James Comey, director, fired. Andy McCabe, deputy director, fired. Lied three times under oath, under investigation, right, as we speak. Jim Baker, FBI counsel, demoted, then left, currently under investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Connecticut. Lisa Page, demoted, then left. Peter Strzok, deputy head of counterintelligence, demoted, then fired. That's what happened. That's what we're concerned about. And today, we actually asked for Rod Rosenstein. Oh, by the way, we now know three people have told us Rod Rosenstein actually was contemplating using the 25th Amendment to remove the guy from presidency who the American people put there. And we asked for him to be a witness today, and the chairman said no. And instead, we get 30 minutes from a guy who's going to prison, going to prison in two months for lying to Congress. Mr. Cohen, I got two quick questions before I yield back to my colleague. He, Mr. Heiss asked you who all you've talked to. You said you've talked to, you spoke to Mr. Schiff, obviously spoke to Mr. Cummings. You've been, you're going in front of both committees. You're here today. You're going to be in front of Mr. Schiff's committee tomorrow. Have you spoken to Chairman Nadler or anyone on his staff, or have any of your attorneys spoken to Chairman Nadler? I don't know about my attorneys. I have not spoken to um, You don't know if your attorneys have spoken? I have not spoken to Congressman Nadler, you and I'm not aware, sir, I'm you, not aware if my attorneys, I can ask them. Can turn around and ask you? The answer, sir, is no. Okay. And you said at this present time, Mr. Davis is not getting paid. Does that Are you anticipating him receiving some kind of compensation in the future? When I start to earn a living. Well, he's going to wait three years? Yeah. Wow. The answer, the answer is yes. That's a first. I've never known a lawyer to wait three years to get paid. I guess he thinks it's important. All right. With that, I yield to the gentleman from Arizona. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Cohen, you know, you're a disgraced lawyer. I mean, you, you, you've been disbarred. And so um, I'm sure you remember, well, maybe you don't remember, duty of loyalty, duty of confidentiality, attorney-client privilege. I think the gentleman over your right side actually understands that very, very well and wouldn't do what you are doing here today. So let's go back at this credibility. You want us to make sure that we think of you as a real philanthropic icon that you're about justice, that you're the person that somebody would call at 3 o'clock in the morning. No, they wouldn't. Not at all. You saw Mr. Comer uh, dissect you. Right in front of this committee, you con conflicted your testimony, sir. You're a patholog pathological liar. You don't know truth from, from, tr from falsehood. Sir, it's I'm sorry. Now. Are you, you, know, are you referring to me or the president? Hey, this is my time. <laughs> Are you I'll, referring when to I ask you, or the When I ask you a question, yes. I'll ask for an answer. Sure. Now, are you familiar with Rule 35 of the Federal Rules and Criminal Proce Procedures? I am now. Oh. Hmm. So the committee understands that you've been in contact with the Southern District of New York. Is that true? I am in constant contact with the Southern District of New York regarding ongoing investigations. And part of that application is to reduce sentencing time, is it not? Yes. There is a possibility. Yes. The answer is yes. No, it's not, sir. Yes, it is. Okay. It it's is. not. And so testimony here could actually help you out in getting your sentence lessened. Isn't that true? I'm not really sure how my appearance here today is providing substantial information that the Southern District can use for the creation of a case. Now, if there is something that this group can do for me, I would gladly welcome it. Well, I, 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 I got to tell you. You know, America's watching you. I've been getting texts right and left saying, how can anybody listen to this pathological person? He's got a problem. He doesn't th know fact from fiction. And that's what's sad here is, is that you didn't do this for Donald Trump, to protect Donald Trump. You did it for you. This is all, no, this is all about you. This is all about this Twitter feed and, and, and you know, let me read one of those, another one. Women who love and support Michael Cohen, strong, pit bull, sex symbol. Non, no nonsense, business oriented and ready to make a difference. 1,000 followers? A, 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 ready to make a difference against the law. 
That's pretty sad. You know, uh, it, it, over and over again, you know, we want to have trust. It's built on the premise that we're truthful, that we come forward. But there's no truth with you whatsoever. That's why that's important to you, to look up here and, and look at the old adage that our moms taught us, liar, liar, pants on fire. Hmm. No one should ever listen to you and give you credibility. It's sad. It's sad that we have come. In fact, I want to quote the chairman's very words. This is a real, hold on. Gentleman's time is expired. Sad state. Time is expired. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cohen, several times in your testimony, you state the bad things that you did for Mr. Trump. And at some point, um, you apparently changed your course of action. There's a recurring refrain in your testimony that says, and yet I continued to work for him. But at some point, you changed. What was the breaking point at which you decided to start telling the truth? There are several factors. Helsinki, Charlottesville, watching the daily destruction of our civility to one another, putting up silly things like this, oh, that's silly. really unbecoming of Congress. It's that sort of behavior that I'm responsible for. I'm responsible for your silliness because I did the same thing that you're doing now for 10 years. I protected Mr. Trump for 10 years. And the fact that you pull up a news article that has no value to it, and you want to use that as the premise for discrediting me, that I'm not the person that people called at 3 o'clock in the morning, would make you inaccurate. In actuality, it would make you a liar, which puts you into the same position that I am in. And I can only warn people, the more people that follow Mr. Trump, as I did blindly, are going to suffer the same consequences that I'm suffering. What warning would you give young people who are tempted as you were? Would you encourage them not to wait 10 years to see the light? What advice would you give young people, in particular young lawyers, so they do not abuse their bar license as you did? Look at what's happened to me. I had a wonderful life. I have a beautiful wife. I have two amazing children. And I achieved financial success by the age of 39. I didn't go to work for Mr. Trump because I had to. I went to work for him because I wanted to. And I've lost it all. So if I'm not a picture perfect, that's the picture that should be up there. If I'm not a picture perfect example of what not to do, that's the example that I'm trying to set for my children. You make mistakes in life, and I've owned them, and I've taken responsibility for them. And I'm paying a huge price, as is my family. So if that in and of itself isn't enough to dissuade somebody from acting in the callous manner that I did, I'm not sure that that person has any, um, any chance very much like I'm in right now. A recurring theme in your testimony is concern for your family's safety. What specifically are you most concerned about? Well, the president, unlike my Cohen for Trump that has 1,000 followers, he's got over 60 million people. And when Mr. Trump turned around early in the campaign and said, I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it, I want to be very clear. He's not joking. He's telling you the truth. He said, you don't know him. I do. I sat next to this man for 10 years, and I watched his back. I'm the one who started the campaign, and I'm the one who continued in 2015 to promote him. And I, so many things I thought that he can do that are just great, and he can and he is doing things that are great. But this destruction of our civility to one another is just, it's out of control. And when he goes on Twitter and he starts bringing in my in-laws, my parents, my wife, what does he think is going to happen? He's causing, he, he's sending out the same message that he can do whatever he wants. This is his country. He's becoming an autocrat. And hopefully something bad will happen to me on my children, on my wife, so that I will not be here and testify 
That's what his hope was. It was to intimidate me. And again, I thanked everybody who joined and said that this is just not right. Have you ever seen Mr. Trump personally threaten people with physical harm? No. He would use others. He would hire other people to do that? I'm not so sure that he had to hire them. They were already working there. <laughs> Everybody's job at the Trump Organization is to protect Mr. Trump. Gentlemen, we'll come to order. Um, Mr. Cohen, uh, I want to finalize this issue relating to your truth in testimony form. Uh, the form requires you to list your 
contracts or payments originating from a foreign government, uh, not from all foreign entities, we said we would give you a chance to consult with your attorneys. Have you done that, and do you have any additional information? My four attorneys continue to believe, as they did before, that the language of the truth and testimony form, which I was given and signed just right before this hearing, and which requires disclosure of any contracts or payments from foreign governments in the last two years, did not apply to my work for BTA Bank, which is a Kazakh-owned entity. They advised that had entities been intended for disclosure, that word would have been in the disclosure definition. However, if the Committee's counsel has a different view that I should disclose my contract with BTA Bank, we would be willing to do that. All right. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, let me finish. Sure. Um, I want to understand clearly, you are, you sought the advice of your counsel, is that right? That's correct. And your counsel advised you to say what you just said. Is that right? That's correct. And you know that to be the truth. Is that right? Yes, sir. I will yield to the gentleman. from. I, I thank the, the chairman for his courtesy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, instead of, of making points of order and going back and forth on this, perhaps a way to solve this is for the chairman to request Mr. Cohen give to this committee all the foreign payments that he has received over the last two years, whether they're an entity or a government, because we have strong belief, Mr. Chairman, there's over $900,000 that came from the government of Kazakhstan on behalf of Mr. Cohen. And, and it, it is either the truth or the whole truth or nothing but the truth. I, and, and the rules, Mr. Mr. Chair, Chairman, uh, really look at foreign payments that come from or with foreign governments. And, and and the bank he's talking about is owned 81 percent by the Kazakhstan government. Uh, reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time, and then we're going to move on. Um, what I will take, I would, first of all, let me be clear. Uh, I said to Mr. Cohen uh, that if he came in here and lied, I would nail him to the cross. Didn't I? Did I tell yes, you that? Yes, he did more than once. All right. Um, so if there's any ambiguity, I want that to be cleared up. I have no problem in working with you to make sure that's straightened out, because I don't, I don't want it to be a thing where he thinks thing, one thing, we think one thing, and we can, we can clear that up, all right? Mr. All right, we have another member members that have been waiting. But just on that subject, if yeah. I could, Mr. Chairman, I don't think we should limit it just to the BTA Bank, which has the affiliation with Kazakhstan. I think we should also look at Korea Airspace Industries, one of his other clients, and any other client that's foreign that may have some connection to that respective country's government. I hope him and his attorneys look at all those and we get the form <coughs> exactly right as Mr. Meadows wants. Reclaiming my time, uh, we will take that certainly under advisement. You are, uh, I'm a man of my word. Uh, we will do, uh, we will work with you and see what we can uh, do to come up with that. I don't think that it's an unreasonable request. Um, Mr. Ghana. Hello, Ghana. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Mr. <Yes>. Cohen, <laughs> I want to focus my questions on the smoking gun document you have provided this committee. This document is compelling evidence of federal and state crimes, including financial fraud. You provided this committee with a check from President Donald J. Trump's revocable trust account, which is marked as Exhibit 5B. It is a check for $35,000, and it is dated March 17, 2017, after the President took office. It's right now on the screen. Do you see it, sir? Yes, sir. To be clear, the Trump revocable trust is the trust the President set up to hold his assets after he became President. Is that correct? I believe so. Do you know why you were paid from the trust as opposed to the president's personal account? I don't know the answer to that. Did you think it was odd that he paid you once from his personal account and then he's paying you through the scheme of a trust? I'll be honest, I was just happy to get the check. Today you testify that the check was signed by Donald Trump Jr. and the Trump C organization CFO Alan Weisselberg. Is that correct? That is correct. According to the criminal charges against you, you sent monthly invoices containing false information to an individual identified as Executive One, 
Weisselberg is Executive One, correct? Yes. The criminal charge against you then states that Executive One forwarded your invoice to someone referred to as Executive Two. Presumably, Donald Trump Jr., who's signing this check, is Executive Two, correct? I believe so. As federal prosecutors laid out in their criminal charges, payments like this check resulted in numerous false statements in the books and records of the Trump Organization. And it's important for the American public to understand this. Nothing to do with collusion. This is financial fraud, garden variety financial fraud. It was disguised as a payment for legal services to you. But this was not a payment for legal services, was it, Mr. Cohen? No, sir. It could give rise to serious state and federal criminal liability if a corporation is cooking its books. Based on your testimony today, Donald Trump Jr. and Alan Weisselberg directed this payment to you and approved this payment. Is that right? Mr. Trump initially acknowledged the obligation, the debt. Myself and Alan Weisselberg went back to his office and I was instructed by Alan at the time that they were going to do this over 12 installments. And what he decided to do then was to have me send an invoice, in which case they can have a check cut. And then, yes, the answer would be yes to your, to your uh, follow-up. And, and Donald question. Trump Jr. obviously signed off on this. Yes, well, it, was, it would either be Eric Trump, Donald Trump Jr., and or Alan Weisselberg, but always Alan Weisselberg on the check. And you think executive two is Donald Trump Jr.? Yes. They knew that this payment uh, was false and illegal, correct? I, I can't make that conclusion. You told Representative Kelly that the president was aware of this scheme. Is that correct? That's correct. I just want the American public to understand the explosive nature of your testimony in this document. Are you telling us, Mr. Cohen, that the president directed transactions in conspiracy with Alan Weisselberg and his son, Donald Trump Jr., as part of a civil criminal, as part of a criminal conspiracy of financial fraud. Is that your testimony today? Yes. And do you know if this criminal financial scheme that the president, Alan Weisselberg, and Donald Trump Jr. are involved in is being investigated by the Southern District of New York? I'd rather not discuss that question because it could be part of an investigation that's currently ongoing. But I just want the American public to understand that solely apart from Bob Mueller's investigation, there is garden variety financial fraud. And your allegation and the explosive smoking gun document suggests that the president, his son, and his CFO may be involved in a cons criminal conspiracy. And isn't it true, Mr. Cohen, that this criminal conspiracy that involved four people, that there's only one person so far who suffered the repercussions, and that's why you're in jail? We'll be going to jail, yes. The three other people, though, who were equally involved in this conspiracy. Is yes. that true? It is true. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I yield back my time. Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I'm going to tackle the president's tax returns. During the 2016 campaign, you said you personally wouldn't, quote, allow him to re release those returns until the audits are over, unquote. Uh, for the record, nothing prevents individuals from sharing their own tax re re uh, returns even while under audit by the IRS. Mr. Cohen, do you know whether President Trump's tax returns were really under audit by the IRS in 2016? I don't know the answer. I asked for a copy of the audit uh, so that I could use it in terms of my um, <coughs> statements to the press, and I was never able to obtain one. Okay. So, do you have any inside knowledge about what was in the president's tax returns that he refused to release? I, I do not. Can you give us any insight into what the real reason is that the president has refused to release his tax returns? Statements that he had said to me was that what he didn't want was to have an entire group of think tanks that are tax experts run through his tax return and start ripping it to pieces and then he'll end up in an audit and he'll ultimately have um, tax, taxable consequences, penalties, and so on. 
So that's an interesting point that basically he said he didn't want to release his tax returns because he might end up in an audit. So could you presume from that statement that he wasn't under audit? I presume that he's not under audit. And the reason why I bring this up, because I'm also the only Democrat on this committee that also serves on the Committee of Ways and Means. It's the chief tax writing committee in the, in the House of Representatives. And it's the only committee in the House of Representatives that has jurisdiction to request an American's tax returns. And that includes the President of the United States. My constituents need to know whether the President has financial ties that are causing him to protect his own bottom line rather than the best interests of this country. Can he be blackmailed? because of his financial and business ventures, including by foreign governments. And I know the, um, the opposition is the first thing they're going to ask or say is that he released his uh, financial disclosure forms. But I believe that there's other things we can learn from his taxes. Um, do, you know any, do you have any idea what we can learn in his tax returns if we actually received, we got our hands on them? No, I've actually I've seen them. I just have never gone through them. They're quite long. Qu quite long. Um, one of the things I also find ironic is that the way they're kind of attacking you is to undermine your credibility is one of the ways is by saying uh, that you committed bank fraud and tax evasion. And the reason why is a big deal is that it really goes down to the a person's character when it comes to taxes. But yet the, re the Republican minority has never asked to see his taxes, right? Uh, something that for 40 years, Democrats and Republicans alike have released their tax return to prove to the American people that they didn't have financial interests that would be leverageable by a foreign government. But this minority refuses to ask for his tax returns. Um, I also want to kind of go on. Um, I'm noticing a pattern. I'm noticing a pattern about the president and those in his inner circle. Special counsel Robert Mueller's team has indicted or received guilty pleas from 34 people and three companies that we know of, the latest being long-term Trump advisor Roger Stone. That group includes six former Trump advisor. It appears that the president has a fondness for entrusting those who will, one, lie for him, two, break the law for him, three, cheat the system for him. Essentially, he wants to surround himself with people who are just like him. Would you agree with that statement? From the facts and circumstances, it appears so. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cohen, the American people have a lot of questions when it comes to this president, to his con conduct. When he went to Helsinki and he bowed before uh, Vladimir Putin, and nobody can really understand why he acts the way he acts. And we believe that the way we get those answers is really looking at everybody that surrounds him, who he's been associated with, and his tax returns, because that is the only way that we can get down to the, to the bottom line. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. All right, go ahead. Um, I ask unanimous consent that we read into the, or for the record, a tweet from Dr. Daryl Scott, which says, Michael Cohen asks, no, begged me repeatedly to ask POTUS to give him a job in the administration. He is still lying under oath. I ask unanimous consent. I'm objecting. I have one more uh, from Bob Deedle. Uh, getting sick watching these hearings. I know Michael Cohen personally for many years, and he told me several times that he was very angry and upset that he didn't get a post in the White House and that he, quote, would do, any, do what he has to do now to protect his family, close quote. I ask that that no be. Objection. Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you. Mr. Chairman, two quick ones. Uh, and then, then if we've got other ones, we're, we're going to do you, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, then do, we'll do the other ones at the end because I have some things, too, that I want to get in. All right. I uh, ask unanimous consent that an article in Salon Magazine written by Stanley Brand, former House counsel to Tip O'Neill, titled the article is Oversight Committee Session with Michael Cohen Looks Like an Illegitimate Show Hearing. Um, without objection, so order. I ask unanimous consent that a letter that Mr. Meadows and I sent to you, the chairman, uh, requesting that you call Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein to testify at this hearing also be part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, well, Mr. Let me, chairman, uh, can, I, can I respond? Uh, just one second, all right? Um, the article by Mr. Byrne, yep. uh, I just want to deal with this one right away. Um, we, we, when we saw that article, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, ranking Member, 
uh, we knew that it was inaccurate. I mean, just on basics. I mean, it's, it, the, the cases that Mr. Brand uh, used are, are definitely distinguishable for what's going on here. And so we, we got uh, Irvin B. Nathan, former general counsel of the House from 2007 to 2010, and she says, in short, the committee has ample jurisdiction and responsibility to hear and consider the upcoming voluntary testimony of Mr. Cohen. Uh, that's dated February 2019, 25th, 2019. And uh, I want to enter that into record without objection. So ordered. Um, where are we? Ms. Acasio Cortez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I'd like to quickly pick up on some previous lines of questioning before getting into my own. So I may go a little quickly in the, to get it all in five minutes. Uh, first, my colleague from Vermont had asked you uh, some, several questions about AMI, the parent, the parent company of the National Enquirer. And uh, in that, you mentioned a treasure trove, a quote, treasure trove of documents in David Pecker's office relating to information assembled from all these catch and kill operations um, against people who potentially had damaging information on the president. And you also mentioned that the president was very concerned about the whereabouts of these documents and who possessed them. Does that treasure trove of documents still exist? I, I don't know. I had asked David Pecker for them. So you would say the person who knows the whereabouts of these documents would be David Pecker? David Pecker, Barry Levine, or um, Dylan Howard. Okay, thank you. Um, secondly, I want to ask a little bit about uh, your conversation with my colleague from Missouri about asset inflation. Um, to your knowledge, did the president ever provide inflated assets to an insurance company? Yes. Who else knows that the president did this? Alan Weisselberg, Ron Lieberman, and Matthew Calamari. And where would the committee find more information on this? Do you think we need to review his financial statements and his tax returns in order to compare them? Yes, and you'd find it at the Trump org. Thank you very much. Uh, the last, last thing here, uh, the Trump Golf Organization currently has a golf course in my home borough of the Bronx, uh, Trump Links. I drive past it every day, going between, Bronx and, going between the Bronx and Queens. Um, in fact, the Washington Post reported on the Trump Links Bronx course in an article entitled, Taxpayers Built This New York Golf Course and Trump Reaps the Rewards. Where many, that, that article is where many New Yorkers and people in the country learn that taxpayers spent $127 million to build Trump Links in a, quote, generous deal allowing President Trump to keep almost every dollar that flows in on a golf course built with public funds. And this doesn't seem to be the only time the president has benefited at the expense of the public. Mr. Cohen, I want to ask you about your assertion that the president may have improperly devalued his assets to avoid paying taxes. According to an August, 24th, August 21st, 2016 report by the Washington Post, while the president claimed in financial disclosure forms that Trump National Golf Club in Jupiter, Florida, was worth more than 50 million, he had reported otherwise to local tax authorities that the course was worth, quote, no more than five million. Mr. Cohen, do you know whether this specific report is accurate? It's identical to what he did at Trump National Golf Club at Briarcliff Manor. Do you know, to your knowledge, was the president interested in reducing his local real estate bills, tax bills? Yes. And how did he do that? What you do is you deflate the value of the asset and then you put in a request to the tax department uh, for a deduction. Thank you. Now in October 2018, the New York Times revealed that, quote, President Trump participated in dubious tax schemes during the 1990s, including instances of outright fraud that greatly increased the fortune he received from his parents. And it further stated from Mr. Trump, quote, he also helped formulate a strategy to undervalue his parents' real estate holdings by hundreds of millions of dollars on tax returns, sharply reducing his tax bill when those properties were transferred to him and his siblings. Mr. Cohen, do you know whether that specific report is accurate? I, I don't. I wasn't there in 1990s. Who would know the answer to those questions? Alan Weisselberg. And would it help for the committee to obtain federal and state tax returns from the president and his company to address that discrepancy? I believe so. Thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time to the chair. Ms. 
Presley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, one more time, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you uh, for your leadership and the way in which you comport yourself. And I know there are some that would have you believe that the more you say something, the more true it is. But in fact, this committee, thanks to your leadership and our Democratic majority, has been doing the work of the American people. Before this committee alone, we looked at the issue of making Election Day a federal holiday, reducing drug pricing, uh, and pursued subpoenas to reunite families. And just recently, uh, before we returned here, uh, tried to pass a universal background check uh, gun bill. So we are doing the business of the American people, including today. Uh, it has been said that the best sunlight, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. Electric light is the most efficient policeman. Well, let there be light. Because the point of oversight is for us to pursue the trust, to pursue the truth, and justice for the American people, to understand if lies, deceit, and corruption are threatening American democracy, and indeed our safety. Mr. Chairman, charities should not be abused as personal piggy banks. It is both against the law and extremely unfair to charities that play by the rules. A line of questioning that we have uh, not yet addressed and we've been glaringly absent in tackling is that of the abuses of the Trump Foundation. Now, the President's Charitable Foundation agreed to dissolve in response to an ongoing investigation and lawsuit by the New York Attorney General. The New York Attorney General found what it called, quote, clear and repeated violations of state and federal law, including, quote, repeated and willful self-dealing by the Trump administra administration. Apologies, by the foundation. If I understand your opening statement correctly, in mid-2013, you arranged for a straw purchaser to bid $60,000 for a portrait of Mr. Trump painted by the artist William Quigley at a charity auction. Is that correct? That's correct. Why would the president want to bid up the price of something that he was ultimately paying for? It was all about ego. How was it paid for? I believe it was paid for by a check from the trust. And abuse, and again, you know, uh, this is not a, uh, a partisan pursuit here. I think ultimately what we're demonstrating is patriotism. This is about what is right and just for the American people. Did the straw purchaser purchase the painting and then the foundation funds reimburse the straw purchaser? Can you explain the mechanics of that payment? I'm, I'm not involved with the foundation. Okay, did the president know what was happening? Oh yes. And how did you know he knew what was happening? Because he tasked me to find the straw bidder to ensure that his painting, which was going last in the auction, would go for the highest amount um, of any of the paintings that had been put on the auction block for the day. And what happened to the painting? I believe it's in one of the clubs. Okay. Um, according to the New York Attorney General in March 2014, Mr. Trump again used the foundation to pay $10,000 for the winning bid on another portrait of Mr. Trump that ended up as decor in one of his golf courses in Miami. Mr. Cohen, are you familiar with that transaction? Yes. Are you aware of any other instances where the Trump Foundation was used to benefit the Trump family? Yes. Could you elaborate? So there was a contract that I ended up um, creating on Mr. Trump's behalf for is a um, Ukrainian oligarch by the name of Viktor Pinchuk. And it was that Mr. Trump was asked to come and to participate in what was the Ukrainian American Economic Forum. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to go, but I was able to negotiate 15 minutes by Skype where they would have a camera very much like uh, a television camera, very much like that one, and they would translate Mr. Trump to the questioner, and then he would respond back. And I negotiated a fee of $150,000 for 15 minutes. I was directed by Mr. Trump to have the contract done in the name of the Donald J. Trump Foundation as opposed to Donald J. Trump for services rendered. Thank you. Any other abuses of the foundation that you'd like to share? Again, it is um, against the law and, again, extremely unfair to charities that are playing by the rules. Um, not at this time, but if I think of one, I'll okay. pass along. And, and then for the balance of my time, would you agree that uh, someone could deny uh, rental units to African Americans uh, lead the birther movement, refer to the diaspora as shithole countries, and refer to white supremacists as fine people, have a black friend and still be racist? 
Yes. I agree. The young lady's time is expired. Uh, you may, I'm you sorry? may answer the question. I did. Yes. Oh, okay. uh, Mr. Chairman, I have two unanimous consent. Since we're we're finishing up I, I, before we get done, I want to go ahead and. Okay. Just give me give me give me one second. I, I just want. Yes, to, sir. Um, I wanted to get to Mr. Talib and then I'll come to you. Okay. Mr. Talib, I mean they, they've been waiting here all day. Mr. Talib. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, all of you, for centering this committee on our sole purpose um, is exposing the truth. And some of my colleagues can't handle the truth, and this is unfortunate because it's the center of what is protecting our country right now. The people at home are frustrated, Mr. Cohen, and they want criminal schemes to stop, especially those from the Oval Office. Mr. Cohen, I am upset and know that my residents feel the same way, that a man you worked for for the past 10 years is using the most powerful position in the world to hurt our country solely for personal gain. We are upset that some of our colleagues here are so disconnected of what, me, what it means to have this President of the United States sending checks to cover bribe payments, not hush payments, bribe payments you made on his behalf. One in 2017 of March and another August 2017 after he was sworn in as President. They are upset that while my colleagues are trying to discredit your testimony by some of your own unlawful acts and lies, that they are disconnected with the fact that you were the personal lawyer for this president of the United States, that this president chose you as his legal counsel. My stance has always been the same, Mr. Chairman, based on the facts, not on future reports that we're all waiting on. My residents back home don't need a collusion cause with a foreign government to know this president, individual one, has disregarded the law of the land, the United States Constitution and that he has misused his pardon powers. In the sentencing memo, Mr. Cohen, filed by the federal prosecutors in New York in December of last year, they stated, quote, in particular, and as Cohen himself has now admitted, with respect to both payments, he acted in coordination with and at the direction of individual one. Mr. Cohen, as you know, President Donald J. Trump brand comes first, not the American people. Based on what you know now, based on what we know now, is that individual one used his money, businesses, and platform to enrich, to enrich himself, his brand, and then the process directed you, Mr. Cohn, to commit multiple fel fel felonies, and you covered it up, correct? That's correct. You called it protecting his brand, correct? And him as well. Mr. Cohn, with this, do you think the President of the United States is making decisions in the best interests of the American people? No, I don't. Especially those you said that he used horrible words about, like African Americans, Muslim Americans, and immigrants? Yes. Just to make a note, Mr. Chairman, just because someone has a person of color, a black person working for them, does not mean they aren't racist. And it is insensitive that some would even say it's the fact that someone would actually use a prop, a black woman, in this chamber, in this committee, is alone racist in itself. Donald Trump is setting Mr. President, Chairman, I ask I, that her Donald words Trump be taken down. Donald Trump is setting down. a president. I reclaim my time. Mr. Donald Chairman, Trump is setting a president. Mr. Chairman, the highest office can be a Mr. Chairman, the rules are activity. clear. Cover up and hold on to business assets to break campaign finance laws and constitutional clauses. What we have here, Mr. Chairman, is criminal conduct and the pursuit of the highest public office by Mr. Cohen and individual one. I hope that the gravity of this situation hits everyone in this body the court report. and in Congress and across this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the rest of my time. Ms. Mr. Chairman, I ask that her words, when she's referring to an individual member of this body, be taken down and stricken from the record. I'm sure she didn't intend to do this, but if anyone knows my record as it relates, it should be you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I, I, I would like to hold on. I want the words read no, no, back. No, 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 no. We want to know exactly no, what she said me. about a colleague. Excuse me. Would you like to rephrase that statement, Ms. Talib? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can actually read it from here. 
Just to make a note, Mr. Chairman, that just because someone has a person of color, a black person working for them, does not mean they are racist. And it is insensitive that someone would even say racist, say, say it is racist in itself, and to use a black woman as a prop to, mo to prove it otherwise. And I can submit this for the record. If a colleague is thinking that that's what I'm saying, I'm just saying that's what I believe to have happened. And if, as a person of color in this committee, that's how I felt at that moment, and I wanted to express that. But I am not calling the gentleman, um, Mr. Meadows, a racist for doing so. I'm saying that in itself, it is a racist act. Well, I hope not, Mr. Chairman, because I need to be clear on this well, particular. Mr. Chairman. Mr. 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 Meadows, wait a minute. I, I've defended you no, at, no, uh, no. About, uh, Meadows, with false accusations. Mr. Meadows, I'm the chair. Yes, sir, you are. Thank you. Right. I will clear this up. Now, Ms. Salib, is it, I want to make sure I understand. You did not, you were not intending to call Mr. Meadows a racist, is that right? No, Mr. Chairman, I do not call Mr. Meadows a racist. No, I am trying wait, wait, as on. a person of color, Mr. Chairman, just to express myself and how I felt at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so, just for the record, that's what was my intention. All right. Yeah. Mr. Meadows. Mr. Meadows. Mr. Chairman, there's nothing more personal to me than my relationship. My nieces and nephews are people of color. Not many people know that. You know that, Mr. Chairman. And to indicate that I asked someone who is a personal friend of the, the Trump family, who has worked for him, who knows this particular individual, that she's coming in to be a prop, it's racist to suggest that I ask her to come in here for that reason. Uh, Mr. President, the president's own person, she's a family member, she, she loves the, this family, she came in because she felt like the president of the United States was getting falsely accused. And, and Mr. Chairman, you, are, you and I have a personal relationship that's not based on color. And, and to even go down this direction is, is wrong, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank the gentleman for what you have stated. Um, if there's anyone who is sensitive with regard to race, it's me. Son of former sharecroppers that were basically slaves. So I, I get it. Um, I listened very carefully to Ms. Salib. And I think, and I, I don't want to, I'm not going to put words in her mouth, but I think she said that she was not calling you a racist. And I thought that we could clarify that. Because you, Ms. Mr. Meadows, you know, uh, and of all the people on this committee, uh, I've said it and got in trouble for it, that you're one of my best friends. I know that shocks a lot of people. And, and likewise, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. But you are. And I would do, and I could see and feel your pain. I feel it. And so, and I don't think Ms. Salib intended to cause you that, that, that kind of pain and that kind of frustration. Did you have a statement, Ms. Salib? I'm going to yield to you. We no, need to thank straighten you, Mr. this up. Chairman, and, and to my colleague, Mr. Meadows, that was not my intention, and I. Do apologize if that's what it sounded like, but I said someone in general. Um, and as everybody knows in this chamber, I'm pretty direct. So I, if I wanted to say that, I would have, but that's not what I said. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to clarify. But again, I said someone. And again, I, that was not referring to you at all as a racist. Well, I, I thank the gentlewoman for her comments. I thank the chairman for uh, working to clarify this. And... Uh, and I, I appreciate the, the, the chairman's uh, intervening. Now, now to, to the gentleman, um, first of all, thank you uh, for allowing us to resolve that. Um, the gentleman had asked a little bit earlier. I will withdraw my request. Oh, you don't want to do the uh, unanimous consent? I, oh. I need the unanimous consent. Yeah, but the, uh, my, I, need, I think I need to officially withdraw my uh, request okay. that it be stricken. Go on, withdraw it. You, you I, did I, it? I, I did. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Um, now, I will recognize you for your unanimous consent. I think you want to 
uh, put in the record some documents. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I ask unanimous consent that we uh, put forth in the record the Vanity, Vanity Fair article, which uh, indicates that Michael Cohen must be the most gifted consultant in the in America. Uh, outlining uh, his insights into government health care and policy and real estate, suggesting that he's not, it's not a real company, but, uh, and just like he's not a lawyer. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that the LA Times article of July 16, 2018, uh, actually be put in the record, which out outlines the $1.2 million payment and their misgivings thereafter. Without objection, so ordered. Any other uh, unanimous consent requests? Size. Yep. Size. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, ask unanimous consent to make the February 9th, 2019 Washington Post profile of Michael Cohen titled Michael Cohen's Secret Agenda, part of the record. Mm -hmm. This story shows Cohen to be a selfish manipulator who is all about himself. It even has a false anecdote about how he once claimed to deliver his own son, his uh, own baby. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to make the May 9th, 2018 Washington Post article, South Korean firm paid Michael Cohen $150,000 as it sought contract from U.S. government as part of the record. The article reported Korea Aerospace Industries paid a shell company run by Cohen. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to make Michael Cohen's sentencing statement to the Southern District of New York part of the record. The statement establishes that Michael Cohen continues to falsely blame his crimes on blind loyalty to the president, but only Cohen is to blame for his many false statements to financial institutions and the IRS. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent to make the August 20th, 2018 CNN article, Fed scrutinizing Michael Cohen's former accountant and bank loans, part of the record. Cohen's accountant was subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury and required a lawyer in his sentencing memo, prosecutors said Cohen attempted to blame his tax evasion on his accountant. Without objection, so ordered. Two more, real quickly. Sure. Ask unanimous consent to make the February 26, 2019 order filed by the Appellate Division of the State of New York regarding disciplinary proceedings against Michael Cohen part of the record. This order, which proactively applies starting 20, uh, February 28th, establishes Cohen committed a serious crime and ceased being an attorney when he was convicted of lying to Congress. Without objection, so ordered. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to make the July 26, 2018 Washington Post article, Michael Cohen secretly recorded Trump. Does that make him a bad lawyer? Part of the record. The article describes potential ethical violations of a lawyer, Cohen, recording his client, Trump, without the client's knowledge. Without objection, so ordered, Mr. Norman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to make the January 18, 2019 Huffington Post article, 11 tweets from the uh, fake fan account, stud Michael Cohen paid to phone over him, part of the record. The Without account it. is described as a place for women who love and support Michael Cohen. Strong pit bull, sex symbol, no nonsense, business oriented, and ready to make it. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would uh, ask unanimous consent to make the April 20th, 2018 uh, article in Mother Jones titled Michael Cohen says he's never been to Prague. He told me a different story. Uh, part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, sir. Very well. I, um, Scott and I have uh, some concluding remarks. Um, but before I do that, um, do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, yes, yes, Mr. Chairman, I would. Mm -hmm. I have some closing remarks I would like to say myself. Is this an appropriate time? You can do it now. Thank you. So first I want to thank you, Chairman, because I appreciate the opportunity to share some final thoughts. I have acknowledged I have made my own mistakes, and I have owned up to them publicly and under oath. But silence and complicity in the face of the daily destruction of our basic norms and civility to one another will not be one of them. I did things and I acted improperly, at times at Mr. Trump's behest. I blindly followed his demands. My loyalty to Mr. Trump has cost me everything. My family's happiness, friendships, my law license, my company, 
my livelihood, my honor, my reputation, and soon my freedom. And I will not sit back, say nothing, and allow him to do the same to the country. Indeed, given my experience working for Mr. Trump, I fear that if he loses the election in 2020, that there will never be a peaceful transition of power. And this is why I agreed to appear before you today. And in closing, I'd like to say directly to the President, we honor our veterans even in the rain. You tell the truth even when it doesn't aggrandize you. You respect the law and our incredible law enforcement agents. You don't villainize them. You don't disparage generals, Gold Star families, prisoners of war, and other heroes who had the courage to fight for this country. You don't attack the media and those who question what you don't like or what you don't want them to say. And you take responsibility for your own dirty deeds. You don't use your power of your bully pulpit to destroy the credibility of those who speak out against you. You don't separate families from one another or demonize those looking to America for a better life. You don't vilify people based on the God they pray to, and you don't cuddle up to our adversaries at the expense of our allies. And finally, you don't shut down the government before Christmas and New Year's just to simply appease your base. This behavior is churlish, it denigrates the office of the president, and it's simply un-American. And it's not you. So to those who support the president and his, and his rhetoric, as I once did, I pray the country doesn't make the same mistakes that I have made or pay the heavy price that my family and I are paying. And I thank you very much for this additional time, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the ranking member has a closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> we know Mr. Cohen has been dishonest in the past. That's why he's gone to prison in two months. But there are things today that he said during the several hours of questioning that just don't add up either. He said he never defrauded any bank. And he was having a conversation questioning from Mr. Comer. Obviously, that's not true because he's going to prison for that very offense. He said today he was a good lawyer who understood the need to represent his client, his client with legal advice. But in his written testimony, he said he never bothered to consider whether payments to women for improper uh, whether payments to women were improper, much less the right thing to do. He attested in his signed truth and testimony form that he did not have any reportable contracts with foreign government entities. Earlier, he admitted to having consulting agreements with at least, at least two foreign entities owned in part by foreign governments, BTA Bank of Kazakhstan and Korea Airspace Industries of South Korea. He said to Chairman Cummings that Donald Trump directed him and the Trump Organization CFO Alan Weiselberg to, quote, go back to his office and figure out how to make the $130,000 payment. But in his testimony, he says, Mr. Trump directed me to use my own personal funds from the home equity line of credit to avoid any money being traced back to him that could negatively impact the campaign. And in response to a question about him paying to set up the fake Twitter account at Women for Cohen, that he didn't direct the commission of that Twitter account. He says, I didn't set that up, and it was done by a young lady that works for the firm, when in fact, he did ask the IT firm Redfinch to set it up according to the owner of Redfinch. And finally, he said he didn't want a job with the administration, even though the attorneys with the Southern Dis uh, District of New York stated that this was a fact. When asked about this, they said, I wouldn't call them liars, but that statement is not accurate. Mr. Chairman, I think maybe more importantly is what we should have been doing today. Mr. Meadows and I sent you a letter asking us, asking you to have Mr. Rosenstein here. I think it's important to know that last week when you announced that Mr. Cohen was coming this week, just happened to be the very same week that we learned the Deputy Attorney General of the United States was thinking about wearing a wire to record the Commander-in-Chief, was actually contemplating talking to cabinet members and invoking the 25th Amendment. That's what we should be focused on, not this sad display we've had to go through the last several hours. And again, 
not my words, you can take the words of the former general counsel for the House of Representatives under Tip O'Neill. So I hope we've learned some things here today. Um, but Mr. Mr. Chairman, as I said earlier, your first big hearing, the first announced witness of the 116th Congress is a gentleman who is going to prison in two months for lying to Congress. I don't think that's what we should be focused on. I yield back. Thank you very much. You know, I've sat here and I've listened to all of this. And it's very painful. It's very painful. Um, you um, made a lot of mistakes, Mr. Cohen, and you've admitted that. And, um, you know, one of the saddest parts of this whole thing is that some very innocent people are hurting too. And you acknowledge that. And um, that's your, your family. And so you come here today and you, I, 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 deep in my heart after, I, you know, and when I practice law, I represent a lot of lawyers who got in trouble. <clears throat> and you come saying I had made my mistakes but now I want to change my life. Um, and you know, if we, if, if we um, as a nation did not give people an opportunity after they made mistakes to change their lives, um, a whole lot of people would not do, do very well. I don't know where you go from here. Uh, as I sat here and I listened to both sides, um, I just felt as if, and, and you know, people are use, now using my words that they took from me, that didn't give me any credit. <laughs> We're better than this. <laughs> we are so much, we really are. As a country, we are so much better than this. And, you know, I told you, I, I, and, 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 and for some reason, Mr. Cohen, I, I, I tell my, 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 my children, I say when bad things happen to you, do not ask the question, why did it happen to me? Ask the question, why did it happen for me? I don't know why this is happening for you, but it is my hope that a small part of it is for our country to be better. If I hear you correctly, it sounds like <clears throat> you're crying out for a new normal, for us getting back to normal. It sounds to me like you want to make sure that our democracy stays intact. When I, the one meeting I had with President Trump, I said to him, the greatest gift that you and I, Mr. President, can give to our children is making sure that we give them a democracy that is intact. A not democracy better than the one that we came upon. And I'm hoping that the things you said today will help us begin to get back there. You know, I mean, come on now. I mean, when you got, according to the Washington Post, our president has made at least 8,718 8, false or misleading statements. That's stunning. That's not what we teach our children. I don't teach mine that. And for whatever reason, you sounds like you got caught up in it. You got caught up in it. You got caught up in it. And some kind of way, I hope that you will, I, I know that it's painful going to prison. I know, I know it's gotta be painful being called a rat. 
and let me, let me explain. A lot of people don't know the significance of that, but I live in the inner city of Baltimore. All right? And when you call somebody a rat, that's one of the worst things you can call them because when they go to prison, that means a snitch. I'm just saying. And so the president called you a rat. We're better than that. We really are. And I'm hoping that all of us can get back to this democracy that we want and that we should be passing on our, to our children so that they can do better than what we did. And so you wonder whether people believe you. I don't know. I don't know whether they believe you. But the fact is that you've come, you have your head down, and this has got to be one of the hardest things that you could do. Let me tell you the picture that really, really pained me. You were leaving the prison. You were leaving the courthouse. And I guess it's your daughter had a bracelet or something on. Man, that thing, man, that thing hurt me. As a father of two daughters, it hurt me. And I can imagine how it must feel for you. But I'm just saying to you, I want to first of all thank you. I know that this has been hard. I know that you face a lot. I know that you are worried about your family. But this is a part of your destiny. And hopefully, this portion of your destiny will lead to a better, a better, a better Michael Cohen, a better Donald Trump, a better United States of America, and a better world. And I mean that from the depths of my heart. When we're dancing with the angels, the question will be asked, in 2019, what did we do to make sure we kept our democracy intact? Did we stand on the sidelines and say nothing? Did we play games? And I'm tired of these statements saying, they come, people come in here and say, oh, oh, this is the first hearing. It is not the first hearing. The first hearing was with regard to prescription drugs. Remember, a little girl, a, a lady sat there, Miss Wortham, her daughter, died because she could not get $333 a month in insulin. That was our first hearing. Second hearing, HR1, voting rights, corruption in government. Come on now. We can do more than one thing. And we have got to get back to normal. With that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>